do we think we're up and running? Let's hope so. I think so. The attendees okay. are coming in. Oh, okay. it says it's recording. So. Does it say it's recording? In the yeah. top left. Yeah, yeah, it does. Oh, well spotted. Brilliant. Thank you. So if you want to make us co-hosts, then we yeah. can demote these Ashley Kings that are popping up. Yeah. So if anyone's just joined us as Ashley King, could you go to the participants list and by your name, select rename and give us your real, <laughs> your real moniker, please. How do I make you a co-host? I can make you host. Uh, well, you can do that for now if you like, and then we'll figure it out. All right. So you're now the host, Natasha. Okay, cool. I'll, st I'll put some people into the... Okay. Panelists. <laughs> All right then. Well, let's uh, make a start because we're running slightly late already. Um, yeah, it's a slightly <laughs> unusual experience uh, for me trying to do this virtually. Um, but yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, virtual um, RAS meeting on the analysis of returned extraterrestrial materials. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Ashley King, for those of you who have never met me before, and I'm a, a UKRI uh, Future Leaders Fellow based at the Natural History Museum um, in London. And so we thought that this would be uh, a really good time and opportunity to have this meeting. Um, hopefully most of you saw that last weekend uh, JAXA's Hayabusa 2 mission successfully arrived back on Earth. Hopefully it's full of um, samples collected from the surface of the carbonaceous asteroid Rugu. Uh, and then at the same time we've also had China's really exciting mission uh, Chang'e 5, which has been up on the moon and has collected lunar samples and is on its way back now to Earth. Um, so we thought a good, it was a good time to kind of start talking about um, the analysis of return samples. And so the laboratory analysis of returned extraterrestrial materials is absolutely crucial um, to uh, our efforts to try and understand how the solar system formed and how it's evolved, how we ended up with habitable planets, a bit like the Earth. Um, these materials provide context for our meteorite collections, uh, and they also allow us to ground truth um, remote observations of, of other planetary bodies um, and other planetary systems. And so over the next year or so, it's going to be really exciting as we start analysing these samples from Rugu uh, and the materials coming back from the moon. But we also wanted this meeting to be a kind of um, opportunity to think a little bit further ahead uh, and think about how uh, we're going to approach some of the challenges as we start preparing to collect uh, materials from Mars, uh, and even beyond Mars, thinking about comets and, and bodies in the outer solar system. Uh, so today, hopefully, we've got a, a really interesting and exciting collection of talks. It's a really hectic schedule, so I'm not going to I'm not going to um, hang around for too much longer. Um, can I please ask that if you have any questions, um, can you put those into the chat box, uh, and we will then read those out to the speakers at the end of their talks. Um, we also have some. Uh, time at the end of the day for any further questions that might pop up um, over the course of the day and also for some discussion about um, where we should probably be heading as a community over the next I don't know 10 to 20 years or so. Um, can I also add that if you did join the meeting with uh, the registration link that I sent you if your name says Ashley King can you please change it to your own name just to avoid confusion um, for our part and it helps us um, set up all the talks. And I think with that, I'm going to hand over to Natasha Stephen. Um, and uh, oh, Rianne's saying we can't see our names. OK, well, I'll hand over. We'll sort it out, Rianne. Um, I'm going to hand over to Natasha Stephen, who's going to introduce our speakers for the first session. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Um, so our first session this morning is a series of invited talks. Um, and first up, we have Sarah Russell from the Natural History Museum, who's with us. And she's going to be speaking about JAXA's NLX mission and the implications for sample analysis there. So Sarah, when you're ready, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha. Oh my gosh. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, that's great, Sarah. Okay, all good? All right, 
Uh, okay, let me make a start then. So I'd like to start off by thanking all of the organisers for organising such an amazing day today. I'm really excited about it, even more excited that I get to give the first talk so I can relax for the day after that. Um, so as Ashley said, Hayabusa 2 has now safely arrived on Earth and it's back at JAXA. Uh, and so I think it's a good time to uh, take stock and look forward to the next Japanese sample return mission to a small body, which is MMX. Uh, so I got involved in this mission as one of two ESA representatives on it, along with Jorn Halbert from DLR. And there's loads and loads of amazing people involved. And I know there's loads of people on this uh, first slide as well. So I just wanted to point out that the, the um, PI is Kiyoshi Kuramutu from uh, Hokkaido. The sample analysis lead is, uh, many of you know him, is Tomo Yusui, who is um, at JAXA. And then I'm a member of the sample analysis working team. And uh, this is also a good time to give this talk because our team has been working over the last few months to come up with a preliminary sample analysis plan. Uh, and the results of that have uh, produced a paper which is led by Wataru Fujita. And it's just been submitted to uh, Earth and Planetary, Earth, Planets and Space. Uh, they're doing a special issue on MMX. So please look out for that because it's gonna have loads of great papers in it. Okay, so to get started, I'll just introduce the uh, mission. Uh, it's going to launch in 2024, and it is a mission to the moons of Mars. Uh, it arrives at Mars in the Mars neighborhood in 2025, uh, and then it will go in a quasi-stable orbit around Phobos, and it will make lots of observations of the Phobos surface, um, and including um, doing a sample return. I'll tell you a bit more about the sampling later. Uh, then after leaving Phobos, it will do some, a flyby of Deimos and make some measurements there. Uh, and the whole time during the mission when it's in the Mars neighbourhood, it will also act as a Mars observatory. So it's also going to be uh, looking at Mars itself during this time. Uh, it will leave Mars in 2028 and arrive back on Earth uh, in 2029. And uh, these are the main science goals of the mission. And um, one of the reasons this mission is really exciting is because we have no idea what we're going to be faced with. So I was thinking it's maybe not since Apollo 11 have we ever gone to the surface of a body with so little idea of what is what we're going to find there. Um, and that's because there are two competing theories about the origin of the moons of Mars. And um, part of the, the, the paradox of the, the Martian moons is that spectrally they look like asteroids, they look like super cool asteroids, D-type asteroids, which are full of ice and are very, very primitive. But um, if it was a captured asteroid, you might expect the orbit of the asteroids to be a little bit wonky and eccentric, but actually it's not. So they have very circular orbits right around the equator of Mars, which is more like something you would expect if they formed by a giant impact. So the opposing theory is that uh, they formed during uh, an impact into the very early Mars, um, which uh, would have excavated the crust and the mantle of the Mars of Mars, and it may have formed rings around Mars to start with, may have formed other moons that eventually collapsed into, uh, into Mars itself, and Phobos and Deimos might be the two remaining ones from that process. Um, so finding out um, how these moons formed is a really important part of the mission. And by learning that, we'll better understand planet formation and the, and the movement of small bodies around the solar system. Whichever, whichever option is correct, it's gonna teach us a lot about what was going on in, in the early solar system. And then the other main um, uh, key goal is to look at the processes that have happened in the Mars system. So we think, um, however Phobos formed, it has been a witness to an awful lot of stuff. So its position is, um, well, the position of Mars on the edge of the asteroid belt means that it will have lots of asteroidal material impacting it. Um, we think that it's gonna be super space weathered. It's going to have the uh, impacts of cosmic rays on its surface. Um, it's going to have bits of Deimos in it because um, maybe something like 11% of the impactors on Phobos might be actually from Deimos. And, um, and also sort of, possibly a key point, as Zoe Morland's going to talk about a bit later, we're expecting it to have actual pieces of Mars on it that have impacted. And these are going to be really important because they're potentially much less shocked than the Martian meteorites that we have on Earth. So 
it could help us bring back to earth the first Martian material that, that hasn't experienced the massive shock that, um, that Martian meteorites have experienced. So it's all super exciting, uh, but I need to get on so that I'm in time. So I'm gonna quickly uh, tell you about the, uh, uh, the instruments that are on board the mission. So it's got two different types of camera. Uh, one's kind of wide angle, one's more narrow angle camera. It's got an IR spectrometer. So that is led by the Paris group, Antonella Barucci. And uh, it will look at uh, look for the three micron feature, which will give us an idea of whether there is water on Phobos. Um, there's a gamma ray spectroscopy, uh, spectrometer called Magane, which means spectacles in Japanese. And uh, this will look at the chemical composition of Phobos. Then it's also got uh, a LIDAR to look at the shape. It's got a mass spectrum analyzer and a dust analyzer. So these are looking at, um, uh, these will be looking at ions and dust that's around the, uh, around Phobos to look at what's in this Martian region. Then uh, it has a rover on board. So it has this teeny tiny little rover that Patrick Michel is a PI of that will go onto the surface and it's got a round spectrometer on and some cameras on. So it will have a look at the surface prior to sampling uh, at the same time as the sampling. And then for the sampler, there's actually two samplers uh, that will be on board. There's a C sampler, which stands for core sampler. So this is, is going to make a tiny core. It's got a diameter of one to two centimeters. So it's like a smarty tube or something. Uh, and it can uh, excavate down uh, to more than two centimeters on the surface. And it will have two, at least two of these, uh, which will enable us to sample two sites on Phobos. And then the P sampler stands for pneumatic sampler. Uh, and that is uh, being led by NASA, Mike Zelensky, and it's based on the heritage from OSIRIS-REx. So having, uh, so, so that involves having a blast of gas that will disrupt the surface and enable the sampling to take place. So having these two completely different kinds of samplers will really kind of minimize the risks of uh, the sample, uh, of, of something going wrong with the sampling. And uh, amazingly, so the MMX mission is going to collect more than 10 grams of sample. So this is by far the biggest sample return that uh, JAXA ha has mounted. So that really helps the sample analysis. It means that we have enough sample to do what I would call normal things like, you know, do, getting isotope measurements and stuff like that should be fairly straightforward with this amount of sample. Okay, so going into our sample analysis. Um, uh, so this is one of the diagrams from the paper that Pujita et al. Uh, submitted recently. Uh, and this is to explain how we'll work out whether Phobos is a captured asteroid or a giant impact. So all of us cosmochemists in the audience know it's going to be easy peasy. If we have a return sample, we'll know straight away whether it's an asteroid or uh, whether it's chondritic or not chondritic. Um, but we have this, this uh, flow diagram to make sure. So first of all, we'll look at the, the texture and the mineral composition. Um, so I think after, even after this very first stage, we'll have a very good idea of what we're dealing with. Uh, but then the kind of um, key measurement is looking at whether there's hydrous uh, minerals and organic uh, matter. And if that's the case, then it's very likely to be a carbonaceous chondrite-like um, asteroid. And as well as, obviously we can do that on, on Earth, but we should have a very good idea from the spectral measurements um, as well. For, uh, so we should already know from the sur surface remote sensing measurements, uh, absorption features, whether there's, there's ice and organics on this object. But of course, getting it back means we, we can make much more precise and better measurements. Um, so uh, then if, if there's no hydrous material, then, well, in any case, whatever it is, we're gonna look at the major element compositions um, and, uh, and again, we'll have some preliminary data from the remote sensing from Bagane about this. Um, but from the, just from the major elements, we should know uh, from Bagane whether it's chondritic or not chondritic. So for example, uh, we expect if it's an impact uh, produced object, then it will have a lower iron to silicon ratio than a chondritic because um, the impact produced material will sample the mantle of Mars, but not the core of Mars for example. So then also the things like potassium uranium uh, ratio will also tell us whether there's a lot of vol uh, volatile material or not in there. Um, and then we'll also do oxygen and chromium isotopes as a fingerprint for what kind of material there is. Um, 
So that's the, that's the basic idea. And then looking in more detail, there are loads of diagrams like this in the papers, um, but I'm just putting uh, a couple up here to show you. So this is a flow diagram of what we actually, the actual analyses that we expect to do on MMX. Uh, and uh, in green boxes are the things that be, can be carried out at JAXA. Um, so first of all, we'll look in the optical microscope and then we'll do non-destructive Raman, FDIR and squid. Um, so we'll make magnetic measurements um, and that will be interesting if it's an asteroid, it can tell us um, following from James Bryson's work that that is also a fingerprint of whether it comes from the outer solar system or the inner solar system. Then we'll do uh, SEM work and we'll separate out um, the larger grains will be big enough, of course, to do a lot more on them. And in particular, we'll do lots of um, isotope measurements. So if it's an impact produced object, we'll be looking, well, it, whatever it is, we're going to be looking at things like volatile isotopes like zinc that will tell us about nature of impacts and how much volatile material has been lost. Um, we'll look at stable isotopes, of course, like carbon um, and nitrogen and hydrogen that will, that will tell us in the case of an asteroid, um, what, what, um, what kind of uh, material it is and whether it, how far out in the solar system it formed. And the smaller grains we will polish for, and they can be used uh, for laser ICPMS and uh, SIMS analyses. Okay. Better move on. Okay, and uh, then of course we will be taking a particular look out for Martian uh, materials. And this might be quite challenging because the Martian grains in there, although really critically important, might be very small, might be too small to do bulk oxygen isotopes on, which would give us a kind of definite idea of, of uh, whether they're Martian or not. Uh, so we'll be looking at things like the, the plagioclase composition and the iron magnesium ratio um, and uh, get an idea from the SEM, okay, I've got to hurry up, uh, get an idea from, um, from our preliminary examination whether they might be Martians. And if, if they look like they might be Martian materials, then of course we'll go in and do a lot more um, detailed analyses. Um, and in particular, of course, we'll be looking out for possible uh, relics of biological material. So we'll be looking uh, in uh, uh, using optical microscopy first and then, then more detailed um, techniques to see if we can see organic accumulations. And then if we do, then we have a whole plan of what we will um, work on to try to identify potential um, fossilized materials in this um, Martian material. Uh, and then if not, there's lots of other cool things we can do. So, so looking at the magnetic properties of Martian materials might be really interesting because it's hard to do that on Martian meteorites, which have been highly shocked, for example. So that could give us an idea of the magnetic history of Mars. Okay, but uh, just to go on to my conclusion, so hopefully I've got some time for some questions. So um, this is an amazingly exciting mission. Is That's the bottom line. Um, and it's going to be the first sample return mission to the Mars neighbourhood. And it's uh, all on track. It's going really well. Um, no problems with the mission at all. And we're expecting to get a relatively large sample back of more than 10 grams in 2029. Um, so I think this is a fantastic opportunity, both for the remote sensing communities and also our sample analysis uh, community to, to work on these. Um, and I think it's a, 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 especially an opportunity for younger early career scientists, postdocs and students. By the time this mission comes back, you might be in a position to run your own lab and to be making amazing contributions to this mission. So thank you. Fantastic, perfect timing, Sarah, thank you. Okay, great. So we have quite a few questions for you. Um, okay. uh, can you see them on your screen if I um, uh, ask you to start with Christian's question? I'll read it out for the benefit of Can you read it out? Else. Am I still screen sharing? Should I stop screen sharing? Hang on, let me stop. That's up to you. It might help answer some of the questions, Sarah. <laughs> so Christian uh, uh, yeah. Broder asks, will there be a call for additional analyses at some point? Um, yes. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. So in the sample analysis team, OK, there's two, there's two things. So firstly, ESA are very keen to get more European scientists involved. Uh, and I think they'll have more opportunities like the one um, that I responded to. Uh, they'll have announcements of opportunities um, to get 
Europeans involved. So they're in talks with JAXA about doing that formally. Um, so more formally about the analyses. So the sample analysis team have made a definite decision to make no decision at the moment about who's going to do exactly what analysis. And that's because we think it's too early at the moment. Um, and we don't know how, you know, people move around and labs develop and so on. And, um, and in order to enable uh, particularly early career people to contribute, it's better to hold off making a decision about who's going to do what. But I'm sure there will be lots of opportunities um, in, uh, to, to participate. And if you want to participate in the future, you can always, you know, write, write a paper, tell us what, say what Phobos is going to look like or how to recognise Martian materials in Phobos. So, yeah, just, just dig in. Cool, thank you. Uh, the next one's a uh, quick question, very cool mission. Is there a gamma and a neutron spectrometer on board? Yeah, so that's the Magane uh, spectrometer, which is led by uh, David Lawrence uh, and uh, Nancy Chabot at uh, John Hopkins University. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to uh, instruments on several other missions. Thank you. Um, from Anya O'Brien in uh, Glasgow. Amazing talk, always so excited about MMX and the tiny rover. How will the work be divided out for folk to analyse bits? Will it be a case of applying to JAXA for samples or it, will it be PIs and co-Is doing the science on samples? Yeah, I think sort of, um, I, you know, it's above my pay grade, I think, to, to sort of say exactly how that's going to work. So, so what we've talked about so far in the sample analysis working team is the preliminary exam examination, which we think will take about 1% of the sample up uh, and will be used to um, just answer these basic questions of the goals of the mission so that future people can, can then build on that to, to answer their own questions. So I imagine it will be like other uh, Japanese missions where there are invitations to, to apply for material just as they did for Hayabusa. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there are a couple of other questions and comments in here, but I'm afraid we need to move on. But Sarah, if you can remain a panellist, you're able to type an answer to those responses, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, yeah. OK, um, sure. If you have some time later today. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, on thank behalf you, everyone. Of everybody. Thanks. That was a really exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you. OK, our next speaker of the day is Monica Grady, who is here, ready and waiting. Um, so Monica is going to be talking about the laboratory analysis for research into extraterrestrial materials, uh, extraterrestrial samples, or the LARES consortia. So Monica, when you're ready, please start sharing your screen. And yes. You'll have 15 minutes. Right. Um, a minute warning. Thank you. Slideshow from the beginning. Right now, can you see my screen? Can somebody say yes or no? Not yet, no. Oh, rats. Okay. I'm not very good at this. Uh, share your computer screen. It should be that one. Now, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. And I need to go into uh, this mode from the beginning. Can you still see it? Perfect. Over to you, Monica. Okay, jolly good. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Natasha. Right. So uh, Sarah has uh, prepared this beautifully for me by saying about some samples that are coming back. Um, and this is about LARES, the Laboratory Analysis for Research into Extraterrestrial Samples. Um, this is building on something that was organised through the Natural History Museum, University of Manchester and the Open University many years ago. Um, we were at UK CAN, the UK Cosmochemistry Analysis Network, uh, with just those um, three institutions, oh, sorry, plus uh, Imperial. Um, but we've grown now into 20 different institutions. Uh, let's see if we go on. So what we are is we're a network of laboratory-based planetary scientists. That's a hub and spoke model or, or at the moment we're just lots and lots of spokes and we have uh, a lot of specialist instrumentation for the analysis of extraterrestrial materials um, and so Sarah's got her stuff at the museum, Manchester have got their stuff, Leicester have got their stuff, Plymouth etc etc but we all like to have uh, fancy new shiny bits of equipment and we need really to make sure that we've got the absolute state of the art stuff so that the Japanese will give us some Hayabusa 2 grains and some Phobos grains 
and will be well in line for samples returned directly from the surface of Mars when they come back in 2032. So the whole idea of this was to get us ready. You know, uh, um, sorry, Sarah, you're old. Janie, you're old. Me, I'm very old. We need uh, early career people. We need PhD students who are ready and waiting and eager to analyze these samples. So we put this network together with an idea that, yeah, a lot of it is going to be training and getting ready. Um, and I, uh, we submitted this in response to a call for ideas from STFC. And that happened, a call for ideas must have been in 2017, 2018, I can't remember. Um, and we went to the uh, uh, solar system advisory panel and they graded us as very, very high. In fact, we were the highest, I believe, of the um, grades. STFC has four different panels. Uh, and so we were top of the solar system one. So we then had to go in competition with astronomy and particle physics and nuclear physics. Um, and we came out in the top 50, which is what uh, STFC wanted to do. So what they wanted at the time, no money, all right, you know, bear that in mind, no money. What they wanted was a list of stuff that if there was any money magically appeared, you know, from that magic money tree, then they'd be able to say, oh, yes, we need this shiny what's it. So we're, we're on that list. The next thing, oh, all right, so he, he, here we are. This is uh, the 20 of us. Um, Exeter has now moved to Cranfield, and that's uh, Diane Johnson, uh, our, our colleague there, but there are still people at Exeter. So uh, I need to, have I got Cranfield on there? I can't remember now. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's an, another outpost. So we're all over from St Andrews in the top down to Exeter and to Plymouth uh, in the southwest. We haven't got anybody in Wales, never mind. So our objectives then are to equip the UK with a suite of state-of-the-art laboratory instrumentation, all right? And so that's, you know, an atom probe, all right? Basically, everybody wants an atom probe. We want to establish a training network. Um, now, unfortunately, I've got I've got a whole load of people who are over my slides. Let me move you all. Right. Yes. So we want to um, establish a training network for PhD students and career development, all the usual stuff. All right. But it's, it's important because we need to build this capacity and capability. Now, the next bit, this was very important at the time to provide investment, to provide impetus for building a European sample curation facility. Now, that um, motivation has changed a little bit, which I shall I shall come back to uh, in a second. All right, so so this is what this is what we're you know wanting to do. Um, the proposal was written uh, to STFC to tackle their how do stars and planetary systems develop, with a view to looking to exoplanets and with a view to looking at the origin of life. So spanning that huge, great big. Um, uh, Series range of, of um, uh, a, a range of scientific questions, and of course, a sample from Phobos would sit smack bang beautifully in the middle of that. And the whole idea is you've got all these, all these, whoops, no way, all these specific different things: nuclear synthesis, stellar evolution, solar system dynamics, all the way to the processes that led to the origin of life. So, so this is the science side. But also, we've got a very important um, technology, engineering te technology side, which is developing these instruments. OK, so you, you might buy something off the shelf, but you want to take it to that next, you know, next generation. So it would be working also with some of the instrument com companies to, to help them improve their instrumentation as well. So we've got lots of stakeholders. Now then, what do we want and when do we want it now then? There's a whole load of um, evolutionary uh, um, things that have happened. So our first uh, goal or, or our first submission was this. We wanted to have a Habahawa, perhaps, um, and then in individual institutions, depending on their specialism, would have um, a, a, an instrument uh, or upgrades to the instruments they've already got. 
And the idea was that there would be a building at Harwell, which would be the, the Lari Centre, all right? And this would go, this would cost about this over five years, all right? And then there would be um, money for instruments at Harwell, and then there would be uh, money for upgrades at various different institutions. Um, and then there was a very, very important um, part of the uh, a component would be to continue the work that Katie Joy and colleagues have been doing, uh, doing field work to Antarctica to look for additional meteorites. And then we'd have all these highly qualified staff running the instruments and, and advising. And then we would have also this other angle, which was the education and outreach officer. All right, so this would be fantastic. It would be a really, really wonderful thing. And that was the original STFC um, proposal. Uh, and when you do a proposal, you don't just have science, you have all the other bits and pieces. So we're going to do knowledge exchange, building our new generation, technology development, public experience. What we were hoping is that we would then have a network also of visitor centres, which would be the Natural History Museum, Jodrell Bank, uh, Space Centre at Leicester, the Exploratorium and the Glasgow Science Centre and so on and so on. And of course, we'd also build on um, the OU's agreement with the BBC and then we'd use social media, we'd have our own YouTube channel and all that usual sort of stuff. Uh, governance oversight committee, you know, all this was there. This is all in the all in the STFC thing. All right. So the last time I gave this talk was at Oxford at the British Planetary Science Conference in January. Now I can't remember what the situation was in Oxford vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID nineteen. I think we'd had a few rumours of stuff going on in um, in China, uh, but at the time everything was all systems go for everything. Um, and so we actually met face to face. And I think this was the last face to face conference I, I went to. So uh, the, we've got in this uh, job queue, if you like, for STFC. And then UKRI said, right, actually, what we want is we're going to have an infrastructure fund and we want people on that list of 50 to bid into the infrastructure fund. So STFC asked. Uh, us if we would bid into the infrastructure fund and that immediately meant everything was an order of magnitude bigger because what UKRI want to do is they want and SPFC to some extent is they want to have a nice building somewhere with the UKRI logo on it that a minister can go and open and be photographed in front of um, so they want a telescope or a new particle accelerator or something like that so we upped our bid to 56 million pounds um, and then we had to submit it to STFC, uh, and they were going to um, they were going to prioritise what they actually wanted to submit to UKRI. Well, sadly, we weren't selected. They selected another telescope, which is wow, that's amazing, um, and something for for um, Diamond, I think. Can't remember, but anyway, it wasn't us. So it's like right, okay. So let's come down to the green box at the bottom. All right, so what do we do? We, we still want to go ahead with this. So there is a, a way of doing it through STFC um, and it would have to be significantly scaled down. And that is to have it as a, a major project and you submit to the PPRP, which is the, I can't remember, something project, something or other review panel. All right, and so this is separate from the usual grant uh, bodies. This is for if you want something big. And what you do first of all is submit a statement of intent um, which goes to STFC Science Board and then they say oh yes yeah this is really on our priority list. Develop a full proposal um, and once you've got to that stage you know you're in a really good position to be funded at some time. It might take two or three iterations but at least you're on the list. So, but the way, the way to proceed is to talk to the, the official at STFC to see if it's a good time for you to apply. So I talked to Colin Vincent and Chris Wolford at, at STFC and they, they said, oh, it's not a good time. It's not a good time. We don't know what our settlement is in the comprehensive spending review. Basically, we haven't got any cash. We had a flat cash settlement last time and we haven't got any cash. Try again in April. 
So I have not yet submitted the SOI, but I'm going to. I'm going to put it in so it's there on the table. But we've got a couple of other things going on in parallel. Uh, remember I said that one of the, the, the things that we wanted to do was to see if we could get a European Mars sample return curation facility and get funding from um, uh, uh, funding from the EU for that. Well, uh, goodness me, we can't even travel to Europe from January the 1st, let alone, you know, do anything exciting like uh, analysing, um, uh, um, you know, getting a, a collaboration together to build a European curatorial facility. So uh, I talked to ESFRI, which is the European infrastructure mapping people. Uh, they're the, these are the people who say, right, we need a new we need a new CERN, we need a new uh, uh, neutron spallation source and things like that. Um, and they said, well, actually, um, no, the, e the UK can't lead a bid, uh, but if they want to be part of somebody else's bid, uh, that might happen. So it's like, right, okay, I can't, I haven't got the time or the energy to be, you know, uh, trying to lead a European bid. So I've, I've just left that you know, for somebody else to take up. However, at the same time, the, the view of the UK Space Agency also changed as to what we should be doing. There is a recognition, a, a sort of understanding that samples from Mars, they're going to come back in 2032, they're going to land in Utah, and they are not going to, in the first instance, leave, um, uh, the, uh, leave uh, uh, the US. For quite a long time and so it's it would be make more sense for the uk to pay into the uh, an american facility and so we've been looking at what uh, whether that it's better to get uh, funding to do that rather than to have an all singing all dancing you know place where we can put sterilized samples there's also uh, things that are going on in harwell uh, which is that um uh, the Natural History Museum ha is, uh, has funding to actually develop a wing at Harwell and part of the MSR investment case was perhaps we could uh, have a room out there in their place to actually be a LARI's uh, uh, coordinating uh, uh, place. And the final thing that I want to say is, and this is happening at the moment, is there's a call out from the Leverhulme to uh, have centres of excellence. And so I'm trying to put together a bid for a, a Leverhulme centre for research into extraterrestrial materials. Now this is a university led thing um, and we've got a, a, only one bid can come in from the university. And so we've got about five bids wanting to go in from the Open University. Um, and so it has to go to an internal committee to decide whether we can put the full proposal together or not. So I'm putting an internal proposal together. Uh, I'll need some partners. Uh, so if anybody is interested in being a partner, please email me. And this is my last slide. And unfortunately, Natasha, I've only been able to see my slide and I've got no idea if you're jumping up and down telling me to, to shut up. But just in case I will shut up. Um, I just want to say that this is something that um, three of us, myself, Jamie and Sarah, have been talking about for, for years and years and years. It is going to happen, but we definitely need new people to come on and, and take it over. Uh, but get in touch with me if you'd like to be part of it. Thanks very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can, I hope, see Natasha. Yes. Sorry, Natasha. Okay, How far over was I? Uh, we don't have any time for questions. I'm afraid. All right. I'm really um, sorry. Got the whole slot, but there's just a comment from John Bridges that I'll read out for the benefit of the whole community. Um, John Bridges says, STFC via the Solar System Advisory Panel are planning a new community roadmap for 2021. The curation facility and Lare's related projects would need input into that. So that's something that perhaps we can have an offline discussion with later. So please yeah. get in contact with Monica if you want to get involved, that would be fantastic. So thank you very much, Monica. We You're really appreciate the update. It's fantastic to hear what's going on. Thank you.
Okay, so our next speaker this morning is uh, Dale Martin from ESA, who is going to be talking about ESA's sample analog curation facility, which is over in Harwell as well. So, Dale, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to start, start sharing your screen. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that the Q&A function is um, in the Zoom webinar platform. So if you have a question, please type it in there rather than raising your hand as you might do in uh, smaller seminars. So Dale, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, today I'll be talking about the, the sample analog curation facility, which is currently up and running on the Harwell campus in Oxfordshire. Uh, but first, I'll go into a little bit of a history behind the project. So um, the facility, <coughs> excuse me, the, origin, the facility was originally set up um, during a contract with the Natural History Museum. Uh, the first contract was completed in November 2016, the results of which uh, were eight analogues representing various uh, rock types for the Moon, Mars and Phobos. Um, and as you can see from the images here, they consist of a variety of clay samples, clay granules uh, and uh, basalt aggregates. A second contract was, uh, was developed. Uh, excuse me, a second contract was developed that was completed in 2018. Uh, again, the results of this contract uh, expanded the sample collection to six new analogues, uh, some of which include an orthocyte like the one pictured in the slide here, uh, but also a series of protocols were developed to standardize what we do in terms of curation procedures and characterization procedures of these analogues. Uh, and a series of um, analytical instruments and equipment were also purchased in order to enable uh, these materials to be fully characterized. Uh, an additional outcome, which is definitely a benefit of this second contract, was also uh, a synergy, a kind of um, working partnership between us and the Advanced Manufacturing Lab, also based on the Harwell campus, and various other departments around, uh, around the UK, in order to get an even broader range of uh, analyses completed on these samples. Um, since November last year, the collection and uh, the instruments have all been moved to the Harwell campus and set up in a wing of an existing building. Uh, so from right to left here, there are four rooms. There's a laboratory on the right hand side with all of the analytical equipment. Uh, there's a multi-purpose room with some robotics equipment at the moment in there. Um, a curation room where all the samples are stored and then a sample preparation room uh, furthest away from the analysis area. And the main aim of this facility is to curate uh, an analog collection uh, consisting of both analogs and simulants representative of different planetary surfaces in the solar system. Uh, we're continuing to build and to, to develop both the collection and the set of analytical uh, instruments, with the idea being uh, we can provide a greater range of characterization uh, of these samples. And the samples are also available to loan for anybody both within ESA and the wider uh, scientific community. Um, for things like technology development projects, research, um, and public outreach, just to name a few examples. Um, but to show you a little bit around the facility, this is our analytical room so far. Um, hopefully you can see there's a Raman spectrometer in the far corner. It's a portable unit, which is why it's so small. Um, it means we can do field work with it, but also uh, a Raman microscope that's, that's attached to it. There's an X-ray diffractometer, which is the large Rigaku instrument in the middle, uh, and an X-ray fluorescence um, uh, instrument, which is the big orange thing on the right hand side. Again, the XRF is portable. So between the Raman and the XRF, we can do some um, pretty, um, pretty good field work in terms of um, understanding some basic chemical and mineralogical properties of samples before we decide to collect them and incorporate them into the collection. Um, looking in the other direction, we have a vacuum oven on the far left hand side. Uh, the, the white instrument in the middle is an FTIR spectrometer. And then on the workbench at the back is, a, is an electron microscope with uh, an attached uh, EDX um, setup. So again, this, is th this part of the lab is mainly for mineralogical, chemical and some spectral characterization of uh, the samples. 
Uh, this is the curation room here. So as you can see, we have some heavy duty shelving, mostly with um, open front boxes uh, containing a lot of the uh, a lot of the samples. So we have about one and a half tons of material in here spread across about 20 different samples. And we're going to increase the, the both the number and the mass over the next year uh, to be about 30 different samples. Um, we, we also have a series of, uh, of simulants, some of which have already been developed uh, externally in the past and some that we are developing in-house. Finally, we have some sample preparation equipment. So from left to right, we have a, a rock splitter. Uh, the big steel equipment here is a rock crusher. Uh, we have a milling machine, a, a pellet press, uh, and a sieve shaker here. So between this range of equipment, we can, um, we can adjust some of the physical properties of the samples uh, that we have in the collection. Um, and this is especially useful for if we have uh, a loan request that requires the samples to have a specific particle size distribution or shape or something like that. Uh, we, can, we can change the properties of, uh, of some of the samples to, to match what's required for, for people to use. Um, but how does this relate to extraterrestrial material analysis? I mean, ultimately, uh, this is a facility about analogs and simulants, but it's paving the way forward for uh, for extraterrestrial material analysis in the future. And one of the ways we're doing that is for the Mars Sample Return campaign. Uh, I won't go into Mars Sample Return in too much detail, that's going to be covered by others um, later today. Uh, but, but one of the things that's being developed uh, at the University of Leicester is a double walled isolator, which is a, um, a curation tool. It will house um, sample prep equipment, analytical equipment, and essentially house the Mars samples in a very safe and contained environment. Uh, and one of the things that will be utilized within this, this DWI is, uh, is a robotic arm, a, micro -manipula a, a robotic manipulator. And the idea of this is uh, this large robotic arm here will handle uh, the sample tubes and um, other sample handling devices uh, remotely. So to avoid having human interaction with, uh, with Mars samples. This has been developed by Talazolinia Space at the moment, and it will be delivered to the curation facility here at Harwell early next year. So we'll be conducting a series of tests on the analog samples that we have here to determine the capabilities of, of this robotic arm. Likewise, a micromanipulator has been developed, um, which, which uses micro-robotics to handle individual particles. Uh, in this image here, the particles are peroxonite crystals and they are approximately two millimeters wide. Um, and it's, it's quite an uh, in, intuitive way of picking up, moving around and handling these individual crystals. And again, we're using a range of different uh, samples to determine uh, what can and can't be done with, with, this, uh, with this setup. So for example, we've used some spherical sand grains and they're quite difficult to handle at the moment, but the more angular particles are quite easy to handle. Um, so we're also trying to develop improved ways of handling individual particles uh, remotely. And work for this will also go on um, at STEC. So um, there will be some synergy between XAT and, and STEC in terms of uh, remote handling of these samples. So, so the, the micromanipulator and the robotic arm will be handled uh, by the robotic specialists in STEC and we'll provide uh, the samples here in the UK. Another thing we're looking at doing is lunar sample research. Uh, this has been on, on plans for quite a while now, but we had a glove box delivered to the facility earlier this year. And again, we hope to set it up early next year. Um, and inside this glove box, uh, using some of the smaller and more portable instruments that we have, we can do everything from uh, opening the samples within a nitrogen environment through sample preparation, uh, the curation steps, and then finally the analysis of the samples, all within an inert nitrogen environment. Um, and what I have planned so far for next year is uh, analysis into the uh, analysis of the electrostatic properties of some of these Apollo regolith inside an inert environment, i.e. not ever exposed to uh, um, essentially a hydrous atmosphere. Um, but we also got, we can also um, 
do other research inside this glove box, which we'll be planning, uh, which we'll be planning after next year. Uh, and these results will feed forward not only into new simulant designs, but also aiding in, in new technology developments, particularly for uh, dust mitigation when it comes to um, the electrostatic properties of, of these samples. Finally, we're continuing to do analog research. Uh, this is an ongoing pro project between us, the University of Kent and the Australian Synchrotron. So we sent uh, a, a large a large anorthosite rock to um, to the University of Kent uh, to be shocked by their two-stage gas gun. So as you can see, there's a small impact crater in the surface of, of this analog sample here. Um, and then we sent the sample to Australia to be CT scanned in their synchrotron. The samples have been recently returned to Harwell. So the next stage of that is to process the CT scanning data and use FTR spectroscopy and other techniques to analyze the shock pressure range. Thank you, Nat. To analyze the shock pressure range in uh, the various parts of the sample. We're particularly interested in how the shock varies with distance from the center of this impact site. Um, and if the crystal sizes or any particular orientation of crystals has affected the shock propagation through the sample. Uh, and, and as I say, we're, we're looking at the CT scanning data at the moment to, to, uh, to see if we can see anything like that in more detail. So this is an ongoing research project. Finally, the last comment I wanted to make is a, is a big part of the facility is public outreach. So a uh, shameless uh, photograph here, <clears throat> but we've developed a rock table to take to various conferences, to take to school exhibits and things like that around the UK. Um, at the moment, it can store six samples in these pocket-like things here and around the, above the samples, uh, there, are, there are now plaques uh, describing the samples in more detail and um, members of the public, professionals can come up, see the samples, they can feel them and, and feel what these simulants and analog samples feel like. Um, this is particularly useful for things like uh, moon samples where we, we have Apollo samples available, but not necessarily available to, to, to feel the regolith and feel what it's, what it, what it's actually like to touch. Um, so we have little bags of simulant here that people can pick up and hang around and talk about ask questions, uh, and this works quite well with um, other exhibitions who are showcasing especially new technology developments. Um, um, so we can show what samples are being used to improve those technologies. Uh, and that's it. So if anyone would like to uh, loan any of these samples, to borrow any of these samples for your own research or technology developments, please get in touch and I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic, perfect timing, Dale. Thank you. Um, so you have preempted the first question we had from an anonymous <laughs> attendee asking what the process is for applying for analog material to borrow. Um, so that's fantastic. So as Dale said, get in touch. Yeah, please um, do. The next, <laughs> the next question is: Can you tell us about the storage characterization and mailing protocols for 10 to 500 micron sized particles? Seems like a lot of sample return missions will bring back materials in that size mm -hmm. regime. Yeah, that's a really good question. So at the moment, um, handling of individual particles is obviously very difficult. Um, we don't have anything in place for transporting individual particles. That's something that we're looking at uh, next year to expand the capabilities of, of the, uh, the collection. Um, for storage of those, we do have a lot of materials within that size range and we usually store it on bulk, i.e. within 10 gram samples or larger. Uh, we can work with smaller samples than that, but when we're looking at less than about 100 milligrams, it, it starts to become uh, quite difficult and those protocols haven't yet been developed, uh, but that's on the cards for future. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Lucas, who asks, what types of Mars sample analogues do you currently have? At the moment, it's mostly a range of clays, uh, carbonate materials and um, basalt samples. Uh, we also have some hyaloclastites, um, which, which we believe have formed on Mars as well. Um, so I can, I can happily send you more details of those samples if, if you'd like. Uh, if you have any specific samples in mind or rock types in mind, then please get in touch and we'll try and work something out. 
Okay, and then the final quick question uh, is from Anya, who says, love the rock display, sounds fun for outreach, but can it go to science conferences too, asking for a friend? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, absolutely. Uh, at the moment, it's it's based in the visit in the the actual main foyer area of Exat here, um, and we're developing a second and upgraded version of it to take out to to more conferences. But uh, but yeah, please again, please do get in touch if you're interested in using it for for science conferences. Uh, it's something we wanted to do more of this year, but for obvious reasons couldn't. So we're we're looking at uh, making more use of it next year. Great, thank you. If you're okay, Dale, I just have one quick one. I've just noticed in the chat box rather than the Q&A from John Zanaki, who asks why the Australian synchrotron when there are other facilities in Europe? That's an excellent question. Um, the, the easy answer to that is it was the, um, we, we built up this partnership at the uh, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference a couple of years ago, and it came completely out of a discussion with uh, one of the beam scientists at the Australian Synchrotron who already had a background in, uh, in this kind of research. Um, so more than anything, it was, it was a discussion that led to a, uh, a research project. Fantastic, thank you. Opportunistic science as always. So <laughs> Definitely. That's great. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank uh, you. It was a really exciting talk. Thanks. Okay, our final of the invited talks um, this morning is Gerhard, who is here. Um, so Gerhard will hopefully be telling us a little bit about Mars sample return and what opportunities there are for the science community. So whenever you're ready, please start sharing your screen and over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. We, uh, well, my colleague Dale just showed a nice artist impression of the moon base and uh, we now go on to Mars. Let me see if it works. Natasha, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so Mars sample return, the opportunities for the science community. I would like to uh, also take the opportunity here to introduce my co-author, Aure Hutzler. See, uh, she just uh, started uh, 1st of December as ESA staff, and she will help uh, help me with uh, creation and sample associated aspects for Mars sample return. So we are very happy to have her on board and you will see her name uh, more often now in the future. Mars sample return is a big enterprise. Uh, this is an architecture of MSR. We have altogether um, eight big teams working on MSR. And these are five NASA field centers, three um, industrial consortia uh, of European industry. We have here four launches. We have four, three launches from Earth, one launch from Mars. Uh, we have uh, for um, uh, with two landers on Mars, we have then another lander that will have to land on Earth at the end. Um, we have also a, a number of elements, uh, three flight elements and one substantial ground-based element. So this is a big enterprise uh, and a challenging one. For the nomenclature, I, I put down uh, what we consider MSR program and MSR campaign, because that will be with us for the next decade. The MSR campaign is everything, starting from March 2020, including the uh, first round of objective-driven science analysis, uh, once the sample on Earth. The MSR program includes the two flight elements that, will, uh, that you see here in the middle, the Earth return orbiter and the sample retrieval lander. They are scheduled for launch now in 26. Um, and of course the capsule that it will bring to Mars and then uh, return to Earth with a sample. So the first element of Mars sample return has been launched. It's well on its way to Mars. We'll land in February. It's Mars 2020. Um, this, this rover has two functions. Uh, it will do in situ science, but the priority uh, of Mars 2020 is to cache samples, to select and cache samples that we will later return to Earth. It's a very capable rover, has uh, a, a good um, set of in situ instruments that will give us the geological context of, of the samples. 
In 26, we'll launch two, uh, two rockets again, one from Europe, one from the US. The European is the Earth return orbiter. Biggest orbit ever that will send to Mars. Uh, so far, TGO is by far the biggest orbiter uh, that ever sent to Mars. ERO will be, again, bigger than TGO, um, substantially bigger. Um, this spacecraft will go to Mars. It will have on board also a system from the US that will be then used to contain the sample uh, and, and uh, send it back to Earth in a capsule. The second launch in 26 will be uh, a big lander. Here you see uh, it's the same image as the Mars 2020 lander, but it will be bigger. The air shell is bigger and it's also heavier. And it lands a surface element um, uh, that will land on Mars, will carry a European rover, a fetch rover, and a rocket that will at the end then launch the samples to a lower Earth, to a low Mars orbit. Um, the two rovers, we use them as a backup. Uh, they both can bring samples to the rocket. Uh, Mars 2020 can drop samples uh, that can be uh, picked up by the fetch rover and the fetch rover can then go to the lander. Uh, but Mars 2020 can also go to the lander and, and deliver samples. So that's a backup we use um, in case one of the system isn't work properly. Like I said, then the sample is launched to Mars orbit, around three, 350 kilometer orbit, and Eero has to detect it at a distance of uh, a thousand plus kilometer. We'll have to collect the ball, and it's really like a ball, about 35 centimeters in diameter, and uh, bring it back to Earth. It will be then uh, transferred to a capsule, and the capsule will land ballistically without parachute, so unlike uh, Hayabusa and, and Osiris Rex, because it's not safe enough uh, for the Mars sample return in the uh, Utah test range. And then we'll be transferred to an internationally managed sample receiving facility. So that's the big picture. Now the important thing is the science. And uh, these are the science objectives that we uh, pursue with the Mars Sample Return uh, campaign. And uh, I don't go through all of them. These are the science objectives that have been established by the IMOS team. Uh, the IMOS team um, has not been a real science definition team that you would have for, uh, for flagship or cornerstone missions. But uh, despite that, uh, we have adopted the um, IMOS science objectives for the science management planning activities and also for the sample um, selection and caching strategy activities. So the, the five first uh, uh, science objectives um, uh, deal really with science only. Uh, um, understanding the geological process with a certain emphasis on the role of water, understanding the pot potential biological history of Mars. So we have a very nice site where we could study that. Um, dating, so uh, understanding the evolution of the timeline of Mars, correlating the absolute dates we get from the surface with the crater dating we have, uh, understanding Martian volatiles, uh, Martian atmospheric evolution, and interior structure. And then there are six and seven, these are two, two uh, objectives that deal main, mainly as feed forward for human exploration. So to, to uh, understand a little bit more about potential hazards and resources uh, that the crew could use in the future. Top level science management as we envision it today. On the right side in blue, you see what is already in place. We have already a signed flight element MOU between uh, ESA and NASA. Um, we are in the final signature process of the joint management and implementation plan, how to manage the various flight elements. And we have already established a joint steering board between ESA and NASA. Science is represented in this joint steering board uh, on the ESA and NASA side. And we have our first meeting mid-January. On the far left, you see um, 
the starting point for the science management. So we had originally a joint letter of intent between us and ESA for MSR science benefits. Uh, we also had uh, a science planning group phase one that has been completed last year. And this year we uh, started a successor of that, the Mars Science Planning Group phase two. And there are a couple of deliverables that we will get from the uh, MSPG phase two. One, um, at least for me, most important delivery is a very good draft of the science management plan. Um, designing the, uh, also the uh, curation elements and um, some critical science and curation requirements as feed forward for any facility design activities. And this will finish in April next year. In parallel, we are working on a MSR science MOU between NASA and ESA. So there will be one MOU specifically for the science aspect. This MOU will call up the science management plan and we will of course then also establish um, a science board uh, that will deal with the top level science aspect of how to manage uh, and maximize the science return of MSR. And this science board will then interact with the steering board on the engineering side. That's the, the science management uh, big picture. I also want to say that uh, because uh, Monica just talked uh, before, Monica is member in MSPG2, not only a member, she is a, actually a small strategic team with wise uh, women and men that, that give us a more strategic um, advice on top of the uh, recommendation findings and uh, reports uh, the other team members provide. Now, what are the opportunities for the general science community? Um, it's not an exhaustive list here, but it's, it's uh, an example of what we plan, what we have in place already and what we plan in the future. Uh, before going into some of that, the, the real important um, um, notion that I'm following here and that we are following together is to maximize the um, contribution of the science community throughout the entire 10 year process. Thanks, Natasha. So we want to really generate opportunities to, uh, to involve the science community and to involve the interested members in the science community. Not always the same people that we move from one working group or committee or advisory body to the next one. That is not the intention. We want to maximize the number of people that are involved in the exploitation of MSR science. So the list here started already um, um, this year with a turn sample science participating scientist team from March 2020. Uh, we have selected five European uh, scientists to become member of that. They are now a member of the Mars 2020 science team. That's done. Science planning group phase two. We have selected uh, actually more European than US members in this group. That is done. People are working already since uh, before the summer on that. Next was the caching strategy steering committee. We have established that. We have also European science uh, members in this group. It's running. They will finish uh, in, in March next year. And then we have more. Next year, we will establish a mass science uh, sample return campaign science group. This will be the equivalent of a project science team. We don't have payload. Um, we don't have a mission to you know, go somewhere and, and do in situ science. We'll have to cover with this MSR campaign science group the entire decade that is in front of us of MSR science. So this will be like a, a project science team and we will issue an AO for membership. Participating scientist program, we will um, continue with that. Uh, there has been already a selection for Mars 2020 participating scientists. Uh, two Europeans have been selected, uh, but we will continue this participating scientist program and extend it to, the, to MSR and not only focus on Mars 2020. And then there are some further activities uh, that will follow on where we will issue almost always AOs. So uh, you will be uh, able to bid for that and there will be competitive selection with a team, a review team of NASA and ESA. Uh, and we will try to make the calls as neutral as possible so that no agency or no 
country is is has an advantage uh, which sometimes is the case of course if you issue uh, NASA AOs because you know it, it's just a, a different kind of machinery behind it so you will have a lot of chances to participate in MSR science throughout the entire decade not only at the end once the samples are already that's where we go. That will be our home for the next uh, couple of years. Very interesting place. Uh, you probably all know it, uh, Jezero Crater. will land hopefully with the highest probability just off the Delta. And then Mars 2020 will explore uh, their region uh, and get us a good samples uh, from the you know, almost 200 meter high Delta deposits and hopefully the, the carbonates we see on the Western side here. And then climbing up the rim 800 meters um, to get uh, some some interesting mega pressure from the from the crater rim, and then it might go on uh, further uh, to midway. But the the prime mission, two year prime mission of Mars 2020, will end somewhere um, on the left side, climbing to the crater rim. So that's where we'll get most of the samples from. And that's my last slide already. Um, and that's the next opportunity for you. I mentioned that we have set up a caching uh, strategy committee. Uh, we have already started the work and we will uh, organize an open workshop so that the um, general science community can participate in our discussions. Um, this will be on 21st of January. So if you're interested, Please put it on your calendar. We will send out an invitation within the next couple of days. It will be a four hour activity in what is our late afternoon in Europe. There are a couple of questions we will ask. Uh, one very important is um, what is more important to cover the diversity of the site of Cesaro, so to pick, you know, really diverse samples or to better focus on several geological settings and cover the diversity with each, with the, within each setting. So this will be one, one strategic issue that we'll have to discuss. The second one is what is actually a scientifically return worthy cache? What's good enough in terms of samples to bring to earth? Um, very, very uh, interesting discussion that we already have and hopefully we'll have more in the workshop. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, join us 21st of January. Um, we will send uh, probably uh, an email invitation to Natasha and maybe she can then distribute it to the attendants of this workshop. Um, uh, and we'll also put distribute it on the MEPAC uh, mailing list and so forth. And with that, I want to finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you very much Gerhard. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but unfortunately we've run over time. So I'm going to ask the first one because I'm hoping it will be a quick answer. So Graham asks, what is the best case total mass of returned material? 400 gram. There we go. <laughs> 400 grams. Okay, and then there's another question in here from John Zalecki, but Gerhard, if you wouldn't mind answering it in the uh, type response in the chat window, we can uh, move on now because we have to get to some flash talks as well. So. Thank you very much, Gerhard. That was a really interesting update on the Mars uh, sample return campaign. And thank you to our other invited speakers as well this morning. And um, we have a few more invited speakers um, towards the end of the day. But for now, I'm going to pass over to Luke Daly, who's going to take over and introduce some of our flash talks this morning. Oh, we can't hear you, Luke. Bear with us, everybody. <laughs> there we go. Is that better? Yes. I'll just, okay, I'll just get you. the microphone then. <laughs> cool. So yeah, uh, this uh, next session is the flash talk session. So um, basically each speaker will have three minutes to present their science. There will be no time for questions live, but I would still encourage you to use the Q&A session if you are interested in the science presented by the speakers to submit a question there. Um, 
and the speaker will stay on as a panelist and answer that after they've given their talk. Um, so uh, for information for the speakers, uh, you will have three minutes and I will turn my screen off at the start of your talk and turn it on when you have one minute left um, and sort of wave frantically if you're going way over time. Uh, so be sure to kind of wrap up around then. Uh, and so, yeah, without further ado, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker for this. I'll just uh, get my program so I get the name right. Uh, so this first talk will be on biogenic magneto needles in the Martian sedimentary haystack, searching for magneto fossils in Jezero Crater, lacustrine sedimentary rocks probed during Mars sample return campaign. And the talk will be given by Juan. So Juan, if you fancy sharing your screen, take it away. Okay, uh, let me check where I have my my presentation, where is it? Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if I can, oops, oh yeah. No, it's not this one. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm managing to, to do this, right. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's not um, it's not on presenter mode. Yeah. No, it's okay, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, here you see the title of my presentation. I'm Michael Walters. Okay, I'm going straight to the point. Well, as you already might know, these magnetostatic bacteria are some prokaryote organisms that live in a wide variety of aqu aquatic environments, including extreme ones all over our planet. These organisms have the ability to synthesize uh, chains of uh, magnetite crystals that you see here with a very specific size, which are used for assisting the cell in navigation. When these bacteria die, these chains can be preserved, fossilized in the sedimentary record, uh, completely intact. And it is a very specific signature of these chains that uh, enable their distinction in, in the fossil record. Genetic data indicate that these organisms emerged on Earth at around 3.3 giga years ago, when aqueous environments uh, were widespread on Earth, and there was also a planetary magnetic field already well, well established. This uh, Mars wet, uh, witnessed similarly wet conditions under the protective umbrella of our planetary magnetic field throughout most of the Noachian. So whether life might have evolved independently in Mars uh, in a similar context to that on Earth, or whether life was transferred from Mars, uh, from Earth to Mars uh, in, by meteoritic impacts, it is, uh, there is certainly the possibility that this sort of very old uh, primitive organisms were present in early Mars too. And especially in the favorable lacustrine environments reported from the from the Jezero crater. Of all the methods that we that there have been there have been developed in, in, in the last years to identify these magnetofossils in the sedimentary record, we're going to focus our attention on magnetic methods. Well, here you see an image of one of these equipments. It's essentially an electromagnet where that measures the pro magnetic properties of the samples put here. And we think that these specific methods that we want to apply have several advantages. First of all, the magnetic properties of the samples are not affected by sterilization, sterilization treatments to which these samples, statutory cell samples, might be subjected. Second, these, uh, these methods are rapid and non-destructive. And third, um, they involve just cutting of one cubic centimeter chip of material. So they integrate the signal of a quite significant volume of material, which is not the case for the tools that uh, are focused on surfaces or on very, very small scales. We think that uh, these characteristics make the, makes, make the magnetic method suitable for being used in preliminary screening of uh, biological signatures. And of course, this will have to be coordinated with other tools. Also, of course, those involving paleomagnetic measurements that are also planned for this, for these samples, I think. Uh, well, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome. Thanks very much for that. Uh, just quickly check the Q&A. Oh, 
if you have any questions uh, for Huan, just uh, post them in there and he'll answer them during the next speaker's talk. Uh, in which case, we'll move rapidly on to our next speaker, which is a talk on pho photogrammetry for determining the physical properties of meteorites. Uh, and this talk will be given by Tom Harvey. So, Tom, uh, you have three minutes if you want to share your screen and take it away. Okay, fab. Can you see that all right? Yeah, that looks Grand. good to me. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Tom Harvey and I am a STFC funded PhD student from the University of Manchester. I'm supervised by Katie Joy and Rianne Jones and today I just want to give you a, a quite brief overview of the research that I'm working on uh, in Manchester as part of the Lost Meteorites of Antarctica project. So uh, physical properties of meteorites um, such as density, porosity, magnetic susceptibility and electrical conductivity are key to addressing a range of scientific questions about meteorites and their parent bodies. Among other things, uh, meteorite densities are used to make inferences about the composition and internal structure of asteroids, and uh, porosity is a key parameter in understanding the physical history of meteorite parent bodies in terms of processes such as asteroid compaction, uh, lithification, breakup, and reassembly. So as part of my PhD, I've been developing, um, working on a non-destructive and scalable lab technique for uh, determining meteorite bulk density using photogrammetry. Uh, the setup for which is shown here, the sample is placed on a turntable, and then I take hundreds of high resolution photographs um, of the sample in the clean labs at Manchester. Uh, the process produces high fidelity 3D models of samples uh, for the purpose of volume determination, but also forms a long term curatorial record of sample exteriors. So photogrammetry uses matching points from overlapping details in a suite of images to determine accurate information about the subject of those images. Using a professional photogrammetry software, Agisoft Metashape, some of the workflow for which is just shown on, in these pictures, um, we are able to match pixels from suites of high resolution photographs uh, of samples returned from Antarctica to build a 3D model of those samples. Uh, these models are then uh, imported into a CAD software and calibrated to a known measured dimension on the sample in order to determine a value for the volume. So I've got some videos of the models that I've managed to make. Uh, so far we've managed to produce 20 models of 20 meteorite samples from Antarctica. Uh, volume determination for these models is currently uh, in progress and we're using um, blocks of known volume to help calibrate the uncertainty on this method. Um, and we are also going to compare the volume and density values that we produce by this method with those uh, determined from some computed tomography studies, uh, which I'm sure you'll probably hear more about uh, later today from Jane. Um, that's uh, all I've really got to show. So if anybody has any questions about that, feel free to let me know. And um, yeah, that's great, thank you. Perfect timing. Uh, yeah, no, really, really awesome stuff and really cool uh, approach. Really also good for COVID remote teaching, I found. So uh, yeah, um, keep it up. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Um, as I said, ask any questions in the Q&A. I think there's one from Maitri. Um, and the next speaker uh, is going to be talking about instrumentation for basic characterization of Mars material under containment. And the talk will be given by Lucas Adam. Uh, so Lucas, if you uh, want to share your screen and uh, uh, you have three minutes from when you start. Hello, is that working? Yeah, that looks good. Uh, I can see your screen. All right, excellent. So um, I'm Lucas Adam. I'm a PhD student at the University of Leicester, and then we're developing instrumentation for the basic characterization phase of Mars sample return under containment. So basic characterization is the first stage of sample analysis um, as defined by the Mars Science Planning Group in the first report. This is intended to inform the decisions needed for further analysis. So what you want to do really is in basic characterization is to just understand what is there in your sample tube. Um, so we're looking at things like the morphology and mineralogy and composition of samples. And that's why these measurements are uh, 
non-contact and low energy so that they keep the samples as pristine as possible for future science. And the primary methods um, envisioned for this are thus X-ray computer tomography and optical imaging, although there are some others, um, but we're focusing on these two. So what we want to do is to find the instrument requirements for basic characterization and also to develop um, a prototype of an imager that could be used under containment. So first we determine a list of sort of reasonable minimum measurement goals um, of basic characterization uh, of what we want to know about a sample that, that's necessary to inform further science. And we're putting together a collection of uh, sample analogs to uh, perform all these tests on. So we've already developed um, a sort of first imager breadboard, which we plan to improve as we um, learn more about basic characterization and how we want to do it. And uh, we also intend to use this to test um, BC procedures inside the double-walled isolator, which is an ultra-clean biosafety cabinet that's currently being developed for MSR at Leicester. So this will support the different types of analysis and instrumentation required um, while keeping high containment on, on these samples. Currently, we're characterizing these imagers, uh, my imager for um, contrast, resolution, distortion, and elaboration, and color reproduction under different illumination setups and seeing what works best. And right now, it's capable of spatial resolutions down to 12 to 3 microns with 20% contrast, depending on the magnification level. So that lets you analyze um, very fine grains of sand. And we're also planning to run some blind characterization trials inside the sample operations test cabinet, which is this big transparent box, which mimics the working volume of the DWI. So on the X-ray computed tomography side of things, um, we intend to characterize these, these sample analogs once we've made them um, inside a replica of, of the sample tube um, for things like relative attenuation, grain size, shape, and sorting, um, void spaces, porosity, and cementation. And this is really to determine whether micro CT is, is a sufficient technique for basic characterization to find the optimal scan settings for the range of different sample types that we expect to get back, and also to um, quantify the difference in scan quality caused by the sample tube. And we're also planning on some similar experiments, hopefully at Diamond Light Source, to investigate whether synchrotron CT would be necessary instead of uh, micro CT. Thank you. That's my entire presentation. Again, spot on when the timer hit zero. So fantastic. Yeah, no, really cool stuff. Um, and again, uh, any questions, throw them in the Q&A and Lucas will add, uh, answer them um, as we move on to our next speaker. Uh, so the next talk is non-contact millimeter wave sensing of rock material properties. And this talk will be given by Jamie Blanche. Uh, so Jamie, yeah, so you're already way ahead of me. <laughs> Uh, hi. Okay. So, can you can you see me and hear me? Okay. Yep. Brilliant. And you can see my screen. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'll I'll press on. So, uh, so I'm Jamie Blanche. I'm a research associate uh, working for the Offshore Robotics for Certification of Assets Hub. Uh, I'm working in partnership with Smart Systems Group and uh, Microsense Technologies Limited, and um, we're located at Heriot-Watt University in Edinburgh, in Scotland. So, uh, I'll be presenting to you non-contact millimeter wave sensing of rock material properties. Um, so millimeter wave sensing for material analysis offers a uh, new accessibility to materials and structures uh, by providing data on both surface and internal material properties for low to medium dielectric materials. Uh, and this reveals intrinsic properties and uh, some features. Uh, the system has been benchmarked against uh, comparative analysis techniques with uh, state-of-the-art systems. For example, in the, uh, the top left uh, image shows the comparison of the millimeter wave sensor data which is the, uh, the plotted line uh, versus the neutron beam data, uh, which is the false color imagery above, where the sensor response to increasing water ingress uh, within a porous sandstone is visible. Uh, the low power uh, of the platform agnostic sensor uh, highlights the unique potential for both space payload deployment uh, and non-contact laboratory analysis uh, of environmentally sensitive space rocks. Uh, and is shown to complement expensive and heavy neutral beam type systems. Uh, similarly, the sensor has been benchmarked against X-ray de uh, detection of metallic mineral content. Uh, so that's the cluster of images uh, at the bottom left of the screen here, which have been verified as reflection coefficients uh, from the millimeter wave sensor uh, at the, uh, the left-hand side of these uh, right-hand side images, if that made sense. <laughs> Uh, so the sensor has been shown to detect deformation and fracture events within uh, actually loaded sandstones, 
uh, with unique indicators of whole sample failure evidence some tens of seconds before the failure actually occurred. So that's been a, a point of interest in the research. Uh, surface and subsurface property measurements uh, can also include uh, porosity, uh, poor volume content, uh, mineral presence within these complex structures, uh, chemical presence such as salt and ice surfaces, uh, and uh, internal fluid presence. Uh, so this is all various streams of research that we've conducted successfully. Um, so the millimeter wave sensor system represents an innovative, non-destructive evaluation technology. It requires no physical contact with the, uh, with the target uh, and can relay vital information on rock properties through low uh, dielectric materials, uh, allowing for material preservation in a sealed laboratory environment. Ultimately, millimeter wave sensing represents a low power, low, co low cost payload that could not only form the basis of a lab on a bot for materials analysis uh, in the harsh environments of space, uh, providing soil and rock data in situ, but also provide material analysis and feature identification in a laboratory environment. So uh, benchmarking this technology in the lab today will result in high fidelity sensor for future autonomous deployment to off-world sites of geological interest. Uh, so I, I will, I'll wrap up there. I guess I'm kind of on, on off time, I, I guess. Bang on the second. <laughs> Everyone's Thank doing fantastically well. I don't know I, how people are managing it. <laughs> I'd script it, you see, for timing. But anyway, I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. No, thanks very much, Jamie. That's fantastic. A really awesome bit of kit. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have our very own co-organizer giving the final talk of the flash sessions. Uh, and the talk is entitled Nanoscale Synchrotron and Microscopy Analysis of Returned Extraterrestrial Materials. And the talk will be given by Leon Hicks. Hi, thank you. Uh, yep, Leon Hicks, University of Leicester. I'm hoping the uh, screen's sharing now. Uh, this is just going to be a quick flash talk regarding uh, synchrotron analyses of uh, sample return materials, uh, including Hayabusa, Itakawa asteroid samples, uh, Stardust, Comet, Vilt 2, Trax, uh, Apollo, Lunar Soil, uh, using the I-18 microprobe and the I-14 nanoprobe at uh, Diamond Light Source. Uh, other samples we've looked at also include uh, various types of um, meteorites uh, and other beam lines or EPSIC as well. We got a TEM image there of uh, a nanophase ion particle in the space weathered sample, a lunar sample. Uh, the, uh, we've investigated Stardust tracks uh, using I-18, uh, measuring X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, X-ray diffraction, uh, X-ray fluorescence, uh, these term terminal grains that you get in the tracks are uh, typically less than 10 micrometers across and we keep them in the aerogel track when we're measuring them and there is essentially no damage to the grains themselves really. Uh, we can identify various mineralogy including uh, nickel bearing magnetite uh, in at least three of the grains that we studied. Uh, there's a reference there, um, uh, Hicksatel 2017 that obviously goes into a lot more detail. Uh, quickly moving on to I-14, uh, here is uh, fib lift out sections of uh, space weathered grains. We've got uh, Hayabusa Itikawa asteroid samples uh, on the left. And then uh, the gif that you see on the right uh, is a, a lunar sample of space weathered. Uh, these are Zane's maps. We're looking again at uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, but this is Zane's mapping. And we do that by uh, collecting over a hundred flow, X-ray fluorescence maps at varied energies, different energies. And then when we compile them all, we get the Zanes map. Um, from this, we can select uh, various regions of interest, in particular, the 100 nanometer thick uh, space weathered rim uh, to get a Zanes spectrum. And we can compare that to the host material. And then uh, there's a paper I'm referencing at the bottom here, it's currently in press now. Uh, and we've shown that in the Itikawa samples that there has been some oxidation in the space weathered uh, silicate material. And we're continuing to do this with, obviously we've got a lunar sample there as well, and hopefully Hayabusa 2 as well. And I'll leave it there, uh, If but stay tuned. We've got Diamond Synchrotron uh, talk coming up later uh, by Julia Parker. And I think I'm the host, am I, or not? Perfect. Thanks, Leon. Um, yeah, any questions for Leon, throw them in the Q&A. And yeah, but Leon, I believe you're going to make a magical metamorphosis into a the host for the next session. And I'm going to take a back seat. Um, yeah, thanks very much. That was a 
whirlwind tour of some really awesome uh, bits of analysis and bits of uh, sort of science people are doing. A uh, really awesome to see. And so, yeah, Liam, take it away for our second session of the morning. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the morning session. Uh, first talk we've got is uh, Julia Parker, senior BM line scientist at Diamond Light Source at I 14, as we just saw. Um, and this talk is Diamond is the scientist's best friend. So, Julia, if you can share your screen. There we go. Is that gone into it? Yes, there we go. Okay, yes, uh, yeah, and it's definitely the, the friend I've seen most of after the, over the last six months or so. So, yes, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, so the idea of the talk is just to give an overview of the kind of the current um, current state of play on different beam lines at Diamond and, and what give, hopefully give you an idea of what you can use Diamond for for your samples. Obviously, that's that's a lot to cover in um, 10 minutes or so. So I'll give a very brief overview of what Diamond is, but then I'll concentrate more on the imaging and microscopy beam lines, give a few examples, hopefully relevant examples across different length scales and, and resolutions and using different techniques. And obviously, um, coming from the, the hard X-ray nanoprobe beamline, I'll give a little bit more detail about the, the techniques and, and the current state of play possible at Diamond, uh, at I-14, sorry, and then um, leading on to an, a beamline that's just about to come online, um, Dyad, the dual imaging and diffraction beamline, and just give you an idea of the capabilities that that beamline will have. Okay, so just to start, I think I can, sorry, let me just... Until we might be able to see. So Diamond Light Source is the UK's national synchrotron facility. We're about 10 miles south of Oxford um, with this big donut shaped building here. Essentially we have a, an electron source, linear accelerator and a booster synchrotron um, and then the electrons get put into the big storage ring which is about 500 meters um, diameter and as they are accelerated by the magnets in that ring the x-ray radiation, also the UV and IR radiation gets fed out to the different beam lines. So at the moment we have 33 operational beam lines um, doing different, different techniques, different sample setups, different energies, different resolutions. And we're also home to the electron microscopy facilities um, for biology. So it's EBIC, which is cryo electron microscopy, and then some um, aberration corrected um, TEMs for physical sciences. So that's the EBSIC facility. And just for reference, this is an old photo. So I-14 is actually in a building built here um, on the grass there. And just to take a step back, Diamond is on the Harwell Science Campus, which is alongside ESA, uh, which was mentioned earlier. So it was fascinating to find out what actually some of the stuff that goes on in that building, um, the Central Laser Facility, ISIS, and the Medical Research Council and the National Nuclear Lab. So, all along, so. Okay, so as I said, there's 33 operational beam lines at the moment, soon to be 34. Um, we're grouped into different um, science groups, so that I'm going to concentrate on the lovely brown coloured ones today, so the imaging and microscopy beam lines. Um, they're made up of um, IO8, which is the scanning um, X-ray microscopy. This is soft X-ray, so this will give you spectroscopy on the um, lower energy elements, so kind of a nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. Um, Obviously, dyad we'll talk more about later. I-12 is then the high energy end of the spectrum, and with the high energy X-rays, you can image much larger samples, much thicker samples, and you can also do a lot more in-situ work getting through a much larger sample environment. Um, I-13 is the um, imaging tomography beamline, and then obviously I-14 in the building out here. Um, and before I carry on, I just wanted to briefly mention other beamlines that are obviously of interest um, for sample characterization could be things like the, um, the high-resolution powder diffraction beamline. I think they recently published a paper looking at laboratory analogues of um, um, silicate materials, so looking at the in-situ crystallization of iron silicates. And then obviously B18 is the, the core XAF beamline for doing bulk um, X-ray spectroscopy. So you can find out a bit more about the different imaging and microscopy beamlines here. But the important point really is that we cover a really large range of different resolutions and different fields of view. So I-18 is kind of a large, large beam size and cover large samples. Um, obviously, then the resolution is limited. And then you go to smaller beams, things like I-14, have the 150 to 100 nanometer beam. Um, but then obviously it's a much smaller sample size. And then your sample preparation and what sample you're looking at then comes into play about which beam line you would use. And obviously the different beam lines, the different techniques, um, you can get different information from your sample. So obviously with things like imaging, you can get out a, a pore structure or a crack um, network within a sample, the different material densities. 
um, with diffraction, you can things like the phase identification of the material, the crystallography, dislocations and crystal orientations within it. And then the spectroscopy, obviously the sample composition from the fluorescence mapping, um, but also then the zanes or the excess to give you the, the chemical, more chemical information, this state, you know, Fe2+, plus, Fe3+, plus within the sample. Um, and there's also, when it becomes more interesting is when you can do multimodal um, imaging and microscopy and kind of combine the information from from the imaging with the diffraction map or with, with the spectroscopy from a sample. Um, so I don't think I have too much time to go into different imaging modes, but essentially we mainly would do inline absorption or phase contrast, um, where you just look at the transmitted um, beam on a, on a detector to, to build up your sample image. Um, to get a better resolution, we can do things like full field microscopy, where a beam is focused onto a sample, it scatters, we refocus using a lens and then image or cone beam or projection imaging where essentially we place the sample in a, in a cone beam and the image is projected onto, um, onto the detector. And then again, different um, beam lines, different sample methods um, and different spatial resolutions with those. But to get, um, to get the other information, so the diffraction or the spectroscopy or the element, elemental composition as a function of position, you really need to then move to a scanning microscope. So essentially we would focus the x-rays down onto the sample. So something like I-18, we're talking around about two micron, five micron, two micron beam, and um, something like I-14 with 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. You then scan your sample through the x-rays and you can collect different informations at the same time. So you might be collecting the diffraction pattern along with the imaging to coordinate the spatial organization and the structure of your material or the elemental composition. Um, and then you can add in extras. So you scan the energy then, and that will give you the, the spectroscopy at, at each pixel as Leon alluded to in the talk before. Um, you can also then move into um, three dimensions by rotating the sample and building up a, a tomography image of your sample from the diffraction data, the composition data, or even the, the imaging data. So um, I've tried to gather different um, examples from, from different beam lines to give an idea of, of the different capabilities. And this um, example is um, looking at the, the fallout particles from the Fukushima nuclear incident. Um, and so this work is, is published here. And this, these slides are thanks to Christoph, the, um, the PBS on beamline I-13. So the work they've done here is combining the X-ray tomography data with some um, fluorescence tomography data and um, to look at the morphology of the particle, but also the elemental composition. So during, and um, this is a sub millimeter particle, I think taken from a, a, around the area. And the idea is to, um, to if you can look at the, the morphology and the elemental composition of these, you can work out where they've come from and what and how the disaster happened or how far the debris has spread, which has implications obviously then for the, for the safety of, of the, the material after as well. So from the tomography and the morphology, you can see it kind of has this, um, this is a 3D rendering of the, the whole particle. It's a few hundred microns long. You can see it has this glassy kind of bubbly structure, which has implications for the temperature that the, the particle got to. Um, and combining that with the fluorescence map, you can kind of segregate the different elements within the 3D rendering. Um, and you can then also look at the combinations of those, so overlapping areas um, and things within, within the particle. Um, so you can also see once they've done the, the, um, the work on I-13, um, when you take a slice through the, the 3D rendering, you can see there's some, a couple of, oh wow, two minutes, <laughs> I go really fast. There's a couple of uh, uranium particles and um, which they went on to do then I-18 and um, Zane spectroscopy of, and that identified them as being similar to um, UO2, so identified reactor fuel. Um, this example here is now going to a smaller scale. So this is work on I-14. This is the work that Leon's just talked about. So the sample here is now a FIB lift out sample. And they were interested in this space weathered zone. So he's talked about the zones mapping approach that they use and you can then pull out the different spectra um, from there and you can see that there's a shift in this oxidation edge. Um, so a, uh, a um, increased um, ferric content um, in the space weathered rim. Um, so yes, I-14, um, this is what it looks like at the moment. We have the XRF detector. It's actually in backscatter mode. So it's really easy then to combine the XRF images with some transmission image, um, either the images or um, diffraction maps. So this, I really like this um, example from um, 
Agatha of working in uh, Paul Schofield's group at the Natural History Museum. Um, this was a again another fib sample doing XRF mapping and looking at the co-location of um, different elements within the different regions of the sample. Um, this one down here is looking at um, this is a dried algae, so coccolithophore um, algae cells dried. And you can see lots of, this is calcium and this is phosphorus, and these are precursors that the algae then use. But the elemental maps on their own don't give you much context for where the, how those elements are distributed within the, the, the structure of the cells. Um, but here we can combine that with the, the phase contrast imaging. And when you overlay those, you then get an idea of the spatial distribution of the elements within kind of the, the, the algae structure or the tissue structure. We can combine all these with rotation. Um, so this is an example from Dorota uh, working in our group um, in combination with UCL and the Faraday Institute. So this is a battery particle. So again, it's lots of different particles within a binder. We have the XRF CT, which shows the distributions of those throughout the particle. And the imaging, we can also combine that with spectroscopy and diffraction data to give you an idea of you know, the oxidation on the outside of the particles there. Um, my last one was quickly just going to be a uh, dyad. Um, so a dyad, the aim of dyad is to combine the tomography with the, the diffraction imaging on the same sample at the same time. So they essentially have a split beam and you would image your sample and then choose which regions you want to scan with your diffraction beam. So usually we scan a sample through the beam, but here you map your diffraction beam over your sample. And the only thing I'm going to say on that is uh, they have their first experiments coming up in February. And if anyone would like any more information, you can contact Christina, um, for being my scientist. Dyad. So that was really a whistle stop tour of um, microscopy and imaging. And um, for more information, please feel free to contact me. And I'd just like to thank Christoph and Paul and Christina and Dorota who gave me slides. And obviously um, the users, Leon, John, um, Daniel Chevrier was the, um, the algae and Agatha for the um, slide. And also thank you for the invite and thank you all for listening. All right, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, there, are, there aren't any questions that I can see. Uh, just a quick question, how's um, remote access been going for the past year? Uh, would you really, really more well. applications? Yeah, so yeah. In, yeah, initially we were, we were all closed on site, but yeah, we're now running remote access. So users are sending samples, we're mounting them for them, but then they're remote connecting and running the beam time as if they were there. So actually given that our samples, people tend to spend a lot of time on one sample. So, you know, doing the spectroscopy or, or the tomography. So actually the sample changes kind of in the morning and in the evening, and then users generally seem to be running very well, which I think is, yeah, is really good. <laughs> so we're managing to make full use of the beam at the moment, yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, so if you can unshare your screen. Oh, yes. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Enrico Donato from DLR, German Aerospace Center, uh, doing a talk on planetary sample analysis laboratory at DLR. Can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Go ahead. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the possibility to talk today. So um, a few months ago, I moved uh, to DLA in Berlin, uh, where I am basically following the uh, setting up uh, of uh, an extraterrestrial material sample analysis laboratory, uh, which is uh, set uh, within the Institute of uh, Planetary uh, Research. Um, in the Institute, there is already like an astrobiology laboratory, which has a simulation facility for the simulation of like uh, Mars surface, but also icy moon and exoplanets, uh, and also the possibility of uh, doing Raman spectroscopy uh, analysis, as well as a, a spectroscopy laboratory, which uh, um, has capability to um, uh, to collect uh, um, emissivity, but also transmittance and reflectance measurements. Uh, again, with like very low, very high temperatures. And uh, you can also apply for these facilities, uh, uh, access to these facilities through Europlanet. But uh, so, 
um, a couple of years ago, uh, DLR um, decided that they wanted to extend the uh, facilities to be able to analyze the samples from uh, sample return missions. Okay, so and that's uh, why uh, they so that's how it started with the idea of the um, sample analysis laboratory. This laboratory is uh, at the moment uh, under like uh, we are doing, uh, we're still uh, doing the projects, uh, we are still doing the selection of the instruments uh, and uh, um, the aim is to be able to do geochemical, spectroscopic, but also mineralogical analysis at a macroscopic scale. So it's uh, going to be focused for in-situ analysis, um, primarily for asteroids and the moon uh, returned uh, samples. But of course, since this sort of material is not going to be, is not widely available. And uh, yeah, so we're also going to open to like uh, uh, analysis of like uh, meteorites and so on. So the questions are always like, do you like, uh, we can uh, look at uh, studies, uh, do studies for formation evolution of planetary body surfaces. Uh, looking at traces for volcanic matter, Bosa, and also you know, uh, within the LR, remote sensing, uh, um, it's a, a, a very strong field, and this would actually be a good complement uh, for uh, within situ analysis. So we are looking at to, uh, I just want to give a, a brief showcase of which are the instruments we would like to, uh, we are considering to purchase and eventually, and uh, also it's going to be a laboratory that is going to be open to the whole scientific community and we're really open to collaboration. So of course, if there is any feedback you would like to give or maybe something that uh, I haven't kept uh, into consideration, I'm really happy to accept it. Uh, uh, to talk about it. So we are thinking to um, to, to purchase an X-ray diffractometer, which has an exchangeable optics to transform it to also be able to collect uh, macro XRD patterns. So we can look at powder samples, but also samples with uh, like a flat surface. We will be able to have uh, uh, to do phase ID, calculation of mineral abundances, as well uh, as um, we can. Uh, we also have the option to uh, um, have to do dynamic experiments with a heating and cooling stage. Uh, we're also looking into the possibility of purchasing of having like a airtight sample holders, which would allow the, to prepare the sample within like a, a um, controlled environment, like within a glove box, and then we can actually move the samples from the glove box into the diffractometer without the sample having to interact with the surrounding atmosphere. Uh, then uh, we, are we are thinking to get uh, with uh, a scanning electron microscope. We are looking into some option with GEOL at the moment. Uh, likely would be a field emission gun uh, SEM. Um, probably with two, um, the EDX detector. One is a standard det detector and then a, a flat code, which would allow also uh, low um, KV measurements. Uh, then we got suggested if we would be interested of purchasing a soft X-ray detector, which is actually a very new um, detector always developed by Geol, and uh, it's uh, something uh, uh, is not really widely used at the moment. It was mainly um, developed for looking at uh, uh, elements like lithium, so mainly for the like uh, uh, for the um, or for or uh, for like a. Uh, lithium ores and so on. So we're actually, I'm actually trying to understand if it's something that will be worth it, what's the detection limits and so on. So if any of you maybe had the chance to work with something similar or knows anyone, I'm really would be happy to hear some feedback. In case we will not be uh, going for this option, we can always see also depending on the requests of users and so on, like if maybe a CL detector or EBSD detector would be like a, a good alternative to that. And then uh, uh, the other big instrument we're looking at is for an uh, electron microprobe. We are uh, at the moment I'm evaluating between uh, a gel system and a Kameka. Unfortunately, Kameka is not producing a uh, field emission at, uh, um, EPMA anymore. So uh, they will be offering like an LAB6 system. Uh, it's going to be like um, 
uh, equipped with five wavelengths uh, WDS detectors and uh, the range of elements I was looking at is lying between carbon and uranium. And uh, Kamika is also offering the option uh, to have a CL uh, detector attached to the instrument itself. Uh, we have also like, uh, we already have a macro FTR microscope, which is set in the spectroscopy laboratory. So that's already functional. And then we also will be able to, uh, to keep the laboratory with uh, like a, um, optical microscope that would allow high resolution imaging and then some uh, um, like a support equipment, like a, some, a carbon coat, a polish machine for very like last minute uh, uh, sample preparation. And also we have a, lab, a glove box, which would be particularly uh, helpful for dealing with samples that uh, are from sample returns missions. And then uh, this is a, a quick overlook of, uh, overview about the configuration of the laboratory. So there's going to be like a technical room with the more noisy and like uh, the, um, I don't know, air conditioning system and so on. That's then there is uh, um, uh, this area here that is the entrance and is also going to be transformed uh, like in a gray uh, area room. And then there's going to be the main laboratory, which uh, uh, we aim to keep uh, as a, a clean or semi-clean lab uh, and therefore you need to actually get changed to get into it. And uh, we are also looking into different uh, types of like uh, certification and so on. So we are actually in a collaboration with the Museum and After History in Berlin and uh, we are actively working on the selection of the instruments with them, also for the tests. and. Uh, there are already pre-existing uh, collaboration with the Nano FTIR of the Beamline at BESI too, and uh, I hope there will be more chances to, um, yeah, to develop a further collaboration with them, uh, and uh, and also the Helmut Center. It's another um, institution we're working with. So just to look at uh, to put Sal into the context, uh, okay. Uh, of um, of the of like future like sample return mission, yeah, we should be operative at some point in uh, 2022, and then uh, we, yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, start working and even start applying for materials from different sample return missions, and uh, also. As I mentioned, we would like to open uh, the laboratory as a community facility, where actually, uh, such as uh, making it part of Europlanet. We're also, but uh, this is something that we are uh, still thinking, like uh, at also other options apart from Europlanet. So yeah, and uh, in the future, there might be the chance that it can be uh, become a curation facility, and then. Uh, yeah, we would like, it would be nice if at some point, uh, uh, I mean, we, we would like to build a community within uh, like a Berlin or in the science campus. So to become like a, a, a reference point uh, in Germany, but maybe in the future also, some, also across Europe. So if you have any question, I'm really happy to take any. Thank you. Right, thank you. That's really good. Uh, looks like a good range of instruments you got there. Uh, there aren't any questions. Uh, just a reminder: there is time for questions if anyone does want to uh, ask anything. But uh, otherwise, uh, I guess we can move on to the next talk. Hi, Leon. It's John Wroblewski here. Yep. Yeah, coming up next, yeah, so, uh, John Wroblewski from uh, Thalassolania uh, Space UK. And talk is using technology developed for Mars return for other extraterrestrial materials and share the screen is sharing. So go ahead. That'd be good. Okay. Yeah. So if you need to contact me, my email address is there. Um, what I'm presenting today is really um, about 14 years, 13 years of uh, activity uh, in this area um, and gradually incrementally developing. Uh, technology that might be used in in the uh, for for the preparation of materials and and the handling of materials um, uh, for the eventual sample return from Mars. So it's been funded by by, by ESA um, since then, and uh, we slowly developed an analysis that has identified what functionality 
we we initially had a, a list of instruments and, and the list of instruments is still being being discussed and, and then there's the the the, the basic characterization or scientific investigation discussion still going on but i'd like to really um highlight around 2012 um middle of 2012 we did a study called uh lunar asteroid seeding facility laugh um with uh hilda in in um the koenig schrevingen in in in, in isa harwell and it it mapped that little diagram there maps out how a possibility of developing a capability for scientists and engineers um, to deal with extraterrestrial materials and extraterrestrial expl exploration. It then sort of then worked into the analog study and the analog facility that Dale mentioned earlier. Um, the double walled isolator uh, was mentioned before as well, which is at University of Leicester. And we at Tyler's Linear Space mainly focused on the robotics. Um, the two approaches for, for this technology was these were two unique technologies really. Nowhere else had a double walled isolator built for them. The, the, the key thing about double walled isolator is double walled because it has to maintain biocontainment, which is required in planetary protection and cleanliness, which is required for the scientific investigation. And so John Holt and University of Leicester done a brilliant job there. Uh, they built something that's never been built before. They're doing lots of tests in that area. Now, for what we were doing at the um, uh, at Tyler's Linear Space is the robot manipulation. So we took a different approach for the technology development here in that we wouldn't spend money developing the technology. We'd spend money looking to see where other areas of technology were being developed and piggyback those developments and then maybe even direct those developments to coincide requirements from one area of, of robotic development to another. And so we, 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 we've got a breadboard there. We operate it in a unique way, and I'll show a video later of how we, we operate it in, in a very unique way. And we've also got lots of connections with, with, in association with some separate work with Fairspace, where we've tapped into all the AI and robotics developments funded in the UK. So um, I mentioned Fairspace, which is the, the space hub of, of technology from space into wider industry in the UK. Um, earlier on, Jamie was from Orca, which is a, 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 a un underwater hub for robotics and AI. And there's also a, a nuclear hub called RAIN, um, which is, is also based um, uh, quite near to Harwell. But that mainly deals with the nuclear industry in the UK, which is located in northwest of England. So if I go down now, this is the, the fantastic uh, double wood isolator. Um, it, it was built um, by a company on the, on the south coast in, in the UK and using COPS components, using John, John Holt's ideas on how to develop an isolator that would allow uh, high cleanliness, high, high containment um, investigations. And the bottom right hand corner is some of the initial, we call them instruments, but sample preparation techniques that we were looking to see how, whether though operating those sample preparation techniques would disturb the, the operation of the, the isolator. And when I say operation, that's disturbing the pressure regimes either through creating too much heat or creating pressure, creating too much dust blocking filters and all this and, and they were very successful and um, for future developments we're, 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 we're going to start switching uh, any robotics development to be operated in, in that double walled isolator in that very clean environment. So this is our um, haptic uh, remote manipulated breadboard. Haptic meaning that we can as and you've seen later in the video as you hop we, we have oh, one, one step back. We have two modes. We have an automatic mode, which is uh, predefined operational sequences, predefined in, in a special way, and I, I'll come to that later. And we have a free mode where you can operate it using a controller, a haptic controller. So you'll see it in the video. When you pick something up, you can feel the weight of that object. You can feel the collision of that object, uh, and you can feel the resistance force of that object. So that allows you to do some quite um intricate activities although not intricate enough to hand a millimeter sample of 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 regolith from mars but it that the, the objective of the 
the robotics wasn't to try and replace um, humans in terms of those very fine operations, but it was to look to see what the current technology could deliver with a little, few little tricks to link it all together uh, and to enhance, enhance that human capability and remove the mundane tasks. And this current setup is a, a, a nominal operation to you know, pick up a slightly oversized sample tube mock-up, uh, tip out the contents and then do the motions um, to, uh, to sieve the sample through what would have been a 125 million micron sieve, although I, I saw the sieve in uh, Dale's presentation earlier, but because of COVID, we weren't able to, to use that as we needed to. But we did make some very long videos and we got lots of videos because, um, because of COVID, no one, from, no one is allowed to visit our facility to, to witness it. But what we're saying in this um, presentation is that we, 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 we have this capability and this will be delivered to, 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 to Dale and Davida in the curation facility next, next January. Uh, and it's interesting that we have the robotics located in the same room as the geology. And one of the targets, objectives of LARF was to try and have that synergy to develop instead of doing this big bang where you suddenly develop something from our sample receiving, but slowly develop really useful little bits of tools, little bits of hardware, little bits of software that can be used in a geology lab first. And then when, it, when, it, when you apply it to a MAR sample, it's no big deal. But also there are future developments. This, this presentation is from a uh, presentation I made, an update on presentation I made at the um, Lunar, um, uh, Lunar Symposium in, in Manchester last year. And you know, this, this technology could be used for very low temperature operation, for example, which has advantages in lots of different ways. It could be used to allow auto preparation of thin sections in terms of the robot arm wouldn't do it. But one of the, the outcomes we found is that you would, you would want um, a lot of different tools that the robot arm could load in and load out. And one of those tools also Dale showed was a micro gripper, micro manipulation gripper. Uh, and then drain sorting, two minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll go on to the video and play that. So this is a five minute video, so I'll skip. So this is the um, one of the operations taking the key out of the lock. Um, and you can see the haptic operation there and how the key goes in the lock and takes it out. This was the most difficult operation we had, which was an M8 nut on an M8 bolt. Uh, and that was really uh, very well suited to a haptic operation because you really can't see what you can do. This is the really key area where I said you can do easily programming. So instead of um, programming the robot arm to move and having to write all that code, what we were using was a synthetic environment, more accurately a physics model, to define where the robot arm was uh, and then moving that robot arm in, the, in a gaming environment, synthetic environment, and that would generate the commands to command the um, robot arm hardware itself. So that's really useful in terms of if you can develop all the software, even AI operation offline, and then be very confident with the protocols you develop to to interface the ROS commands to the, the equipment that they would work and I'll skip on. Um, and this is the arm in operation. It's moving around, it has picked up a tube. Um, we mounted a GoPro on, on Michael's head and we, we replicated all the operations. What we found with the industrial robot arm was there were limitations in what we wanted from replicating a human arm motion to what the industrial robot arm wanted to do. But we were able to um, find out those and, and that feeds back into future development. Um, so shout when, when you want me to stop, Leon. Um, I'll uh, I'd say this was, all this was done blind. We didn't know how close the arm was apart from in the computer model. And I'll skip into. <clears throat> and this is the final. So you can see how I, I skipped over it, but the, the the brush was able to brush the the 
grains through. What I'll do, I'll post the link to this file on, on the chat or to my email address if anyone wants to contact or look at this. It's a high resolution file, but it's only five minutes long. Okay, thanks so much. That, that, that was really good. Thank you. Uh, we do have one question. Um, did you choose materials for the robotic arm to be curation compliant? Low outgassing, low shedding, uh, or is it a future step? Curation compliant, I don't really understand curation compliant in terms of we chose materials that would be kind of, you know, an analog to a potential Mars material. So it's Watchet Bay mudstone. Yeah. Um, so, but the problem with the Watchet Bay mudstone is that uh, we'd be operating it in a very dry nitrogen environment. So we, we you know, the, 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 the isolator that they got in the University of Leicester is dry, very dry nitrogen environment, very low contamination levels. So it's uh, a bit special there. So, but it was representative materials was the point, um, just to start to pick up some of the problems that we might have handling those materials. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's good to see the uh, double walled isolator from Leicester there. It's, yeah, it's remarkable and, and um, it, it does a, a lot of work, real workhorse. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And next up, we've got uh, Christine Schroeder from University of Stirling. And the talk is investigating return samples with Moss Power Spectroscopy. So if you could share your okay. talk. That's, thank you, Leon. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Good. I'm trying to share my screen here. A little bit quiet on my end. And I hope you can see that. Okay. Can you see that okay? Uh, yep, go ahead. Great. So um, I'm telling you about the benefits of most power spectroscopy and the few um, developments I'm pursuing regarding the investigation of returned samples. And um, first of all, um, a bit about most power spectroscopy. What is it? What does it do? So most power spectroscopy is a gamma ray spectroscopy techniques, technique that probes the hyperfine field interactions between um, the electromagnetic field of a specific nucleus, the electromagnetic field of the electron shell surrounding that nucleus, and the electromagnetic field of the next nearest neighbors in the crystal lattice. On the right hand side, you can see a typical most power spectrum and lines appear there and shift position in response to how these electromagnetic fields change. So go back to the electromagnetic field of a specific nucleus. Um, each MUSBAR experiment or MUSBAR setup looks at one particular isotope. Yeah. On the right hand side, you can see a periodic table and all the colored elements there are ones where most power spectroscopy has been performed on, but the most um, general and uh, most common application is with the element iron, yeah, in particular iron 57 isotope, um, which is good for us as planetary scientists because iron is everywhere um, and it's also a very interesting element because it's redox active and um, plays a role in a number of processes. What can we measure with most power spectroscopy? Well, again, if you think about these electromagnetic fields that interact with each other, so um, we can identify minerals. Yeah? If you think about um, the next nearest neighbors in the crystal lattice and so on, if they move position, and also that affects the electron shell and so on. So that has an effect on the most power spectrum. We can identify minerals in that way. If you would take an electron out of the electron shell, i.e. oxidize iron in most cases, or put an electron back in, that means reduce it again, you see that in the most world spectrum, so you get uh, information on oxidation states. And you can quantify that, so you can quantify the distribution of iron between mineral phases and oxidation states. And in addition, you get a bit of information on structure and electromagnetic properties as well. Um, because we are measuring all this at 
the nucleus. So these interactions happen at the specific nucleus. Um, we don't need long range ordering. So uh, MERS gauss spectroscopy is particularly useful for things that are X-ray amorphous um, and small particles and so on. We can get information on that we can't get easily with other methods. So iron in the solar system, this is my very simple version of um, why this is important. So in the very primitive material represented here on the left by ordinary chondrites, we have both metallic iron or iron zero and iron two plus and silicate sulfide and so on minerals. But as such um, bodies grow and start to differentiate, the iron fractionates, iron metallic iron um, fractionates into the core, iron two plus into the mantle. If you get larger bodies that allow um, volatiles to form within the body or as an atmosphere, yeah, um, water, atm uh, atmospheric gases, then you might oxidize this iron further into its iron three plus stage. And once you put carbon in particular, organic um, carbon into the equation, that can reduce the iron three plus again. If you have biology in place, you start active cycling between these oxidation states. So if you have a few examples of um, places where we will return samples or have returned samples from, so the, on the left you see Asteroid Ryugu, and we've just in the last few days have seen the samples returned by the Hayabusa 2 uh, spacecraft being collected in the Australian outback somewhere. Um, and yeah, the observations at the asteroids have already revealed that these C type or carbon rich asteroids um, are a lot fluffier, less dense. Um, than what is represented by what we think um, are the meteorites stemming from the carbonaceous chondrites we find on Earth. So it already looks like what we have on Earth is only a subsample of denser material. We lose a lot of the other material. But even in these samples, we know that there is interaction between water on these asteroids with the minerals. Yeah? And um, on this diagram on the right hand side, put together by Cameron Floyd in Glasgow, it's investigated how metal grains in these carbonaceous chondrites are affected. Um, but when you look at it um, on Earth, often this is overprinted by terrestrial weathering. And to distinguish that, he's come up with a model there where the iron nickel grains um, on the asteroid would only form magnetite um, as an iron oxide and tocilinite. But on Earth, we can weather that further into other iron oxide phases, such as acarganeite, goethite, and other minerals, and so on. So it would be really interesting to see how the material that comes back actually pans out and what the minerals and oxidation states we find in there are. <clears throat> so even the moon's rusting these days, and yeah, nothing um, pristine anymore. But um, this reflects. Um, two different kinds of space weathering. Yeah. Um, on the left hand side, there's a diagram um, here that um, shows uh, the amount of nanophase metallic iron droplets uh, versus um, the maturity of that soil. So, the, the longer the regolith stays on the surface, basically, the more micrometeorite impacts. It experiences in these micrometeorite impacts lead to reduction of iron, the formation of these nanophase uh, metallic iron droplets. And if you then look at the um, polar regions where we've recently um, produced the evidence that there is indeed water ice and so on, um, this metallic iron can then rust yeah, in connection with this. Um, water that is there and oxygen apparently that stems from earth um, and is funneled there via magnetic fields and so on and we form hematite so iron three plus minerals on the moon which i would have never thought would be possible but returned materials from these regions would be interesting for the volatile content and 
the iron oxidation states and iron mineralogy quantification of that will give you a further insight into the volatile content and the interactions that are happening there. And then, of course, um, the big thing which we've heard a lot about is the mass sample return campaign. Yeah, on the left, you see the perseverance rule where we'll start collecting samples. Um, on the right hand side here is a diagram of mineralogy um, from the Curiosity rover and um, with the X-ray diffractometer on board there. And what is interesting that um, a lot of the material measured is X-ray amorphous, yeah, but it is iron rich. And we should have plenty of kind of nanophase and amorphous reactive, so-called reactive iron phases there, which we know from ours are very good in preserving organic matter. And I've given a whole talk about this uh, at a uh, RIS meeting a few weeks ago um, about this target material. And it would be really interesting to investigate that further and in detail when it comes back. So most power spectroscopy, if you want to apply it to these samples, um, and in general for return samples, you want something that is non-destructive, ideally in the first place. All right, one minute. And um, in this case, um, Mucivar spectroscopy is non destructive that it doesn't consume the sample, but you still would need to destroy the sample. Um, if you look here to let radiation pass through, um, so you need a powder or thin, thin section to let the radiation pass through. But we can circumvent this by using a different geometry where we investigate re-emission in the sample with the detector on the same plane as the source. And we've actually implemented that on the mass exploration rover, so we have already a non-destructive tool for MUSPAR spectroscopy analysis. But this tool is fairly crude in terms of resolution. Yeah? Um, it gives you about 13 millimeter diameter um, field of view. And again, for the analysis of return sample, uh, um, what the real benefit is, is the uh, way you can do microscopic analysis. And these are possible at synchrotron based with synchrotron-based Mussbauer applications. We've done some of these at the ESRF in Grenoble in France already with environmental nanoparticles. We've just submitted an instrument proposal for DAISY for the next um, electron storage ring there, Petra 4, um, for the um, nanoscale resolution that would allow us nanoscale resolution. Just to illustrate that, um, this circle here, A, um, would be the 13 millimeter diameters that we usually have as a footprint. Um, at the SIF, we presented our samples in these capillaries, yeah, which are a lot smaller already. But if you blow that up, and in the center of it, you see the beam size that is currently active. So that's a very, very small area that you actually investigate with this beam. And um, the next generation is even smaller in terms of beam size. So we really go into the nano scale there. So to conclude, yeah, we can determine the iron bearing minerals and oxidation states and the distribution between them, um, even in material that is X-ray amorphous and material that we don't know the oxidation state, we only know that there's iron in there. Um, we have a non-destructive technique already. We have a way of doing micro and nanoscale analysis, but there's some uh, development uh, needed in terms of sample manipulation and adding backscattering geometry to allow the um, microscale, nanoscale analysis in a non-destructive way. That's me. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any uh, questions, but if anyone does have any questions, we've got a whole lunch break to leave questions. Uh, oh, we do have a question, I think. Uh, what is the radiation dosage uh, in What's G G Y? What was that for? Gray, I guess that is. Oh, uh, is it right that <laughs> the samples will see? Um, yeah, good questions. I don't know that. The radiation that we use is um, fourteen kilo electron volt, and that's the energy that we are using for the MUSPAR spectroscopy. Um, but um, I think this is low enough that it would not destroy or whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The
this is why I brought together a crack team of people who know how computers work. Um, That's not okay, the other, the other question then I have is I can't see any of the participants. So if somebody is frantically waving their hands that I should stop, I won't see you. That will be me. Can you not, can okay. you? Or not? Put the view I'm, in the corner, side by side gallery. Is that how you do it? Uh, Don't worry, Ren, I'll just talk at you. <laughs> that also works. Uh, I am I am prepared to deal with that. Okay. Uh, I would have used my Mac, but it crashes whenever I try to share things over Zoom. Okay. Okay. But are you are you good to go? Uh, just a moment, mm -hmm. and I will be. Uh, just setting a timer where I can see it. Uh, so yes, I am good to go. Okay. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're already running slightly late this afternoon, but um, I hope you all had time to grab something to eat. And um, we're going to quickly move on to our next set of uh, flash talks. Um, and so the first of those will be given by Ren Montgomery, um, who is going to tell us a little bit about using uh, nano infrared. Away you go, Ren. You've got three minutes. I'll pop up on your screen after three minutes and tell you to shut up, okay? Great. Uh, so today I'm going to introduce nano infrared and talk about one of my favorite things, which is something I did that didn't work at all and why you should go do it differently and better than I did. So in 2014, everybody was very excited in the infrared world because the diffraction limit, which had previously kept the minimum sample size to about 15 microns on a good day, if you were exaggerating, had been thoroughly broken by doing the clever thing of hooking the infrared beam and laser to an AFM cantilever and using that to probe the sample. And people were reporting 20 nanometers, beautiful spectra. So we said, great, we've got a trial set of samples from a PhD student's work where it's artificially altered organic shales. They're organic rich, they've been characterized with GCMFs, so we know what's in them and they've been SEM, so we know where the organic material is. Let's go to the advanced light source in California and use this technique to see if we can find organic matter in meteorites. So the first thing we did was we went and we measured these altered shales. And these are the spectra we got, they're an aggregate, and they're very, very noisy. <laughs> We pressed on because, hey, we were in California already. Uh, and this is what we got from the meteorite. Now, this is where the problems come in. First of all, we didn't have the SCM image until after we got back, and that had nothing to do with nano-infrared. So this is all of the photographic guidance we had. This is not good enough. This is what you see uh, from the instrument itself. The second problem, which we found out afterwards, is that for this particular meteorite, and I believe this here corresponds to this feature here, uh, but there were a lot of issues with mapping uh, SEM images to the uh, instrument, uh, is that there was nothing that really stood out as organic. So, it was a highly educational sort of disaster. Uh, and the biggest lesson I took home from this is the nanoscale is really big. If every hair on your cat, that's my cat, is a nano sample, a one millimeter square region is equal to 500 cats and you are looking for some portion of an individual cat. Uh, and I know it's been three minutes, so I'm just gonna leave this up. If you wanna try this, if you have a better sample, uh, better sample preparation than I did, uh, Diamond Light Source in the UK not only has a nanospectroscopy line open for users, 
they are bringing in a newer, fancier system next summer. Thank you. Thanks, Ren. That's brilliant. Um, a fancy, I've got nano IR time in January, but now I want to wait for the fancier system. Um, so it's okay, we'll move on. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A and Ren can answer those there. Um, if not, uh, we'll move on to Jordan Young, who's also going to talk about using nano infrared uh, to study carbonaceous um, asteroid materials. Over to you, Jordan. All right, can everyone uh, see this? Uh, or my uh, slideshow? Yeah, we can see right. and hear you. All right, great. Um, thanks, uh, Ren, for that nice overview of uh, Nano FTIR and just some of the limitations and issues with it. Um, I'm just going to talk about some data that I was fortunate enough to collect. Um, and for everyone who doesn't know me, I guess that's everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Jordan Young, and I'm a PhD candidate at Stony Brook University in New York. Um, so just to start off the talk, uh, there's actually a micro FDIR um, spectral image. It's RGB map uh, tied to some spectral indices that you can kind of see on the left. Uh, green is tied to a CO3 stretch, uh, red for the CH stretch, and OH stretch is blue. And what this should show you is that micro FTIR is really great for seeing like large scale, and I use that term uh, uh, sort of relatively, you know, because this is one millimeter scale, but um, it, it's good for seeing large scale chemical variations, uh, but there's a lot of information left on the table as it were um, when you're not looking at smaller scales. And so for this particular talk, I just want you to kind of zoom into this blue circle. Uh, this is a chondral. Um, I should give some context for the sample. This is ALH83100. It's a carbonaceous chondrite, particularly a CM2 chondrite. And it's sort of like a, astro it's, it's thought to be like um, the asteroid Ryugu and Bennu. And so we're going to zoom into this blue chondral, and this is kind of what it actually looks like. Um, on the southern portion of these maps, you'll see the chondral itself, and in the northern portion, you see the, uh, the matrix associated with it. These are nano IR uh, images. The, each image represents an area of 10 by 10 microns with spatial uh, resolution of 20 nanometer pixels. And the interesting thing about each one of these maps is that there's a lot of uh, Intra sample uh, spectral variation, not just within the matrix itself, um, but also between the matrix and the chondro that you would expect. Um, particularly interesting is this uh, bright amplitude area on 9.25 uh, micron region of in the chondro itself, and uh, it's just very interesting. So, in a similar way that you can build those RGB images for micro FTIR, you can also build uh, RGB images for uh, nano FTIR by making a composite image out of the maps I just showed you, which were uh, had various amplitude strengths. Um, you can see the actual spectral variation within this area, and it's really cool. It's just, it's just awesome. And I just wanted to showcase this and just show you how much uh, spectral information really is in there. And, how useful it is. And so this was taken using the NEOSPEC, NEOSNAM, NIR AFM system at the ALS um, in Berkeley, California. Um, again, it's 10 by 10 microns with 20 nanometer pixel resolution. And we collected those individual uh, maps that I just showed you using discrete wavelengths of a tunable laser. And so just the rationale for doing nano FTIR, oh, sorry, non-destructible. You can use any sort of sample and just really good for high resolution chemical information. So thank you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous maps you've got there. Yeah. Um, all right. awesome. uh, so the next flash talk we've got is from Patricia Clay, who's going to be telling us about using noble gas uh, mass spectrometry to investigate halogens in extraterrestrial materials. Where Thanks, you Ashley. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. Can you guys all see that? Yeah, yep, looks good. Okay, I can't see you, so I'm just gonna, use, I'll use a timer, so I, I'm good. All right, um, 
so my name is Trish Clay. I'm a research fellow at the University of Manchester, um, where I am working with uh, these colleagues here on the uh, NINGMS technique for measuring halogens in extraterrestrial materials. So um, why is it useful to have knowledge of halogens in, in extraterrestrial samples? Um, the halogen group elements here, I'm talking about chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, they're highly volatile elements, and they have a, a set of uh, properties that make them um, really good geochemical tracers. But with three minutes, I'm just going to focus in on the fact that they often, um, we often see characteristic uh, halogen ratios for different materials or um, as a result of different processes. So here um, we can see the SNC uh, lunar materials and chondrites in reference to bulk silicate earth in their bromine chlorine composition. So what we can hope to learn is um, something about their um, the primary characteristics of the sample. So um, something along the lines of their initial um, halogen content um, and or some information on the secondary processing. So the role of aqueous alteration, um, thermal metamorphism or the impact history of the sample. So in terms of which samples are suitable for this method, um, we can look at different types of material. So we can use powders, um, grains of individual um, mineral separates or, or samples, uh, or just bulk uh, larger sample chips. We typically look at about one to five milligrams. Um, and at Manchester, we've been characterizing uh, chondritic meteorites, uh, Apollo samples, and also Martian meteorites. And we hope that this should give us some idea of what we might expect in terms of uh, analyses for, um, for looking at return samples. So uh, just a bit about the method. Um, it involves neutron irradiation of the sample. So we take our material, um, whatever it is that we're using, and we wrap that in a foil parcel. These parcels are loaded into a silica tube, which is then encapsulated under vacuum. Um, the tube is then sent off for radiation where the um, neutrons convert our halogens into um, a noble gas product, which we can then easily measure. <clears throat> and so what we end up with is we have a series of reactions that we monitor um, with uh, minerals of known composition. There are monitor minerals in the in the irradiation and that gives us the composition of the sample, the, the chlorine, bromine, iodine, barium, potassium and calcium abundances of, of the sample we're measuring. And just briefly, um, that's my timer, um, this is just a, a setup of the method where the tube comes back, we load it into our laser port, we heat the sample and then the gas is measured and we end up with our halogen abundances. So thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Josh. And the last uh, flash talk that we have in this session is from uh, Julia Magnarini, and she's going to talk to us about 3D analysis of the Apollo 17 core sample um, to learn about uh, light mantle landslide emplacement mechanisms. Over to you. So you're muted. <laughs> right. Sorry about that. No problem. Panicky moment. You now. All right. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Okay. So, um, yes. So this is uh, this project is part of the NASA Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Initiative to examine pristine samples return. Uh, sample, sorry, return during the Apollo program that have been safely stored so to take advantage of futures more advanced technology. And so after almost 50 years in November 19, uh, 2019, the Apollo sample 73002 was finally opened. Um, so this is a, an edited version of the original footage of the sample collection conducted by Gene Cernan in 1972. Okay, the Apollo 17 mission. It, okay. You can just enjoy a few seconds of it, which is cool. Gene Cernan extracting the drive tube. Uh, so sample 73002 is the upper part of the tube 
And the lower part is the sample 73001, which will be open at some point in the future. 524 is what I think is a blue gray rock. Probably the breccia. It's got a little dust covered. Copy that. From just off the rim of this little crater. So we can see the uh, the tube extracted from the ground. A bit closer look now. See that? Roger, we see a long thing in your hand there, Gene. Um, yes, this is the tube, and we can see, can have a quick view of the sample inside the tube. So uh, the dry tube sampled the upper about 70 centimeters of the younger units of the landslide deposit present in Taurus Litro Valley. And so this represents a unique opportunity to study the stratigraphy of an extraterrestrial uh, landslide deposit. And so uh, looking at this comparison of X-ray uh, scan of the sample taken in 1974 uh, below and in 2019 uh, above. Um, so it becomes obvious how current technology has the potential to enable to conduct new science of the Apollo sample. And so the tube has been scanned using X-ray computer tomography at the University of Texas Austin. And we will use the XCT data to describe the 3D characteristic of the upper part of the sample deposit. We will conduct 3D analysis of grain size distribution, sorted, preferred orientation, and we will also look at microstructures of grains and of the deposit, like fractures and shear zones, because these data are able to provide information about uh, the lens light emplacement mechanism. Uh, that's all for me now. We are really looking forward to start working on this data and hopefully next meeting we will be able to show you uh, some of the results. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. There's uh, just very cool data and a, a brilliant example of uh, the kind of things that we can do um, with returned samples um, a long time after, you know, they, they come back, but you can still work on those yeah. 50 years afterwards. So Like a long legacy, much. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Thanks everybody for the flash talks. And I'm gonna hand over to Leon, who's gonna take charge of the afternoon session. Right. Hello again. Yep. Welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, although I believe it might be good morning for some of the speakers in this session. Uh, first up, we've got Rianne Jones, uh, University of Manchester with non-destructive quantitative measurement of olivine compositions in chondritic material from synchrotron X-ray microcomputed tomography. So your screen is sharing, so go ahead. You're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Still not hearing anything. Have you got a uh, microphone plugged in or something? I think I can hear you now. Okay, so does that, is that okay? That's it. Okay, sorry about that. Don't forget to share your screen again. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Right, so um, just to summarise the goal of the work we're presenting here, um, as we've already seen and we, we, many of us are familiar with, tomography is increasingly common for non-destructive investigation of pressure samples. Those might be meteorites, such as the picture on the top right here that's a, a carbonaceous chondrite, or samples that are returned from other bodies like the um, asteroid that's shown in the bottom right. Um, we want to take this a little step further and to try to extract quantitative compositional information from tomographic scans. And the principle of this work is based on densitometry, which is basically using the, the linear relationship between density and composition in olivine to determine compositional information from tomographic scans. And that's based on the principle that the um, density of olivine is a linear has a linear relationship with the iron to magnesium ratio. 
<clears throat> so just to introduce you to the samples I'm going to talk about, they are chondrules that have been extracted from the meteorite NWA8276. This is a highly unequilibrated ordinary chondrite and um, it has very ancient chondrule ages of two million years after CAI formation. And the project is based around, we separated chondrules from this meteorite in order to measure iodine xenon ages of individual chondrules in collaboration with Jamie Gilmore and Sarah Crowther. We separated 16 chondrules by freeze-thaw and gentle disaggregation. And um, for most of those samples, we managed to break them so that we could um, take one split and look at their composition on the SEM. Three of them were too small for that, and those are the three illustrated. So we have examined those with micro um, computed tomography. Um, their diameters are around a millimeter, and their masses are one to three milligrams. So the goal is to determine their petrography in order to interpret the iodine xenon ages. And these samples are now irradiated and they'll soon be destroyed for the xenon isotope measurements. So the, the tomography was conducted at Diamond Light Source on the I-13 beam line. Um, the advantage of doing this work at, um, at Diamond is that we have basically a, a near monochromatic beam, which is essential for the densitometry work. Our scan for this sample um, involved about 10,000 projections around every 180 degrees, and we used a helical scan track. The scan time was less than an hour, and the voxel size um, dimension is 1.125 micrometers. So the samples were mounted. Um, there's a picture of the, the sample setup here. Um, the chondrules and the olivine standard grains were loaded into a conical pipette tip packed with Kim wipe, and then that pipette tip was glued to the sample holder and loaded onto the stage. So here you can see the three chondrules and two olivine grains, which are used as standards for the, um, the, the quantitative calibration. So here's the calibration, some information about it. Here's one of the slices from the scan. Um, we, we had five olivine grains of known composition in the scan. One of them was pure phaolite and the other four were much more forsteritic. So this is a grain that has forsterite 75 and we measured its mean density from this, the scan, its gray level as a value of 185. We did all our image processing using ImageJ on 8-bit data, and um, we knew that the standard compositions very accurately from previous um, microprobe work. So here's our calibration curve, um, which is the 8-bit the gray level versus the um, forsterite content of the olivine grains. And you can see that we have a very nice linear correlation with a, a, a good value of the correlation coefficient. I don't have uncertainties plotted on this graph because that's something we're working on. It's a lot more complicated than we anticipated to, to determine the error on those individual analyses. <clears throat> so the data, um, here are two of the chondrules. Chondrule 14, first of all, is a magnesium rich or type one porphyritic olivine and pyroxene chondrule. Um, here's an example image, a slice from the scan um, one thing you'll notice here, first of all, let me just say that the, it's, the dark grey is olivine and pyroxene grains. There are some visible areas of inter-grain inter, um, mesostasis, in, in which are difficult to see in this image. Maybe here is a good example. Um, one thing you can see from this is we do have a few ring artefacts uh, produced by high density phases. And that's something that we, we had a lot of problems with initially, but the helical scans minimized that significantly. Nevertheless, we haven't completely eliminated it and we're very much aware of these ring artifacts when we're selecting analysis areas. So in this example, the analysis area is um, 1264 voxels. The mean gray, gray level is 52, and that translates to a forsterite composition of 99 mole percent, which um, is very, typical of type 1 chondrules in unequilibrated ordinary chondrites. Chondrule C15 on the right hand side here is what we call a compound chondrule. It has an inner region which is um, made of bars of olivine which are quite iron rich and then an outer region which is much more magnesium rich olivine and also 
um, contains a lot of metal and sulfide grains. So in this example, here are three analysis areas marked and the two from the inner chondral are Fusterite 89 and the um, olivine grain in the outer part of the chondral is Fusterite 98. So you can see that we have, um, excuse me one minute. You can see that we have um, a very good definition of, um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you can see that we have very uh, good definition of the olivine compositions in these two examples. The third chondral um, has a spectacular zoning in it. It's an FEO rich or type two porphyritic olivine chondral. And here's um, what we've done on this is extract a line profile, um, which um, the, the width of the line profile we've determined based on optimizing the, um, the, the fact that we want a uniform um, region that is going to be represented throughout the line width and also um, based on a statistical analysis of the, the number of voxels that we're including in each um, width strip of that line. So this uh, line profile AB is illustrated in the figure here um, and you can see that over the outer part of the grain, um, we've got a region of growth zoning, which goes from Forsterite 78 to Forsterite 88 over 50 micrometers. And, and the same thing in these two areas on either side of this parting in the grain shown there. So um, we can extract very detailed line profiles using this method. And um, just to um, summarize, some of the main points. I just want to set these movies going. Um, we basically are, are very happy that the method is, is successful. We, we feel like we, we are able to perform quantitative extraction of olivine compositions. Um, the line profiles that we can extract are spatially and compositionally sufficiently high resolution to uh, model three-dimensional growth and modeling. There are some disadvantages. For example, we, we need to know whether a grain is olivine or pyroxene, and we have to make that judgment based on understanding the petrology. Um, obviously, the contrast and spatial resolution isn't as good as a backscattered image, but we do have the three dimensions, which compensates for that. And so far, we've only um, done this preliminary work on olivine. Um, and of course, we're only able to look at uh, major element variations in composition. But um, the same data set, of course, can be used for other uh, other interpretations, not just the, um, the densitometry. Um, for example, three-dimensional crystal growth and zoning um, studies, like uh, we can see that the image on the top is showing us the three-dimensional variability in texture. And at the bottom here, um, we are um, looking at variations in porosity and um, metal sulfide distribution throughout these chondrules. So that's um, all I'll say for now. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, Ren would like a, a reminder of the uh, preparation for the, your sample surface. How did you do that? We, uh, did, we didn't prepare the sample surface at all. We just, um, it was just taken from the um, initial disaggregation of the meteorite and it was just um, just picked up and, and put into the, um, the, the tube for the analysis. Okay. And uh, are there any uh, problems with discerning olivine from pyroxene uh, before you were able to calculate olivine composition? Yeah, that's, that's one of the tricky things. We, we have to rely on our knowledge of the typical chondrules and the, the habit of, of grains that are, are very typical of olivine in order to determine that it is olivine. We're actually working on um, advanced methods of identifying olivine versus pyroxene specifically using uh, tomographic diffraction techniques. Um, we're collaborating with Zeiss on that at the moment. So um, that's, that's something that we're investigating to be absolutely sure of the, the phase that we're looking at. Excellent, thank you for that. 
If there's any other questions, please leave them in the Q&A. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Zoe Morland from Open University. <coughs> uh, it's titled, The Importance of Considering Martian Material, Including Biomarkers in MMX Analyses of Phobos Samples. Um, we can see your screen, so uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Uh, right. Hello, my name is Zoe Morland. I'm a PhD student from the Open University, and I'm here to discuss the importance of considering Martian material, including biomarkers, in future Phobos samples. As we heard earlier, JAXA's Martian Moon Exploration Mission is and associated Kinez and DLR rover intends to investigate Phobos remotely and in situ and subsequently return samples to Earth in 2029. However, material from Phobos may not just be representative of Phobos alone. As an airless body, Phobos has been exposed to harsh space weathering throughout its history. And as a part of this, it has been suggested that material ejected from Mars could be deposited onto Phobos. During the Noachian, Mars is thought to have been a more habitable environment for life. Therefore, life may have developed and left behind biomarkers. Locations where these biomarkers were preserved could have been bombarded with impacts that have supplied material to Phobos. Models suggest that depending on the location within the spallation zone, material close to the surface of Mars could be ejected at high velocities whilst experiencing minimal shock conditions. Therefore, it is possible for biomarkers to survive being ejected. Once ejected, the material must travel through the atmosphere, likely experiencing noticeable ablation. However, a considerable number of larger particles survive and expand into a large ejector plume spreading towards the orbit of Phobos. From this single impact event there are multiple opportunities for ejector to impact Phobos from a variety of directions depending on their velocity. Either directly on the Mars facing hemisphere or being swept up by Phobos's leading edge as it orbits through the plume or impacting the non-Mars facing hemisphere if the ejector velocity is lower than Mars's escape velocity of around five kilometers a second. However, the question remains whether biomarkers, even if ejected from Mars successfully, can survive the impact conditions on Phobos. I have addressed this question through a modeling collaboration with Sam Halim from Birkbeck University of London using iSail shock physics code. This can monitor conditions within the projectiles during impact. So this study aimed to estimate the pressure and temperature conditions within Martian-like ejector impacting a Phobos-like surface and, su and suggest whether these conditions are favourable for biomarker survival by comparing them to known survival limits of biomarkers. So the model was set up to investigate a spherical projectile impacting a Phobos-like surface. The model includes traces in each simulation cell, which are massless particles that follow the material as it flows and records information such as pressure and temperature. To make these simulations relevant to Mars ejector impacting Phobos, I personalised the parameters to match the best estimates we have. Two Martian-like projectile materials were considered, basalt, the global composition of Mars and therefore the most likely material to be ejected, or a clay material such as serpentine, which has already been seen to preserve organic material on Mars, however is less prominent on Mars' surface and therefore is less likely co to constitute the Martian ejector impacting Phobos. Beyond this, other parameters such as Phobos's composition are more challenging to define because we haven't been there yet to investigate Phobos. Therefore, preliminary tests were carried out to investigate the influence that varying these uncertain parameters within realistic ranges has on the temperature and pressure conditions within the projectile during impact. Analysis of the results saw a spread in temperature conditions generated within the projectiles. The reason for highlighting temperature specifically here is that shock heating is thought to be the dominant sterilization mechanism during impact rather than pressure. So the lowest and highest temperature scenarios represent the best and worst case conditions for biomarker survival respectively. 
An example of one of these tests was for the Phobos target material. Different combinations of basalt, dry tuff and serpentine were tested in the target regolith and the cohesive interior. This graph shows the volume of projectile along the y-axis that reaches specific temperatures along the x-axis. It shows that different material combinations result in different temperature conditions within the projectile. From flash heating literature, it appears that biomarkers like amino acids and fatty acids are likely to survive up to 500 to 600 degrees C, highlighted here in Kelvin. To the left of this region, biomarkers are likely to remain intact, and to the right, decomposition and racemization is likely to occur. So, dry tough, dry tough in light green is the best case scenario for biomarker survival because it shows the lowest volume reaching the threshold temperature. And basalt serpentine in red is the worst case scenario because it shows the highest volume reaching the threshold temperature. The best and worst case scenarios for each test were carried forward to the final set of simulations, investigating the role of impact velocity on the conditions within the projectile. The impact velocity range was tested at 0.5 to 8.5 kilometers a second, with two kilometers a second intervals, spanning the likely impact velocity on Phobos. Here, I present the serpentine projectile results on a mean peak temperature versus mean peak pressure graph, where each point represents a specific combination of projectile and target parameters impacting at different velocities. The colour scale represents the increase in impact velocity from light green to dark blue. This graph shows that the mean temperatures range from just over 200 degrees Kelvin to over 3100 degrees Kelvin. The best case scenario overall for biomarker survival being the best serpentine projectile impacting the best Phobos target at 0.5 kilometers a second, highlighted by the uh, green circle. And the worst case overall being the worst serpentine projectile impacting the worst Phobos target at 8.5 kilometers a second, shown by the red circle. This also shows that porous serpentine projectiles sit on a higher gradient trend line than the non-porous serpentine projectiles. It's likely that the pore spaces impede shock front velocity and upon collapse generate isolated temperature spikes. Even such that porous projectiles impacting at lower velocities experience higher temperatures than a solid projectile impacting at higher velocities. Comparing this data against the biomarker survivability temperature threshold from earlier shows that only impacts at lower velocities generate mean temperatures at or lower than the threshold. However, looking in detail at the temperature variation across the projectile in these example projectile maps reveals that each set of parameters results in complex peak temperature patterns within the projectile. The left two maps show the best case materials and the right two the worst case materials and within is a comparison between the slow and fast impact velocities. This shows that material parameters are critical for conditions within the projectile to be favourable for biomarker survival, showing that if the material parameters are optimum, then even at higher velocities there are multiple regions that could be favourable for biomarker survival. But even if the parameters are at their worst, then significant areas favourable for biomarker survival can still be found at lower impact velocities. In conclusion, material parameters and impact velocity have been observed to greatly influence temperature conditions within the projectiles. And when both are given realistic values, the majority of Martian-like ejector particles exhibit significant areas favourable for biomarker survival. Future work will look in greater detail at the spatial distribution of peak temperature, compare these to specific biomarkers and validate the results with light gas gun experiments. The results from this study support the feasibility of biomarkers being present in Phobos's regolith and therefore the possibility of being sampled and returned by MMX, especially as these samples will be taken from Phobos's near surface. This makes these samples even more valuable because they could hold material that is significant for unravelling Mars's astrobiological and geological past, 
To reveal this information, analysis of Phobos samples must prioritise the detection of potential biomarkers and the identification of Mars-derived exogenous material among indigenous Phobos materials before the main scientific goals of MMX are addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was really good. Uh, not seeing any questions. If there are any questions, please leave them. We do have time. Um, just a quick question from myself. I can't remember. Does uh, Phobos rotate relative to Mars? You, you say those uh, might, uh, samples might collect on one side of the moon, is that right? Yeah, so it's tidally locked, so it shows the same face to Mars. It always does. Yeah. So yeah, it has a Mars facing side and a non Mars facing side. So would that be the primary location for landing? So, well, the landing, of course, is going to completely depend on where is treacherous and where is not. And when you've got such a small area, it's going to be difficult. And there are large, uh, big blocks on the surface as well. So they're going to have to um, avoid those. And they may want to uh, go near Stickney, which is the main impact crater on Phobos. And there's thought to be a, a difference in material that's on the surface. They could be composed of two different things. So they may try to go around that area. Um, but... Uh, and that area, I believe, oh, I don't actually know whether that's on the Mars facing side or is not, but the Mars facing side only gets ejecta, which is um, ejected straight from uh, Mars. But actually, it, the most of the ejecta that will fall onto Phobos is actually when the material is returning back to Mars, if it isn't escaping Mars. So that's actually the, um, the best place for that to be. So that's going to be on the leading edge and on the uh, anti-Mars side. That's really good. Thank you. Uh, there aren't any more questions at the moment. Hey, brilliant. Um, so, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next talk. So, Laura Breitenfeld from Stony Brook University. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, you're still sharing your screen. Um, uh, it actually it says that I can't share my screen. Yeah, Zoe, unshare. <laughs> So the title is uh, Evaluating the Mineralogy of Returned Samples from Benio and Mugu uh, Using Machine Learning Multivariate Infrared Spectral Analysis. And your shared screen has just come up and is in okay. slideshow mode. So go ahead. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. My name is Laura Breitenfeld, and I'm at Stony Brook University. And as was said, I will be talking to you about evaluating the mineralogy of return samples from Bennu and Ryugu using machine learning multivariate infrared spectral analysis. So the targets um, of these return samples are the asteroids Bennu and Ryugu um, that were examined by the OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa-2 spacecrafts. The Ryugu sample has recently been returned to Earth, and we are still waiting on the return sample from Bennu. The model that I will be presenting to you today that I have constructed aims to be able to unmix the motorology, modal mineralogy of these two asteroids um, with a returned sample in the future. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bennu and Ryugu. They are B and CB type asteroids, which correspond to carbonaceous chondritic material. And this material records the early solar system processes like aqueous alteration. They have few or no chondrules and have primitive chemical compositions. So the motivation of this work is to quantify the mineralogy of the return sample non-destructively it is also to relate the mineralogy of the return sample to the remote sensing data from these two missions. So the way in which we can do this is through the construction of an integrated fine and coarse particulate machine learning mid-infrared model for modal mineralogy predictions. So what does this mean? And let's break it down a little bit. So mid-infrared, um, so this is between 2,000 and 200 wave numbers. This region is used for understanding the mineralogy 
And again, it can relate to the remote sensing data from the missions. Coarse and fine particulates. In the mid-infrared, both coarse and fine particulates behave slightly differently. So coarse materials mix linearly in the mid-infrared, whereas fine particulates mix non-linearly. And so both fine and coarse particulates must be considered to be able to unmix the mineralogy. And we need a me methodology that can do linear and nonlinear unmixing. And so we've chosen machine learning multivariate analysis because this methodology does not assume linear mixing across wavelengths. So this project relies on a large sample suite and training set. I will be speaking about this sample suite. So the mineralogy of the sample suite includes antigorite, cronstite, saponite, magnetite, pyrotite, enstatite, olivine, calcite, dolmite, gypsum, and ferrohydrite. And these minerals were chosen because they are common in CI and CM chondrites, the materials that these asteroids might be made up of. Additionally, we considered both fine and coarse particulates. So when I'm refined to fine particulates, that's under 50 microns, and coarse particulates is greater than 125 microns. So this sample suite is um, broken down into mineral mixtures. The 13 end members that I just listed, these mineral species, are present in the model as fine and coarse particulates. And then we have 102 fine mineral mixtures composed of these 13 end members. And here you can see the distribution of the mineral species within the data set. So these mineral mixtures include simpler mixtures like binary mixtures, as well as more complex mixtures that can act as very good analogs for um, CI and CM chondrites. Additionally, we created 102 synthetic mixtures from linear combinations of coarse end members. And these mirror the fine mineral mixtures. And lastly, to relate the mixtures of fine mixtures and coarse mixtures, we created 52 mixtures that combine both fine and coarse material together. So this is the sample suite that corresponds with the training set of 282 spectra. So instrumentation, how do we collect these spectra? Here you're looking at a picture of Parsec, which is the Planetary Asteroid Regolith Spectroscopy Environmental Chamber at Stony Brook University. It's coupled with an FTIR spectrometer for mid-infrared emission measurements. And so samples are placed within the sample wheel. Then the chamber is closed and with the pump, it is pumped down to 10 to the negative four millibars. And finally, through the doer with liquid nitrogen, the chamber is cooled to less than negative 125 degrees Celsius. And finally, the samples are heated to 80 degrees Celsius from both from, from below through a heating source and from from above from an external light. And this creates a thermal gradient. So all of these temperature conditions together allow us to create a simulated asteroid environment for our mid-infrared measurements. This is a spectral training set that I have collected over the last two years. So this is the 282 spectra that inform the machine learning model. So I want to talk a little bit more about fine and coarse particulates in the mid-infrared. I spoke about how fine materials mix non-linearly, whereas, whereas coarse materials mix linearly in the mid-infrared. You can also see here, um, these are some spectra of saponite. The yellow spectrum, fine saponite, has a unique spectrum compared to the coarse saponite. 
And so both these end members have to be considered within the model. So the reason that fine materials in the mid infrared mix nonlinearly is because of the small grains that allow multiple scattering effects. So let's talk a little bit more about how we do this spectral unmixing. Traditional linearly square models do not consistently provide accurate quantitative assessments of mineralogy for fine particulates in the mid infrared. And therefore, multivariate analysis is an alternative approach that removes the assumption of linear mixing across all wavelengths. Partial least squares, which is a type of machine learning multivariate analysis, is commonly used for mineral and chemical abundance predictions. So I've created a preliminary model um, that I'm still refining. And so I'm gonna present to you the prediction accuracy that I've been able to achieve thus far. And hopefully over the next few weeks, as I continue to refine that, I will be able to improve that accuracy. So the internal root mean square error of the model that I've created um, ranges between two and seven volume percent, depending on the mineral species. The leave one out root mean square error, which is a error metric for um, data that is not within the model, unseen data is roughly 10 volume percent. And the prediction accuracy of meteorites Murchison and Asebi were able to be um, accurate to less than 15 volume percent compared to quantitative XRD data. So now to summarize, with a portion of one of these return samples of Bennu or Rayugu, roughly 500 milligrams, we would be able to achieve the two following things. One, modal mineralogy could be estimated through the simulated asteroid environment mid-infrared partial least squares model. And two, the mid-infrared spectra of the return sample would provide a laboratory ground truth measurement and could help refine the interpretation of the remote sensing data. That's what I have to present for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's really good. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any questions, I don't think. Uh, Zoe, if you're still there, there is a question for you. Uh, Leon? Hey, I can, I can, I'm going to cheat and use my video uh, to ask a question <laughs> rather than typing it in the box. Uh, really nice talk, Laura. So I wanted to, so when you were talking about matching to uh, Murchison and Essebi, so uh, I'm not quite, I, don't, I guess I don't quite understand exactly what you, how you're, so I know the, 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 the mineral data exists for that. Um, but are you using spectra that have been collected off of, off of Murchison, for example, and then matching that to your model? Yeah, so we um, collected a mid-infrared spectra under these same conditions for both Murchison and Asebi, and they were fine grain powders. Okay. So um, this is kind of the first ability to be able to quantify the fine mineralogy. Um, so the fact that we were able to get within that range that is also um, been estimated for coarser materials is really encouraging. Yeah, I'm guessing they weren't this exact, were they exactly the same samples that Howard Hetel ran or not? Or Yeah, um, so the Asebi was the exact same sample. Um, the Murchison was a different aliquot, um, but based, uh, we are actually working with Howard. So we think yeah. that the um, it will be fairly equivalent because once you crush down the sample and you average that um, aliquot, it comes out to be very equivalent. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. We do have a, a last minute question. Uh, how long does it take for 200, uh, 282 samples? It takes a really long time. It takes about three days to run <laughs> six samples. So I'll let you do the math, but I have been collecting a lot of data. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, is there anything else? No. So uh, move on to the next talk. Is that, is that, yep, we've got um, Mitra Rose, uh, Arizona State University. Um, uh, oh, hey, you're there. Uh, Characterising organic and mineral components in asteroidal particles to constrain planet formation models. Uh, your screen is sharing and 
not in slideshow mode. There we go. Go ahead. Excellent. Thank you, Leon. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, and thanks to all the organizers, Ashley, Natasha, Almeida, Luke, Leon, Natasha, Stephen, Romain, and Penny for arranging this virtual meeting. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to talk about my work. Um, so for my talk today, I decided to concentrate on the study of minerals uh, from asteroid surfaces, specifically looking at asteroid Itokawa, uh, and kind of discuss what, uh, what these measurements can tell us about planet formation. So in my lab at Arizona State University, we study um, the first two aspects of planetary habitability um, and ask the following questions. I mean, do asteroids contain water? Um, how much water? Um, and is it adequate for chemical reactions to occur and produce biocritical molecules? Um, and so to answer the first question about the availability of water, I decided to investigate particles from asteroid Itokawa in 2017. Um, as we all know, samples from this asteroid were collected in 2005 uh, from the Moses Sea area um, during these two touchdowns. And then samples were brought back in 2011, uh, 2010, sorry. <laughs> um, and we received these two particles as shown here um, the, from the JAXA uh, curatorial facility uh, after a successful proposal. Uh, the one on the left was a single particle of low calcium pyroxene, while the other on the right is a multimineralic particle of low calcium pyroxene, as well as troilite, taenite, and plagioclase. Uh, this yellow square that's drawn on them are the areas that were measured uh, for uh, water contents and hydrogen isotopes uh, using the nanosims uh, 50L at Arizona State University. Now, the reason we chose to study these two particles was because their oxygen isotopic compositions had been uh, measured uh, by the Wisconsin group. And those compositions indicated that they indeed belonged to the LLL group of ordinary chondrites. Uh, and so they were really extraterrestrial in origin and came from the surface of this asteroid. Um, my postdoc and I measured the hydrogen isotopes and water contents in these particles. And I'm showing you the results here uh, with the, the y-axis showing the delta D values, which is essentially the ratio of D over H measured in the particles normalized to standard mean ocean water. On the x-axis, I have the water content in parts per million. And these Itokawa particles have a delta D value of about minus 100 per mil, which is within this blue band for bulk silicate earth. Uh, these particles contain between 600 to 900 ppm of water, uh, which was a bit of a surprise for us. Um, but given the really low detection limits that we were get, able to get with our nanosomes of less than 20 ppm, we trust these numbers. Um, so based on um, numerous lab measurements, and so this is you know, the entire research community around the world doing these kinds of measurements, we have been able to understand the Itokawa's evolutionary history pretty well we know that it was originally a greater than 20 kilometer sized body that, that went through a period of intense thermal metamorphism where the bulk of the material of the body was exposed to 600 to 800 degree temperatures. Um, it went through then a catastrophic impact that broke it up into boulders, followed by a very quick re accretion of these materials. Um, the rubble pile uh, that we visited was, of course, it, it, still, it still continued to be processed uh, through the solar wind and galactic cosmic ray radiation, as well as micrometeorite impacts. And so we had to study each of these processes uh, and how they would affect or change the hydrogen isotopes or the water contents um, in the particles that we had measured. Uh, and so we took into account hydrogen production by spillation, uh, and as well as loss of water through th during thermal metamorphism or impacts uh, using a thermal diffusion model. And um, assuming the, that Itokawa, we, we, we knew the proportion of particles uh, that Itokawa, uh, th that we had in our collection, 
and uh, the known water contents from meteorite literature, we were able to calculate that the Tokawa parent body uh, contained uh, less than 0.1 weight percent water. So there's a range, um, but that's the upper limit. Um, now to compare to uh, Itokawa samples, uh, we looked at meteorites. So we studied four ordinary chondrite Antarctic finds. Those are shown on the left. Um, and two ordinary chondrite falls. Um, so a lot of you have heard about the Chelyabinsk fall in 2013 and have seen videos of it. Um, but there was also another fall in 2018, Beninitra, uh, and both these samples um, we were able to get hold of and prepare thick sections of uh, and study uh, hydrogen isotopes and water contents in. So what did we find with the study of these meteorites? Well, what we found is shown here, um, the ordinary chondrite finds, Antarctic finds, show delta D values that again, mimic the bulk silicate earth. So they really fall within that blue band, as you can see here. Uh, the water contents, however, are much higher. The ordinary chondrite falls look interesting that they, they have, comp there are some measurements that look like um, they are very similar to the Itokawa measurements, but there are also measurements that go down in delta D, so D depleted to as low as minus 400 per mil. So um, we were initially wondering if there's this delta D depleted signatures are a result of a different process, like if you degas a sample or uh, where you lose hydrogen or H2, but those trends are not really observed uh, in our data. And so these very delta D depleted signatures that we're seeing uh, is obviously a nebular signature. And, and we have a model now that can explain how you can get very delta D depleted signatures um, in these early formed uh, chondrites. Um, there was another implication of the studies on these meteorites um, where we applied the thermal diffusion model that we had created to look at Itokawa on the ordinary chondrite parent bodies. So for, um, for those of you who, who don't know this, but ordinary chondrite bodies are thought to have this onion-like layered structure that's shown on the left. Uh, the type three materials have experienced the lowest temperatures, whereas the type six has experienced the highest temperatures um, and the longest duration of uh, thermal metamorphism. Um, so what we did was we simulated these conditions and tried to see what fraction of the residual water is lost from these different materials uh, as, as a result of thermal metamorphism. And what we see is that even in the type six materials, which is heated up to 1273 Kelvin in this case uh, for 75 million years, um, the residual, the fraction of residual water is more than 99.5 percent, and and this loss of 0.5 percent water would cause a less than one per mil fractionation in the isotopes. So this was a very important finding uh, that we we are uh, currently writing up, which talks about how ordinary chondrites they formed within you know, 2.5 2 to 2.5 million years after CEIs and went through a period of thermal metamorphism for about 10 million years, but the bulk water from these bodies have not been lost. Um, so these observations um, we think is really critical when we start to think about planet formation models. So in terms of planet formation models, currently there's a debate in our community um, about which uh, is the preferred model by which planets form. Uh, the first of course is the planetesimal accretion uh, model which involves just clumping of um, small particles initially to millimeter to centimeter scale dust, uh, followed by formation of planetesimals or asteroids um, in the 100, to 100 meter to 100 kilometer range. And then collisions uh, would result in the formation of planetary embryos and uh, finally planets. Now, depending upon where the clumps are developing, uh, the planetesimals would be water rich or water poor. And so if you have these clumps, these planetesimals uh, evolving very close to the snow line, you could have really water-rich planets with about 50% water fraction in them. Um, 
The other planet formation model is, is the uh, pebble accretion model that has gained, um, uh, is, has become pretty famous, um, is, was used to explain the rapid, rapid formation of Jupiter. Um, and it has been shown by several uh, authors now uh, to be successful in doing so. Now, the reason it's really successful is because beyond the snow line, you could easily form a, a very high abundance of ice rich pebbles which rapidly accrete onto a planetary embryo. Now, in order to form a planet in the inner solar system with this pebble accretion model, you would require these pebbles to be accreted onto an embryo that is in the inner solar system. And, um, you know, because these planetary embryos are large, you could assume that these embryos have an atmosphere of its own. Um, now, the two, the two processes uh, that that can change or alter the amount of water these pebbles contain um, are firstly, when these pebbles cross the snow line, they would start to lose a lot of water. So, you know, you have the water from the ice phase go going to the vapor phase. Uh, but the second uh, time that it these pebbles would lose water is when you, uh, when they end, when they're accreted onto the planetary embryo, the, the water in these pebbles get ablated away in the atmosphere of this growing embryo. So as a result, the planets that are forming in the inner solar system by pebble accretion would in general be water poor. Um, and so this particular model is described in this particular paper, Coleman et al. There are actually several papers on this. And it was mainly to understand the seven planet trapeze system. Uh, but because that system has Earth-sized planets, it is kind of relevant for how we understand, how we think of water. Uh, so in our, in, in general, um, we can produce a very water rich um, planet with planetesimal accretion up to 50%, um, whereas you would have, um, you know, 10%, uh, this is a median number that I use, uh, that is created by pebble accretion. So assuming that Earth did form by planetesimal accretion, um, you can uh, take varying proportions of different chondrites, um, and so for this purpose, we use the Dauphin model uh, that has Earth growing in three different stages and uh, allows a 40% contribution of ordinary chondrites. Um, and so using those numbers, we inferred that at least half of Earth's oceans uh, can be provided by ordinary chondrite-like bodies. So this was really interesting um, um, result that we published last year, but even more interesting uh, when you think of where these planets are forming, in which region in the inner solar system. So the contribution of ordinary chondrites to Earth is less compared to what it would contribute to Mars. So here is a very, very recent result from this Ma and Brazer paper that talks about H chondrites providing 80% of the material to the formation of Mars. Um, so I'm going to stop there with my conclusion slide. Uh, and let you read it and take questions. Yeah, thank you for that, Maitri. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment and we are kind of running a little bit late. Uh, I don't have any of my own. Um, but if you do have anyone has any questions, please leave them in the Q&A. With that, uh, I think we'll move on to the next talk, shall we? It's, uh, we've got Ross Finley from Open University. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep, and your presentation is already up, so uh, Excellent. take it away. Well, hi, I'm Ross. I'm a PhD student like Zoe at the Open University and welcome to my crash talk in oxygen isotopes. So uh, let's get on with it. Um, oxygen is essentially, it's a, a, it's the, uh, it occurs as three stable isotopes that exist in solid, liquid, and gas phases. Uh, this makes them super powerful uh, traces for processes occurring in the early solar system as they can uh, fractionate from one another under different conditions. Uh, it will therefore offer one of the prime and most important techniques for the characterization of materials brought back from asteroids or planetary bodies. And it's expressed as uh, this uh, typical delta notation, which is simply, in, in layman's terms, the, uh, the variation in 17 and 18O in parts per thousand. So when a, uh, a planetary body actually uh, homogenizes, it will end up with a whole suite of material that lies on a single mass fractionation line of slope 0.52. 
the position of this mass fractionation line in a three isotope space is determined by its starting materials. Uh, so you can have many lines spread over this three isotope plot and they can actually occur on all scales uh, for all differentiated bodies, but also the very small, such as a chondral to the a whole massive planet. Um, on the other side of things, you have uh, mass independent fractionation, which is causes slopes that are more or less than uh, 0.52 as a result of the interaction of different reservoirs in the solar system, the composition of which is determined by processes that are not necessarily dictated by mass, such as photo dissociation of carbon monoxide, for example, or nucleosynthetic effects inherited um, and ultimately these produce these these mixing lines um, which could be something as simple as heavy water interacting with uh, with isotopically light rocks in the in the solar system um, herein is a graph that demonstrates the wide uh, the wide range of oxygen isotopic measurements obtained for different meteorites I want you to note the scale here, which spans roughly 20 per mil in day delta 18 uh, Some meteorites indeed plot along mass dependent lines, uh, which are mostly covered by differentiated bodies. Uh, other uh, mixing lines uh, mainly covered by primitive bodies, which uh, cover quite a large range. Uh, this highlights the great diversity of potential parent bodies in the, uh, in the meteorite record. So here at the OU, we actually measure these ratios uh, via a special process called laser-assisted fluorination. Um, a sample is essentially loaded into a, into a nickel tray, which is reacted with a laser in the presence of a highly oxidizing agent called uh, bromine pentafluoride. It's very reactive. It liberates the oxygen from the sample, which is then purified along a series of liquid nitrogen gas traps, then fed into a mass spectrometer. Uh, this is a nice little picture of a sample reacting a little blob of, uh, of magma. So for optimal performance of our uh, instrument, we require one to two milligrams of, uh, of silicate material, which is, results in excellent reproducibility. Um, most notable is this bottom value, um, the capital Delta 17O, which is the oxygen 17 excess from the terrestrial fractionation line. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful value, uh, as shown by this figure on the right, where we can actually measure very small in parts per million, but statistically resolvable differences in oxygen isotopic composition between the moon and the earth, which traditionally were thought to sample the same reservoir. Um, such precision actually allows us to unravel planetary provenance uh, quite effectively. For smaller samples, uh, we can utilize an additional cryofocusing technique, which uh, allows us to achieve a, a good precision on samples weighing between 0.1 and 0.25 milligrams. This is shown quite nicely by the orange circles on the right, showing little spread in Delta 18 over such a small range of small samples. Uh, this has permitted the analysis of very small materials such as uh, micrometeorites and will be particularly applicable to precious sample return material for which we need to be careful and conservative. We can actually measure a range of, of samples, anhydrous material being the best, um, but uh, hydrated samples are actually a bit more difficult. They involve a lot of complexity uh, to achieve an accurate and precise analysis. And this is because the, uh, the hydrated minerals inside these samples, the phyllosilicates, actually pre-react with our, um, with our uh, oxidizing agent, our, our reagent. And, um, at room temperature, which emits the possibility of actually putting multiple samples in the same tray. Uh, this is displayed quite well on this plot at the bottom here, where the uh, the blue square here indicates the, the desired composition, the, the real composition, well, real, uh, it, as, well, as, well, as well as we can do. And um, the gray and red squares uh, display continuous removal of a, of a, of a um, an isotopically heavy component with each successive analysis. Uh, these materials, therefore, must absolutely be analyzed uh, as a single shot method, including CM, CR, CI meteorites, but also carbonaceous material uh, when it's brought back uh, in this special tray with a nice little window on top to prevent uh, the, uh, the sample from spilling out. So onto the nitty gritty, uh, what kind of problems can oxygen isotopes actually solve for us? Well, the, the ultimate objective here is to take our large collection of isotopic and geological chemical data for, uh, for meteorites and actually relate that to sample return. Uh, missions give us the, the luxury of context and uh, oxygen isotopes, uh, the opportunity to truly understand and interlink both of these data sets. Uh, oxygen isotopic variations are closely linked to petrographic differences and degrees of modification. Uh, they're 
are also linked to other isotopic systems, one of the most famous of which is the chromium isotopic system, shown by the graph on the right, which actually documents a real distinct difference between inner and outer solar system material. Where returned material will plot here, depend, doesn't matter which body it is, uh, will determine or give us insights into where it may have formed in the early solar system, which is uh, no small feat. And of course, uh, Phobos is all the rage and it's very fashionable at the moment and for good reason. So is it an asteroid or is it from Mars? Um, as you can see by this graph, we can resolve the Martian fractionation line very easily in meteorites. Uh, this is a capital Delta 17O plot where the terrestrial fractionation line has been rotated to horizontal and plotted at zero. Um, if Phobos was indeed formed by a giant impact, um, its oxygen isotopic composition may reflect that of Mars. Uh, and it will plot quite close to the MFL. Or alternatively, if uh, it's a captured asteroid and uh, this hypothesis prevails, it would actually, uh, it, we predict it would probably plot quite far from the MFL. And in this scenario, we would also be able to distinguish a uh, Martian crustal ejector quite easily from a returned regolith sample. Not so much if uh, Phobos was made from Martian material, because it'd be difficult to tell what's come from Mars and what Phobos is kind of, you know, the, the ages of both, but yeah. Um, in a similar vein, so asteroid Bennu is uh, predominantly composed of these low albedo boulders that spectrally resemble these, uh, these chondrites called CM1 or CM2 chondrites. Uh, this is a backscatter image of a large CM chondrite. Um, and this is really interesting because CMs are complex, broken rocks composed of a variety of different rock types. Uh, um, as classes that display different degrees of modification in interaction with water. Uh, this suggests that Bennu itself may have been uh, aqueously altered and or thermally stratified with a variety of rock types, which, if likely present in a sample return, will require very careful subsampling so we get so we know what we're looking at. Um, the CM chondrites themselves actually plot along a rather large mixing array. Um, uh, uh, which may uh, actually uh, represent increasing alteration of uh, an isotopically light precursor with an isotopically uh, heavy precursor uh, precursor material. But interesting, uh, uh, sorry, like isotopically light precursor with an isotopically heavy fluid. So uh, what's interesting though is that both of these meteorite groups actually uh, plot along and define different slopes, which is uh, undoubtedly due to this aforementioned complex variation. Uh, but it could also be due to the fact that meteorites are often found in deserts and could be as a result of modification in the terrestrial environment, um, that is hot deserts and cold. Uh, or alternatively, these meteorites are derived from a body that is uh, yeah, multiple bodies or one complex body with open system behavior. Uh, you know, this is a yet another example of how relating this sample return and very pristine regolith can aid us in resolving least altered material from, from most altered. In addition to this low albedo material, there is this high albedo material. Um, there is also a number of boulders that, you know, that, are, that exhibit this spectral high albedo uh, features. Um, uh, they bear spectral similarity to the asteroid 4 Vesta, uh, which if, if this is actually correct, um, would be impact derived. And there are quite a few potential evolved parent bodies, as once again shown by using this graph and utilizing our high precision measurements, so uh, oxygen isotope analysis of return material, if it contains this material, would be able to confirm if it actually does indeed plot on the 4 Vestan fractionation line, which is easily resolved from the uh, from the TFL as shown by this uh, this red box on yet again another capital delta 18 you know, graph where is it the horizontal. This perhaps highlights the importance of retaining geological context and so uh, if we have high albedo material and low albedo material in a return sample we have to make sure we are sampling the right stuff and not homogenizing material like has been done uh, quite a lot in the past. Um, I'm kind of experimenting with this technique uh, by looking at CM1 and CM2 chondrites. This is uh, this Colang, an aqueously altered uh, fall that fell a few months ago. And as you can see, there's a distinct, two distinct classes here that show differing degrees of aqueous alteration. And my, uh, my work here at the OU is actually to, to characterize these samples and drill out small pieces of material to be ran for high precision on our laser fluorination line. 
So concluding statements from this, uh, so the return geological material um, will provide context from a small area, but the material will be precious. We have to be very careful with how we use it. And actually uh, comparing these, uh, these samples to the meteorite record uh, allows us to build a big picture, including where the planetary bodies are actually sampled in our meteorite collections, but also what are these weird rock types we're seeing spectrally. And here at the OU, we have the capability to, to measure the composition using very small amounts of powder to excellent precision. Um, and we are, I, I am currently applying with my supervisors uh, this technique to provide a better framework for return samples from primitive bodies such as, yeah, Benny Rigu and comets, if we're lucky. And, and this combined with the uh, coordinator studies, including in situ work like nanosims and base relations and stuff like that, will, uh, will obviously help us build a big picture of the evolution of these bodies in the early solar system. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that. We do have a question uh, just come in. Uh, how sensitive are these isotope metrics to space weathering, such as impact or radiation? Um, oxygen isotopes. Oh, that's a good point. Um, I, I, truthfully, I don't actually know. Uh, I, I anticipate that. Um, I don't think there would be too much uh, uh, variation in the oxygen isotope ratio due to space weathering, but I don't know the intricacies of uh, whether or not you get some sort of, um, yes, uh, kind of modification of the ratio. Um, I believe they're fairly robust, you know, that they're, they're vulnerable to aqueous processes, but we'll, we'll see when we get them back, hopefully. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I can see uh, Michelle's already got her talk up. Uh, so we've got uh, Michelle Thompson, Purdue University. Uh, understanding the space weathering of return samples through coordinated analysis. Yeah, thank you. That question was a perfect lead in to my talk. Yeah. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about some of the work my group has been doing to simulate space weathering processes in the laboratory. And today I'll focus specifically on some of the carbonaceous material we've been working with to prepare for sample return from Hayabusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx. So first, I will remind everyone what I mean by space weathering. So space weathering is a process that occurs on the surfaces of airless bodies, and it changes the morphology, the mineralogy, and the microstructure of su surface material because of their exposure to interplanetary space. And these changes affect the optical properties of the surfaces that we observe with remote sensing spacecraft. Space weathering is driven by two primary processes. The first are micrometeorite impacts, which promote melting and vaporization processes and recondensation on the surface. And the second is the interaction of surface materials with uh, energetic particles from the solar wind. And those radiation processes cause amorphization or breakdown of the crystal structure in surface materials, as well as sputtering and redeposition of atoms and elements on the surface. And both of these constituent processes contribute to the formation of iron-bearing nanoparticles. And those nanoparticles are the main drivers behind the changes in spectral properties that we can observe with spacecraft. On the moon and S-type asteroids, those spectral changes are primarily darkening of the spectrum, reddening, and attenuation of characteristic absorption bands. And the moon and uh, near-Earth asteroid Itakawa, those samples really have formed the basis for our understanding of space weathering, but we're still trying to build an understanding of how this process affects hydrated organic rich materials like we expect at asteroids Bennu and Ryugu. Understanding the effect of space weathering on these types of components is obviously important for OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa 2, but as we get a window into how more complex mineralogies uh, are affected by these responses, we can expand our understanding of space weathering across the solar system. In advance of sample return or analysis, we can actually simulate space weathering processes in the laboratory. And so I'm gonna be talking about those um, experiments today. The first technique we use to simulate space weathering is pulse laser radiation. That simulates the short duration, high temperature effects associated with the micrometeorite impact. So for these experiments, we use dry cut chips of the CM2 Murchison meteorite. We chose Murchison because it's considered a spectral analog for asteroids Bennu and Ryugu and because we have a lot of material, so we can afford to alter some of it in the laboratory. So we subjected our rough cut chips to uh, pulse laser radiation under high vacuum. You can see the two chips on the right side of the slide here. And we laser radiated an area about seven by seven millimeters square. You should be able to see the dark squares on each of those chips. And the footprint of the actual laser is much smaller than that whole surface area. So to kind of give an even distribution of the irradiation, we raster the laser over the surface. 
And we have multiple samples, so we were able to expose each sample to varying degrees of laser radiation. So one example, we rastered the laser once over the surface, and in this other image, we rastered the laser five times. For simulating the other major constituent space weathering process, which is solar wind irradiation, we can perform ion irradiation, and these experiments were done at the University of Virginia. Again, we take a dry cut chip of Murchison meteorite, and one side of the chip we irradiated with 1 kV hydrogen, and the other side we irradiated with 4 kV helium. And these are the two major constituent ions for the solar wind. We simulated a total exposure time scale somewhere in the ballpark of about 10,000 years on the surface of an airless body. And this work is uh, still underway and it's being led mostly by my graduate student, Dara Lasniak. So I encourage you to look for her paper that's coming out hopefully early in the new year. So after we do these experiments to simulate space weathering, we can perform a set of coordinated analyses to understand changes in microstructure and chemistry, not only for the inorganic components, but also for the organic parts of our sample. Then we can also uh, look at their optical properties. So we start with visible near-infrared spectroscopy, then perform a two-step laser desorption mass spectrometry, which gives us an understanding of organic functional group chemistry and concentration in the samples. Then we examine their microstructure and chemistry uh, using the transmission electron microscope. And finally, we try to link the features we see in the microstructure and chemistry to the optical properties that we observe through spectral modeling. Then we can compare those models to remote sensing data sets. So we get a full and complete um, picture of the data for these samples. So I'll discuss each of those data sets. First, I'll talk about our reflectance measurements that we perform for both the laser and the ion irradiated samples. So this plot is continuum reflectance versus wavelength. And the spectrum of the raw unirradiated Murchison sample is in the black line. We have the hydrogen irradiated sample in red, helium irradiated in blue, the one-time laser in purple, and the five-time laser irradiated in green. And there's two trends that I want you to notice. The first one is that both of the lasered samples are darker than the raw surface, meaning they have a lower reflectance. And we see that they actually have a mild bluing, which means decreasing reflectance with increasing wavelength. And this is not typical of what we expect for space weathering in lunar or ordinary chondritic samples. So this is interesting. In contrast to the laser irradiated samples, for the hydrogen and helium irradiated samples, we see that they're brighter than the raw unirradiated surface. In particular, the helium is brighter. Um, the hydrogen is fairly indistinguish indistinguishable from the raw surface. We also see a mild reddening trend of the helium irradiated uh, sample, particularly you know, at wavelengths longer than 0.85 microns. So this suggests that not only are we seeing some unexpected bluing for the lasered samples, but that there may be this competing spectral effect uh, between different space weathering processes. And we can talk about the implications for that uh, later. Then we move on to the organics analyses using the micro L2MS instrument at Johnson Space Center. And we can look at changes in organic uh, functional group chemistry as well as concentration. This instrument has two different ionization wavelengths. The first is 118 nanometers, which is really sensitive to all organic species. Also has 266 nanometers, which preferentially detects um, aromatic molecules. We can make maps of the organic concentration, like you can see here on the right. And warmer colors mean there's a higher concentration. So we can make the map that spans areas of the sample that were irradiated, like the big black box, and samples that were not. So for this laser irradiated sample, we see an overall increase in the abundance of these simple free organic species. And we also see an increase in the aromatic molecules in particular. We think this might be because we've got melting and vaporization processes going on in these simulated impacts, and we could be getting vapor redeposition of these smaller organic molecules on the surface. Also gives us an idea that aromatics appear to be resistant to totally breaking down under these space weathering processes, and that could give us some clues into what types of chemistry we might expect for the organic molecules in our return samples. We can compare that to organics for the laser rated, uh, from the laser radiated samples to these, our ion irradiated samples. And again, we see an opposing trend where here there's an overall reduction in the organics by about 30 to 40 percent, especially noticeable in the helium irradiated organic maps that are shown on the right. And this is in contrast to our increase we see for the lasered samples. 
This might be because ion irradiation and solar wind irradiation is this constant process rather than this stochastic melting and vaporization. It could be a slow, steady sputtering of these organic components, breaking individual bonds and removing uh, atoms and molecules from the surface slowly and steadily. We can then turn to electron microscopy to get clues about what changes in microstructure and chemistry could tell us about changes in optical properties. So we used a focused ion beam scanning electron microscope to extract cross sections of the sample for analysis in the TEM. So these two images on the left are TEM images. That means they are cross sections. So the top of the image is the surface of the sample. And as you look down the image, that's going into the sample interior. And the TEM analysis for both of the laser irradiated samples shows that we're producing uh, abundant melt features, including melt layers, as well as those droplets, those kind of drops you can see on the surface in the image on the left. There's also vesicles or bubbles, those bright um, spaces in the image, and nanoparticles, which are the dark small particles in the very surface in the melt layer. We can compare that to um, the helium irradiated, uh, helium irradiated enstatite sample, which is shown in the middle image, and that uh, also exhibits these vesiculated textures, those bright spots, and there are some isolated um, nanoparticles, but we don't see the same sort of melting textures as we do in the laser samples. We can then use energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy or EDS to map the chemistry of the nanoparticles, and some of those maps are shown on the right. In our lasered samples, we see in the one-time lasered sample that there's a really diverse composition of the nanoparticles. It includes iron, metal, magnetite, as well as iron, nickel, and, and nickel sulfide, some of the sulfides you see in those uh, maps there. We compare that, when we compare the one and the five-time lasered samples, uh, they, the five-time lasered sample, the nanoparticles become dominated by iron, nickel sulfides. We don't have the same diversity as we do in the one-time lasered sample. Okay, so we've made some observations for microstructure and chemistry, but what do those mean and what kind of effect do they have on the spectral properties? Dave Trang at the University of Hawaii did some radiative transfer modeling to look at the effect of the composition of those nanoparticles on the spectrum uh, that we might expect. So to do this, he uses an inert silicate host. In this case, he started with quartz and you artificially add in nanoparticles that have various sizes and compositions. So this plot shows a spectrum where we've artificially added in magnetite, which we found in our laser irradiated samples. He started with nanomagnetite, which is uh, grains that are less than 40 nanometers. And those that spectrum shows a bluing and a darkening trend. Whereas when we add micromagnetite, so larger than 40 nanometers, we still see darkening, but it's, it's really flat. We don't see that same bluing. We can compare those spectral models to including uh, nanotrolite. And uh, in these models, we see that trolite actually reddens and darkens the, the spectrum uh, for the nanophase. But when we add microphase, it uh, darkens and also adds a mild bluing effect. So this demonstrates that there are competing effects between nanoparticles, even with the same composition, but different sizes. Um, so when you're adding together the effect, not only of different sizes within the same composition of a nanoparticle, but you've got trolite, as I showed here, you have magnetite from the previous slide. We know there's iron, which from lunar studies causes strong reddening. This is a really complicated picture of competing um, spectral effects across these wavelengths. Okay, so what does it all mean? Well, it means that there are inconsistent and competing spectral effects between different constituent space weathering processes, so ion irradiation versus laser irradiation. The trends are probably related to the diverse nanoparticle composition, and that might be related to the mineralogical complexity of our target material. We see differences in organic concentration and that aromatics appear to be more resistant to space weathering, which could give us a glimpse of what to expect in samples from Bennu and Ryugu. And when we couple our radiative, uh, our laboratory experiments to our radiative transfer models, we see the size and the chemistry of the nanoparticles has a significant effect on the spectral signatures. If the population of nanoparticles evolves over time, that may complicate our interpretation of fresh versus weathered surfaces on carbonaceous asteroids. Finally, I hope this shows that simulating surface conditions in the laboratory and then doing these uh, coordinated analyses helps with interpreting remote sensing data, but also puts uh, the context into context uh, return sample analysis for not only Hayabusa 2 and OREX, but uh, looking forward to MMX and beyond. And one quick plug for our Goldschmidt 2021 session, being co-coordinated by myself and Jessica Barnes at University of Arizona, and it's coordinated analysis in the era of sample return missions, which is very applicable to this workshop. So I hope you can all put in an abstract. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. We do have a question that's just come in, two questions actually. Uh, I have, yeah, oh, three, three questions I guess now. Uh, what is the pulse length of the laser? And do, do you have plans to laser shock and irradiate the same samples to test competitive additive effects? Yes, great question. The pulse duration is about uh, six to eight nanoseconds, so pretty short. We're looking at doing a, a femtosecond laser as well to get it even shorter. Um, we haven't done any of the dual irradiation uh, yet. We wanted to characterize everything first so we could understand what the individual processes we're doing, but that is in our plans to do one of these, you know, hit it with both of them. So great idea. Uh, another question from John Bridges. Uh, the Briefly mentioned Fe metal uh, nanophase particles. Uh, were they seen in your experiment? Which I think they were. They were in the TEM image nanoparticles. Didn't yeah, you? I, I, I didn't show all the HRTM images, but we had the iron metals much more common in the ion irradiated samples. We don't see the same diversity of compositions in those samples for the nanoparticles as we do in the laser ones. We think because there's less melting, vaporization, things moving around, and and uh, you know new compositions forming. So. Would you uh, conclude exactly what is causing the causing the reddening, darkening, bluing? I know the reddening uh, sometimes being suge suggested is due to the iron nanoparticles. What about the bluing, darkening? What are your thoughts? Yeah, the bluing, I think some of that comes from um, the magnetite nanoparticles that we see, which we see in the early laser irradiated ones, and some of uh, those nanophase magnetites can cause bluing. As the population evolves over time, it's moving more towards these reddening nanoparticles, and so we also see that the degree of bluing gets weaker um, with our continued laser radiation. So we think it's you know, this trade-off between what's forming and what are available phases for the nanoparticles um, as we continue to expose it to the simulated weathering. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. That ends the afternoon session. I believe uh, Ashley has a talk from Jasmine Dhaliwal. So Ashley, are you there? Hello, uh, so Jasmine has managed to, so is on the west coast of the US, but has managed to get up, I'm not even gonna imagine what time it is um, and I think you're going to present live Jasmine so over to you. Okay there I am <laughs> sorry okay that was really hard um, it's early here um, hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm going to talk about siderophyte elements um, in mesociderites and then thoughts about linking this lab to missions and one day perhaps sample return. Um, I'm a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz and I'd like to thank my collaborators, Mary Horan, Richard Ash, and Rick Carlson. So, mesociderites, just a quick introduction. Um, they are they're, the, one of the major questions is, are they, do they originate from a core mantle boundary or are they a result of impact mixing? They are differentiated stony iron meteorites. And um, this sample on the left is actually quite metal rich, but typically they are breccias or mixtures of approximately equal amounts of silicate rock and iron metal. The silicate iron is thought to have, the silicate rock, sorry, has thought to originate from differentiated planetesimal based on its lithology. And um, the iron metal is thought to have been molten during impact, and it's unclear if it ever underwent fractional crystallization, as would be the case of an actual core, a planetary core. So a quick introduction to siderophile elements. Um, siderophile means iron loving, and hence they strongly partition into the metal phase. So if you look at this diagram on the right, there's silicate rock, there's iron nickel metal, and you can think of the siderophile elements rushing into the metal whenever they have the opportunity. Um, and then on the left, there's a small insert from the periodic table with the highly siderophile elements, which are very, they, they're, much, they're very strongly attracted to the metal, and um, that is the focus of this, these results that I'm going to show. So we took um, metal and silicate separates from mesociderite samples, and on the x-axis you have um, about six um, HSEs, highly siderophile elements. On the y-axis is sample over CI chondrite, so it's normalized CI chondrite, and if CI chondrite were here, it'd be one for all elements. Um, so the mesociderite metal has more um, HSCs than the silicate, which is to be expected because it prefers the metal. But during fractional crystallization, the HSCs among themselves also have different affinities for solid and liquid um, metal. Um, so as the 
as the iron is as the iron core is crystallizing, we would see fractionation, but we see pretty much flat patterns. They're chondritic. And so it's thought that the metal was molten during this impact mixing. We think it's an impact mixing event and that the, this is not core material that we're seeing on the mesosiderite and the mesosiderite meteorites and for the for its parent body. And so what does this mean for missions? Well, right now we have the Psyche asteroid that we're gonna go explore. And perhaps one day we'll get sample return from a metal asteroid, which would be super cool. But until we get there, we have this really high resolution lab data that we can link to missions. So one of the scientific questions for the Psyche mission is, did the metal asteroid cool from the inside out or the outside in? So nickel prefers liquid metal. And so if, the, if it had cooled from the inside out, then the outside would be, um, liquid for longer and there'd be more nickel there. Conversely, some of the HSCs, radium, osmium, radium, ruthenium, prefer the solid metal. So if the acid stays liquid for longer, you'd have more nickel, but then less of these HSC. And so this is just one way we can link, the more we get in high resolution in the lab, we can link to um, space missions and the less, the, the lower resolution data we're currently getting. But perhaps one day we'll have sample return and might even be able to measure these um, in situ on an asteroid. So thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you, Jasmine. You can uh, go back to bed now. I think. Okay. <laughs> if anyone has yeah. any questions for Jasmine, put them in the Q&A and she will be able to answer them. Um, we're set to have a break uh, now. So if it's OK, hopefully with our, uh, our last few speakers, I'm going to suggest um, that we start again in about five minutes or so um, at 2.30. Um, well, we've got three more invited talks and then a bit of discussion and time for other questions that may have come up over the day. Okay, so see you uh, yeah, in about seven minutes. Thanks. Okay, welcome back, uh, everybody. I think we'll we'll make a start. Excellent, Jane has appeared. Conveniently, my doorbell rang during the break, which was handy. Um, unfortunately, it's woken up my cats, which is less handy. So I apologise if uh, there are any guest appearances this afternoon. Um, so we've got three more talks left, um, and the first of those uh, to kick us off is from Jane MacArthur up at the University of Manchester. And she's going to tell us about the Lost Meteorites of Antarctica project. Over to you, Jane. Great. Can you hear me? And is my screen up? Yep. Excellent. Yeah, right. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk today about this great project that's been taking place over the last few years, which was dreamed up by Katie Joy and a mathematician, Jeff Evert, at the University of Manchester, to test a hypothesis of whether there were many more buried iron meteorites beneath the ice in Antarctica. So. Sorry. Um, we're the first UK-led project to collect meteorites in Antarctica. We've been funded by the Leverholm Trust with massive logistical support from the British Antarctic Survey. Two field teams um, visited um, over two Antarctic summer seasons. Um, two people went out on a reconnaissance trip to find an area where there would be meteorites and test some of the field kit for looking beneath the surface. And then in the second season, five people went out um, for a longer period to um, test this further. Unfortunately, we didn't find any um, meteorites from the subsurface and we didn't cover a large enough area to really be able to test the hypothesis of whether there are more ions beneath the ice rather than on the surface. However, these two seasons were very successful because we collected a large number of meteorites which provide a new repository of extraterrestrial material for the UK and for the international community to study in the future. And there's also a long-term aim to have a frequent UK-led meteorite recovery program to um, continue getting new samples. So we have all the rare material we've been hearing about today in the various other talks. So two newly discovered dense meteorite collection zones. Um, the map of Antarctica on the top right, you'll see the Halley UK base in the top middle. That's one of the main entry points for the British Antarctic Survey. They flew down from there to the area in the red square, which is then enlarged in the bottom right corner of this slide. And you'll see the Hutchison ice field as a square in the middle bottom and the outer recovery ice fields towards the right hand side, which are the two main blue ice field areas where all of the surface meteorites were found. Um, 
You'll also see a zoom in on that Hutchison Icefield area where there's been two new names approved recently by the British Antarctic Territory. We have Turner Nunatak after Professor Grenville Turner, and um, we have Pillinger Nunatak after Professor Colin Pillinger. And they were both approved earlier this year. And so you can see them on the inset. So the fact these were collected on the outer recovery ice fields, we expect them to eventually get met bill numbers, which will be OUT and then a classification number. And we've proposed HUT for the Hutchison ice fields collected meteorites. So in season one, we recovered 36 meteorite samples and in season two, 86 were um, retrieved. So we think we've got 122 meteorites, provided they all turn out to definitely be meteorites. Um, no subsurface meteorites were recovered. We have preliminary and met, met data. This is a measure of the conductivity and the magnetic susceptibility of the meteorites, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, which gives us an idea as to their initial classification right from the field with a quick and easy measurement. We also have a vast amount of documentation on exactly where and how these were collected under clean conditions with no human hands touching them. So the AMET MET readings I just mentioned, the magnetic susceptibility and conductivity, you can carry out with a little handheld device um, in about 15 seconds. And you'll see from this um, data previously published by Jerome Gatchecker that these measurements tend to be high conductivity for the iron and stony iron meteorites shown in the blue circle. Um, there's a big mixture with the ordinary chondrites, but it does tend to separate the H meteorites from the LL meteorites towards each end of that ordinary chondrite area. And the A chondrites tend to have very little or no conductivity at all. So all of the measurements from both seasons um, are now shown in the red squares over here. Um, some of these may be slightly subject to error because where the sample is under one gram in size, you tend to get a lot of different readings. So they might not be completely provable, but we're basically shown there's a wide diversity of meteorite types. Um, we think we've got four up in that iron circle and the latest data of the microprobe this week suggests that three of them may be paired, even though one of them was found in a different place. Um, but we've got a very wide diversity here, so we're quite excited that we should have a lot of different types as we go through class um, the classification process. So curation wise, we ship the meteorites frozen um, on the British Antarctic Survey research ship. They arrived in Cambridge later shipped to Manchester in the middle of lockdown in June, so except that got delayed till August. We've been putting into effect our preliminary examination plan, which I talked about back in January, to classify and curate the collection. We're trying to keep these pristine samples um, as free from contamination as possible. And um, we're following the best practice from many other Antarctic collections that have been done by other countries in the past. We're thawing them in a vacuum chamber to try and prevent any reaction with water. We're storing them in desiccators with desiccants, so there's a low humidity environment. Um, the long-term curation will eventually be at the Natural History Museum, so as we classify these, the type specimens will be transferred to their collection and eventually accessible for scientists to request. Um, so one of the big plus points of a project like this is there's been funding to maintain and update facilities at the University of Manchester. We have a class 10,000 clean room. On the bottom right, you can see the vacuum chambers, the exocators we've been using. We can put shelves in these so you can either put a few meter small meteorites in at a time, or one of our samples is three kilograms, so that needed the whole chamber to itself. Um, we've got a diamond saw. We've also got a slow speed isomet saw. So we've got um, microscopes, desk and cabinets. So um, this is a good opportunity to make sure we've got first rate um, curation facilities for any other samples or mission possibilities that turn up in the future. Um, you've heard from Tom this morning about his photogrammetry making these beautiful models um, that we can look at, which has been very handy through lockdown when we couldn't get in the lab, we could still look at these. And we've also got a lot of computer tomography CT scans of the meteorites. Luckily, we collected about 10 data sets literally in the week before lockdown. So I had something to do for the first couple of months in getting to grips with the CT data. We're hoping to compare, compare the volume measurements between these. With the CT, we can look at the porosity within the meteorite to see how much that affects things. We can look at the total metal volume and distribution, and we're going to compare this back to the map measurements and then to the final classifications to sort of see what level of accuracy these different measurements have on giving us a good idea, because the AMET is a very useful device you can use in the field very quickly for an initial idea. And the CT scans are also useful for deciding where to cut and break the rocks. 
Um, so moving on to the preliminary classifications, um, please note these have not been submitted to the Met Ball yet. We don't actually have any thin sections to date because um, we've had various issues obviously with the labs and the Natural History Museum have um, been furloughed so um, we're hoping for some thin sections in the new year. For the time being all of this work's been done on the epoxy blocks which I've made and polished um, at Manchester. So um, quick um, ABC of classification. Um, chondrites are the most common meteorites. 86% or something seem to be chondrites, whereas 7% are achondrites, 5% um, iron meteorites, and probably less than 2% are stony iron meteorites. Um, and within those groups, um, the carbonaceous chondrites down the left hand side are sort of less than 5% of overall falls. Um, the vast majority of chondrites tend to be the ordinary chondrites, the HL and LL. Um, are the main classes thought to be three separate parent bodies. As you heard in Maitrier's talk earlier, she had a lovely diagram showing the different petrographic types, um, three being thought to be kind of the surface of the H parent body, which has suffered very little heat disruption, whereas type six or seven um, are further down in an interior where they may have suffered a lot more heat processing. We also have the petrographic types two and one for water process meteorites. So um, going into those ordinary meteorites, um, the HL and LL classes, the way we distinguish between these is looking at the um, percentage of iron in phaolite, the olivine, and in ferrocillite, the peroxine, um, the peroxine on the vertical axis here and the olivine on the horizontal. So as you can see um, from the literature, and there's been some past major papers like Brillian Jones, um, which have sort of looked at a vast array of meteorites and shown that these percentages fall within these boxes. So this is what we use for classification. So the first five analyses we've got back from the microprobe show that we have one H meteorite, we have three L meteorites and one double L meteorite, which I will show you more of now. So this is an 851 gram sample. We suspect it may be paired with some other samples collected um, later on. Um, you've got the backscattered image there where the lighter colours are obviously the heavier elements showing the iron and the iron oxides and the darker material is the silicates and the iron magnesium silicon map in the bottom right corner brings out the olivine tends to be the green which is magnesium rich, the light blue tends to be the peroxy and the dark blue areas are often feldspars or other material and so this, the preliminary classification for this is an H6 um, you can see the numbers there, the phaolite and the ferrocillite are both below 20. So when you think back to that plot I showed you a minute ago, um, the, towards that lower end in the H range. Um, this meteorite is the only one not collected on the blue ice field itself. It was recovered from the top of Turner Nunatak. Um, you can see the beautiful chondros in the BSC image, um, in the bottom right and top right particularly. Again, we've got the element map there. And we've got this as a preliminary classification as an L5. As you'll see, the phalite and ferrocellite are just above 20. So again, that's why it's plotting up in the middle of the graph I showed you a minute ago. Um, this was the first sample out of the freezer. I particularly like its shape with the nose cone, as you can see in the top left. Um, this is a particularly small epoxy block, but we managed to get enough points on it to show that the olivine and peroxy measurements were quite consistent. And we think this is an L6. Um, this was the largest meteorite collected in season one. It's 2.46 kilograms. Um, this was, um, we think this is an L6 meteorite. Um, again, as you can see, the phalite ferrocellite are both sort of in the mid 20s there. Um, and you can see the electron map showing the olivine, peroxine, and other materials. Of course, we've got the other elements, so we can look into these further for other features of interest. Um, and this is another large specimen, 810 grams, and we think this is a double L. As you see, the phaolite is right up at 28 there, so that's the highest average reading we've got over the eight measurements we took. Um, it's a big chondral at the top right, um, or remains of a chondral. Uh, so we think this is an LL5. Um, this is one we haven't classified yet. Um, I showed you it back in January when we were speculating as to what it might be. We've now got an SEM map out of it and we think that um, some of these areas may be CAIs. So we're thinking this could be a carbonaceous chondrite. 
we plan to do more SCM work. Um, we're in touch with the Open University and Richard Greenwood about oxygen isotope work for the future. So we'll be looking at this one more closely. Um, so that brings me to the end. We've got our first five provisional classifications. We have had seven more data sets off the microprobe this week. Um, another five ordinary chondrites most likely, but two quite interesting ones that I hope to tell you about next time. We aim to be submitting batches of these classifications throughout 2021. Partly depends on being able to ship meteorites down to the Natural History Museum where they'll be holding the type specimens. So lots of things in progress. We're sorting out the curation planning with the NHM so that samples can be got out for science um, in the medium term. There's still some work to do on, um, we've got some ice from Antarctica in the freezer, which some other parts of the project are looking into. And obviously we'd like to do some public engagement with Tom's fabulous models, some of the CT scans and other works. So once we're allowed out of lockdown and the vaccines circulated, hopefully there'll be more about this project to tell you. I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll stop there and take any questions. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. Um, I noticed that Richard Greenwood has written hi Jane in the question box and then not written anything else. <laughs> so I don't know That's if okay. he's saying hello Jane. Hi Richard, we'll get some samples to you soon hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard if you have a question or if anybody else has a question um, please put it in the in the chat box and I'll read it out. Um, oh, so I have a quick question. Um, have you been, are you giving them weathering grades and things as part of the, the classification? We will need to be submitting that. Um, certainly for shock grades, we need to see thin sections and um, hopefully we should have 20 thin sections as soon as possible when the Natural History Museum are unfurloughed and their lovely technicians are able yeah. to send those to us. So, okay. um, yeah, we haven't looked at that in detail yet. Uh, so what's Richard said? So Richard says, hi, Jane. Uh, just wondering if you have any plans to go back to Antarctica soon? Oh, well, there isn't any money yet. I, I haven't been myself yet. This is this the best I get my backdrop of being Antarctica. But I know Katie's looking into it. And despite sort of being off on maternity leave, I suspect she'll be keeping a lot of things grinding in the background. So she's certainly talking to all the right people and trying to push the case. Yeah, I think from my understanding, I think they're trying to get money to do it. But um, I don't know when they'll hear back. Natasha might be able There she is. <laughs> do you want to comment, Natasha, or...? No, I think it's delayed in terms of when we'll know if it's going to happen or not. But um, the, just the good news is that they're unfurloughed now. So the sections yes. are being processed as we speak. And I really hope I'll get my hands on them just before Christmas slash first week in January. Christmas present time. <laughs> I know, I'd be so excited if I can get to the lab to even see them. We'll see. Good luck. Uh, and then there's one quick question from, from Jamie Blanche. Um, he says, hi, Jane, do you have a, a range of sensors for the subsurface detection? Oh, um, I think they were hoping to be able to see down at least sort of half a metre, a metre. I'm not sure exactly. Um, I think it's laid out in their papers. Um, certainly they had one out earlier this year, which had more information on it. I can look that up. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, so we'll move on to our next talk uh, from Ryan Ziegler, who's somewhere in New Mexico, I think, driving around New Mexico in Texas. <laughs> He's got out of his car very briefly to join us, so thank you very much. Uh, Ryan's going to talk about um, 50 years of curating NASA's uh, Astro Materials collection. All right, everybody hear me okay? Yep, we can hear okay. you. Great, so yeah, uh, hello from Las Cruces, New Mexico. We're out here at our remote storage facility, um, which I didn't realize when when I said I would do this. So uh, I've been a little bit absent for the meeting and I apologize for that, but I, I am very happy to have been invited to do this. So um, I thought I would talk to you all about curation today since it's really all I know about at this point. Um, uh, so at the Johnson Space Center, uh, we have for the past 50 years, uh, starting in about 1967, uh, been curating NASA's Astro Materials collections. And so um, it started with the Apollo samples, obviously, and uh, has snowballed uh, ever since. And we have added different collections over time. Um, 
So we have sort of a two part charter at the Johnson Space Center. Um, you know, it's our job to preserve and protect the samples. We want to um, make sure that we are enabling current and future science as much as possible. But we're also trying to um, preserve, um, um, maximize the scientific return we're getting on the samples uh, uh, at the same time. So it's always about finding a balance between uh, getting good science out of the um, out of the samples while uh, saving a portion for for the future. Um, and, and along those lines, uh, increasingly we find that we're spending a lot of our time uh, developing new technologies or new procedures for how to better curate the samples we have and how to prepare to curate samples that are, you know, coming to us or, or other asked materials uh, curation facilities uh, in the near future. And so I uh, probably won't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but we'll at least touch on it near the end. So if you were to take all of our collections and I say our very loosely here, because obviously not all of these are NASA missions and put it on one slide. Here you can see them. Uh, here's what we take care of, starting from the original in 1969 to the most recent samples we got back in uh, 2012 from a portion of the JAXA Hayabusa mission. So it's a wide range of materials uh, and a wide range of uh, locations that they're from. So I've listed where they're from, but probably more important, at least from a curation standpoint, is the characteristics of the samples, where we have everything from large samples, like we got, we got from the Apollo and meteorite collections, to regoliths that came uh, back from the Apollo samples, to uh, many small particles, either individual uh, particles like the cosmic dust particles or portions of the regolith like collected from Hayabusa. And not just samples that are standalone samples, but also samples that are embedded in a substrate like the Stardust samples or the Genesis samples. Each of these types of samples present different challenges in how to preserve, curate, and serve them to the community. And so that'll be a little bit uh, of what I'd like to talk to you about today. And so while this is what we have now, um, there's also what we have on the way. And I mean, I'm sure everyone has been following the news and saw that Hayabusa 2 successfully landed in Australia and was 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 collected. And that's huge congratulations to the science team and to JAXA for that. And we're excited to get uh, a portion of those samples uh, sometime next year. Um, and of course there's OSIRIS-REx. And so a lot of what we're doing uh, in addition to taking care of the samples we have is getting ready for the samples that are coming back for these two missions uh, including building the labs, you know, so about 40% of our building is being retrofitted right now for uh, labs uh, to house these and to support these. And then also there's things that are coming out in, in the more distant future, including uh, you know, Artemis samples, um, samples from Phobos, which I know we heard about earlier, and, and Mars as well, and perhaps even from the surface of a comet in the future. Now, each of these missions um, are different in some ways than anything we take care of now, and they require significant uh, development of techniques in order to properly curate them. And it may seem premature to start preparing for our sample return when it's 10 years out, but I, actually I probably don't have to explain to this particular crowd why, why it is not too early to start that. Now it'd be great to go lab by lab and show you each and every one of our labs and talk about them in detail, but even the most hardened curation folks would get pretty bored. So I thought I would put everything together on one slide and then talk about the most important things uh, uh, in a little more detail on the following slide. So, you know, all of our collections are, are stored in eight different clean room suites. So it's about 22 different clean rooms and there's a wide range of classes. Um, in addition to the clean rooms themselves, there's, you know, uh, a significant physical infrastructure that supports all of the clean rooms. One of the nice things about having all of the samples together at Johnson Space Center is we're able to um, not duplicate our physical infrastructure so we don't have to have multiple um, nitrogen systems in multiple places. And being in Houston, of course, we have the, the special um, challenge of getting, uh, having to deal with hurricanes. And this year was a particularly good uh, year for that. We didn't get hit directly, but obviously a lot of the Gulf Coast did. Um, and increasingly, we have a lot of ancillary laboratories. We'll talk about these a little bit uh, and that help us to prepare the samples uh, for, for the scientists as well as um, new labs to do advanced curation on the samples as well. But in addition to the samples we have, we have people. We have people and we have data. And so we have 40 plus people who have been, have something like half a, half a millennium of uh, collection uh, of, of um, experience uh, taking care of the samples. And without their um, highly detailed uh, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, we would struggle to do what we do. And we also have data accumulated over the last 45 years and, and, and as well as our public facing websites. And uh, right now we're facing the challenge of taking that data 
that's often in analog form, you know, pencil written hand notes from the Apollo missions early on and digitizing them and making them into a form that's uh, both accessible and useful to the scientific public. So we're not gonna go lab by lab, but I will say that um, each laboratory suite is designed to best take care of the samples that are in it. And I mentioned earlier that we have a wide variety of different sample types. And so you can see Cecilia here in the bottom left that many of you know, she hates that I use this photo. So by all means, tell her I did. And you can see here, she's holding a meteorite um, and the Apollo samples would look much the same. And they're stored and processed inside these um, nitrogen purge glove boxes, which protects them from the atmosphere around them. Um, but for other part, other samples like our, our Stardust samples here in the top right or our Cosmic Dust samples here in the bottom center, um, it's not really feasible at this point to handle and, and curate them inside nitrogen glove boxes. The um, tribal electric charging and, and other complications that come from the ultra dry nitrogen environment um, makes handling them a challenge. And so we actually handle them in air in clean spaces. And then Genesis here in the bottom right, I'm showing because that had the special um, challenge of that it crashed. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say crashed, off nominal landing. But, I, and so the samples came back dirty. Now they're not dirty in the sense of, um, luckily, contaminating the types of measurements that were trying to be made since those ions were actually um, embedded in the substrate. But still needed to get the dirt off. And so a, a lot of um, the effort that went into Genesis ended up in being very specialized cleaning techniques in how to get the samples as clean as possible. Now, in, you know, so I, you know, the clean rooms are our most public face and that's where, you know, that's, that's the showroom, but you know, behind the showroom is the physical infrastructure. And, um, you know, those clean rooms don't stay clean unless we have people to clean them. And if we don't have a way to provide clean air, clean gas, and clean water, those are the same thing, uh, clean gas and clean water uh, into them. And so we have a 17,000 gallon nitrogen tank, which we bubble off and use as the source of our um, pure nitrogen that we uh, use as the inert gas around the samples. We have an ultra pure water system, uh, which allows us to clean our tools and our cabinets and keep the in, uh, materials that are gonna come into contact with the samples clean. Um, once upon a time, we outsourced that here to New Mexico, actually, and it was just so much work getting the materials back and forth. And anytime anything unexpected happened, uh, it just wasn't it just wasn't working. So we ended up developing our own cleaning procedures right here at Johnson Space Center. And then finally, air handlers, which is often overlooked. We have 20, 24 air handlers in the building, of which two thirds uh, are specifically designed to, to provide HEPA filtered air into the different labs. And so again, the individual details for the, the labs vary slightly, but um, collectively they, um, uh, they all draw upon this, this common infrastructure. And then we also have to worry about physical security. I mean, I mean I'm out here at uh, White Sands, New Mexico because we keep 15% of the samples, our unique sample collection. So not meteorites and not Hayabusa samples since those are already split in other places. But uh, Apollo samples, cosmic dust samples, Stardust Genesis, they're all out here at White Sands um, in, a, in a static facility like you can see here with Mel Rodriguez. Um, you know, they're in these static cabinets. So you can't process out here, but you can store and keep them safe. Um, and then at jo the Johnson Space Center, we have a hurricane hardened building and we have vaults and we have ways to protect against uh, human intervention and non-human intervention. And uh, you spend a lot of time as curators worrying about worst case scenarios and uh, um, hurricanes is, is obviously one of them. Now the samples that we have, we provide um, pretty much around the world. Um, right now there are about 1400, we hand out about 1400 samples each year to scientists around the world. There's almost 20,000 samples on loan to about 430 people in 24 different countries. And so um, we try to make the allocation process as fair and open as possible uh, and, and really give people uh, around the world access to the samples. Um, and fine, oh, and so, you know, the, if, I often get this question right now, about 60% of the samples we allocated to the United States, there's, there's no, this isn't prescribed. This is just how the numbers work out. You can see the UK is the largest, uh, the largest re receiver of, of samples outside the US uh, and it's about 40% total. Um, I, I, I left this in here part because, you know, it's exciting and it's fun to show and they like to brag a little bit, but also because um, especially in the last year or two, um, we spent more time doing this than, than we, Originally, and so as yeah, if Europe or, or ESA or or 
whoever is getting ready to start bringing their own curation facility online, um, the tours and the outreach that goes with it is not trivial, uh, particularly when you have uh, special events like the 50th anniversary of Apollo last year. And um, we spent 50% of our time last year dealing with the media and dealing with the public interest, which is great. You really want that interest. So designing the labs uh, such that you have a viewing area where you don't have to go into the lab uh, or, or designing them to uh, be able to support the, um, the influx of people you'll get when you're new because that's the only time they'll care about you when you're new or or when you're um uh or when there's an anniversary oh i'm going way too long right so i will very briefly talk about one sample because it's the apollo samples and therefore they're the best and so apollo samples stand apart from our other uh, other sample collections because they're obviously collected by humans here you can see the saturn fives that took them up there and then they had the astronauts and so uh because they had astronauts and astronauts are very useful and if you don't believe me just ask an astronaut um it turns out the um they collected a very diverse set of samples it's by far our most diverse set of samples in terms of different types of material and um, they also landed on the surface of the moon in six different times and in, in very different locations uh, so they had a wide variety of sample types and so here you can just see a pretty picture from apollo 17 from shorty crater and most of the samples that came back or are, are sorry about uh, two-thirds of the samples that came back were some type of large rock either igneous samples like the basalts and the anorthosites or, or brecciated samples like this, but then one third of the material that came back with regolith, you have to handle and deal with regolith in a very different way. And in addition to the regolith, they had drive tubes. And so, um, and, and again, uh, it, it, these are still regolith, but the, the handling involved in them is, is quite different. And here you can see that there were six, six, samples, six sample sites, 382 kilograms, 2,200 individual samples. And so, um, when you look inside the lab, I mean, here you can see some pictures of our actual lab and, you know, much of the procedures that go with the rest of our collections are based off of Apollo because it was original. Now it has evolved over time and obviously we don't treat meteorites or cosmic dust the same as we do uh, Apollo samples, but many of the uh, restrictions that we have that we're in a clean room, that they're processed in dry nitrogen glove boxes, that we bear, that we severely restrict the materials that can come into contact with the samples. And when we do use samples, we use things that are not commonly found in nature. So unless we fun, suddenly find a stainless steel meteorite or, or asteroid parent body, um, we should be able to tell that anytime we find a little bit of steel inside one of the samples, we'll know that that came from us. And also um, because we had such a wide variety of samples types, we had to have um, some specialty cabinets, but that's a different talk. <laughs> so the last thing I'll talk about real quick before I run out of time, and I know I'm probably close to running out of time already, is, is advanced curation. And this is a whole different talk, so all I'm going to do is talk about this very briefly. Uh, these are the five main areas, I think, right now that we are spending our effort on uh, getting ready for uh, either to better take care of the samples we have or to get ready for the samples that come back. Now, I don't do hardly any of this work, but, you know, toxicology is important that understanding the toxicology of the Apollo samples as we're ready to send astronauts back or of carbonaceous chondrites uh, as we're ready to get Osiris Rex samples back is important and uh, Andy Harrington and her team are working hard on that. We spent a lot of time lately on biological cleanliness of the lab and Aaron Redberg and his team have been going in and sampling the lab for bio the biological contaminants in the different labs and trying to look at differences in the labs both seasonally and by the labs and understanding the impact that those are having on the samples themselves advances in small particle handling, and this is mostly Christopher Sneed and, and his team, they're learning how to better handle these small particles, and particularly in how to handle them in more challenging environments like a dry nitrogen cabinet. And so uh, he's, Christopher's working uh, not alone on this, he's, he's working closely with JAXA and the team there because they both have a vested interest between Osiris Rex and Hayabusa too and how to do this. Obviously, Cold Curation and Julie Mitchell and her team are working hard on how we might better take care of samples that would come back from, uh, say, Artemis, uh, if they are able to bring back cold samples or a future sample return mission from uh, from uh, the pole, uh, polar region. And then finally, we've been adding a lot of non-destructive Im imaging, either 3D uh, visible imaging or, or X-ray computed tomography, uh, and, and as well as scanning ROM on an XRF. And I put non-destructive here, um, uh, I should have put non-destructive here in quotes because it's minimally destructive. And so I really don't have a ton of time, but um, I'll just show um, the pictures here. So we just opened one of the six remaining Apollo samples that had never been opened. It was a 30 centimeter long drive tube. Here you can see an analog version of it. So we took it to University of Texas CT facility and we scanned the entire tube using their CT scanner. And we were able to get this beautiful CT image. And on the bottom, what you're seeing here is the original 
2D radiographs from back in the 1970s that was taken that was taken in the same tube. And so you can see the increase in contrast. And this is an individual slice, and I'm literally pointing at the screen. Um, uh, it's probably blinking to tell me to shut up. Okay, um, and so here's the video uh, down the length of the core. And so this is 8,000 individual slices along the 18 and a half centimeter uh, length of the core. You can see the, 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 the line here. So we did this though, not just because it's cool, because it's great, because it gives us a permanent record. Now this, this, this tube of material got extruded and has been, is being dissected. And so the original stratigraphy will be lost. It'll be preserved within a half centimeter uh, in increments, but this will give us the permanent record of how, uh, uh, of how to do it. And then um, in addition to the entire tube scans, we're actually separating out the individual clasps you're seeing and um, uh, scanning them at the Johnson Space Center in our CT scanner, and we get these beautiful, uh, beautiful scans. And so in lieu of slides, I think I'll leave this up and just let it play through and um, take any questions with the no time I have left. Thank you. Well, there we go. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. It was a great talk. And uh, yeah, these scans are absolutely beautiful. It's um, My cat has joined me on my lap. She enjoyed, you know, it, she was that interested in Apollo samples. Um, so we have a couple of questions, although she's just hopped off. Um, so one is from uh, Martin Suttle, who says, Hi, Ryan. Thanks for a fascinating talk. I was wondering if anyone uh, ever searched the lunar regolith for micrometeorites? And if so, do you know any resulting publications or abstracts or anything? Um, yes and no. I mean, they found meteorites on the moon. There's bench crater meteorite from Apollo 14. And then the micrometeorites, not the way they're defined on Earth, um, I don't know of any that are found loose in the soil. But I do know that um, Katie, Joy, and, and several other groups have found them as individual particles in within regolith breaches where they're finding materials that are extra lunar. Um, there's lots of that on the moon. You see evidence of iron, uh, iron, me iron nickel meteorites that's clearly from meteorites, but they're also able to find small amounts of silicate materials, mostly silicate materials. Um, so that's probably the closest thing we have to micrometeorites on the moon yeah. okay. so, so far. And then one from uh, Mahesh who says, uh, could you comment on the advantages uh, or disadvantages of a central versus distributed curation facility for return samples? So the only disadvantage I can think of to a centralized uh, distribution center is the ability for one disaster taking out everything, which is why we have the remote storage. Otherwise, having everything together allows you to cross-train your processors to work in different labs. When things got busy for Apollo last year, we were able to draw on uh, processors for Meteorite and other collections, and the same will happen in reverse. Um, you know, the nitrogen system that runs our labs is a multi-million dollar system. The ultra pure water system is a multi-million dollar system. The new, you know, clean rooms all cost millions of dollars. And so if you have to duplicate that across multiple facilities, it, it gets expensive. And, and getting enough highly trained personnel is, is, is a challenge. And so, um, so I would say there are some mi minor disadvantages, but there are ways to mitigate that and that centralized is better. Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, cheers for joining us and uh, go back to sleep or driving. Or no, no. You're planning 900 to... miles of driving left, so that's, okay. that'll be fine. Yeah. Don't sleep but... whilst you're driving. <laughs> so... yeah, you know, I'm multitasking. <laughs> multitasking. All right, well, thanks great. for having me. Sorry, I'm sorry to go over. No, see you later, Ryan. See you later. And uh, so, right, that brings us on to our final speaker for today. Um, so, very happy to introduce Harold Connolly, who hopefully. Um, is hey Howard is uh, hopefully yeah. going to tell us what uh, asteroid Bennu is made from. So I'll pass <laughs> over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, hard act to follow, Ryan. Thank you very much for an outstanding talk and for the uh, good laugh at Cecilia's expense. I appreciated that. And uh, it reminded me of how odd it is for all of us to be attending via Zoom when usually we have the customary handshake, hug, and peck on the cheek from our friends. And I see many names out there that are good friends. So uh, greeting to all of you and I hope everyone is well and uh, your loved ones are also well. So let me share my screen with you. And yes, so now I have to minimize this Zoom thing, which we've all become experts at. There you go. So uh, on the predicted nature of the sample from asteroid 101955 Bennu. And I want to point out that Vicki Hamilton has been very helpful in, to me in preparing this talk. And it's a huge team that have interacted 
uh, incredibly well over the last decade plus to collect a sample, not just from Osiris Rex, but I'm also co-eye on Hayabusa 2, but from um, Hayabusa 2 as well. And we have to thank all those dedicated and devoted people. Um, and as you all know, unless you lived in the shoe box in the last week or so, that Hayabusa 2 sample return capsule came back safely and soundly and is now uh, via, via small jet uh, in, back in Tokyo from the outback of Australia and uh, safe and sound and being processed by the team. So we're very excited to see what happens with that. So stay tuned and samples will be rolling out uh, in June of 2021 if everything goes according to plan. This image I love because you can see the sample return capsule right there. So yes, we had planned for, both missions had planned for the data that we had that concerned the characteristics of the asteroid, which indicated it had lots of fine particles, centimeter to millimeter size particles based on the thermal inertia data. And we designed to go down and land onto a smooth sea of particles and collect. And this is an animation that was developed essentially 10 years ago. So this is what both missions designed for. And of course, both missions got to their asteroids and had the oh my god moment. This was nothing like we expected. So uh, both teams had to go back and rethink uh, a lot and reprocess what our concepts were and our expectations and retool for uh, a now bumpy asteroid. And uh, the arrow is a marker which I'm going to just show you quickly. You probably have all seen this image and we flattened this image out at 0.33 pixels per, uh, 0.33 meters per pixel. And this is again, the Boulder Ben Ben, which is essentially 13 stories high. So we didn't expect this, but as you can see from the image to give you some perspective, there is a lot going on on this asteroid surface. There are a lot of impact craters. We're up to, at least on Bennu, we're up to about 1500 craters on this tiny little object, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, and of course, one of the things that hits you really well because we're all cosmochemists is the contrast in the grayscales, which is essentially real compositional differences in the boulders that we're looking at. And I love to show this image. It's a bit zoomed in of that main mosaic you saw and impact craters with relatively flat, bright boulders, such as this one here with dark spot in the center. Every time I look at an image still to this day from either asteroid, um, I, I'm still amazed and find things I didn't see and don't understand. Of course, it makes nice um, looking when you're on a telecon and become bored because we all live our life now by telecons. Well, we had to rethink, go back a minute, we had to rethink the whole process of where are we going to collect the sample, as you all know. We had a 25 meter radius original uh, landing ellipse or bullseye navigation, managed to get that down to five meters. We had to find particles or areas that we knew we could collect, which we eventually did by looking at unresolved areas. So the direct observation and the proxy we were going to use for grain size, thermal inertia, right out the door because, well, it didn't quite tell us what we thought it was going to tell us. So we don't understand something about the material that we're looking at. Long story short, as you know, eventually we did find a site, announced it back in uh, December of 19, made lots of uh, additional measurements. This is Nightingale, the site where we collected, to show you a scale of the spacecraft and also relative to a two, park, a two car park right here. So you understand how big it is. So in, around these large boulders, it's a sea of finer particles. And note again, the differences in grayscales being differences in composition, and for those uh, who love rocks, you can see differences in textures and morphologies of the rocks and the boulders here. Um, so, um, to remind and refresh your memories, this is our collecting mechanism that worked flawlessly. And I will also add uh, Hayabusa 2, of course, everything worked flawlessly, which was wonderful. Uh, it's a three meter arm that had or has, uh, still does, because it's still there, <laughs> three nitrogen bottles in case we needed to have additional attempts, which we did not. This is the sample collecting head right here. And of course, it's in the clean room at Lockheed Martin facility in Colorado, which is why uh, our man here is in um, a bunny suit. The main collector works by 
actually pushing the uh, nitrogen and firing the nitrogen gas into the sample regolith and the sample then collects in the inner annulus region of the head, which of course the punchline is it did brilliantly, okay? Uh, it's actually two collectors in one, as you'll see some images of, in the sense that we have a bulk collector, and this is actually a test mechanism or text, test unit that was, was, um, was fired in a laboratory at Lockheed Martin and in some simulate gravel, was then packed in a mock SRC, boxed up and shipped from Littleton, Colorado to the Johnson Space Center, which is where, as Ryan already set up for me, all the curation will happen for the uh, OSIRIS-REx sample. And um, we then did a trial opening up to see what it looked like. And you can see lots of particles and then Okay, so this is the bulk collector, and these are 24 contact pads, which are a still Velcro kind of uh, material that we plan to pick up particles that may be right on the surface as we come down with the spacecraft. And I should go back here to tell you that uh, also in addition to coming into the landing site, don't forget safety is, was critical, and the navigation team did brilliantly in that it's not just going into the site, but it's the back way because the whole spacecraft can rotate around a cone. Uh, and the back way may be slightly different than the way we came in. So it was a lot of work to figure this all out. Uh, this is a bit of redacted material in the old cold board days because Lockheed Martin doesn't want me to show that. So voila, October 20th comes. We're all biting our fingernails. We were all supposed to be together originally, either in Tucson or in Littleton, Colorado. Well, that went right out the door, didn't it? So we all had, all unless you were absolutely critical and had an exemption, you were doing all your work and watching by Zoom or WebEx. So the sampler penetrated approximately 48 centimeters down into the regolith. And uh, we were ecstatic. A day later, we began our process of verifying that we had sample. And the first verification was actually to take pictures of the TAGSAM head after the collection process with one of our camera units. This is what it looked like, the TAGSAM head uh, pre-collection. Uh, back uh, a year and a half ago, actually two years now, I guess, uh, when we uh, deployed the arm, and we took pictures of it in space. You can see beautiful, clear, images here, the light shining through because there's a mesh around here of, of steel. So the light, you can see it right here, gets through. So wonderful. Okay, that's the original uncollect, unused, shall we say, tag exam head. And then we start taking the pictures and the pictures started coming down. And next thing you know is what are these things? These are particles that were actually leaking out of the sample collector head, much to our great surprise and teeny bit of delight, but the panic that set in first was, oh my goodness, what's going on here, right? Of course, we probably use other colorful metaphors. So again, the unprocessed or unused head picture and then the head taken with all the material basically uh, around it here being particles that we collected. So the first question is, well, did we pull it back out with us? And is it on the top of the head, for example? Well, then we began to process. And if you look carefully, you can see there are actually grains sticking out. Inside here is a mylar flap that holds the sample inside of the bulk collector. And there were particles that were collected. The collecting uh, criteria is two centimeters, but that's just two centimeters in one dimension. Could be a little bit longer. Well, it looks like we did catch particles that were a little bit longer than two centimeters. So we didn't expect this. So we had to think about what was going on. We were losing uh, milligrams to a gram of sample every time the arm articulated to move. So we had to say, well, the next step was supposed to be the sample mass uh, measurement, which was a moment of inertia, was, was spinning the spacecraft and understanding the exact amount of mass we got because we have a requirement on the mission to collect minimum of 60 grams. And that would help determine whether or not uh, we needed to go back. Well, obviously we stuffed the sample collector quite significantly, did our estimates about particle size and, and mass of the particles and got a number that satisfied both NASA headquarters and the PI and everyone in the science team and engineering that we had collected enough sample. And you can even see here some of the images on the contact pads. We can see little teeny particles on the contact pads. 
And as you saw from Michelle's talk, these little teeny particles, thanks to what we learned from our lunar samples and lunar regolith, contain the uh, record of space weathering, which is incredibly important. Uh, we learned a lot from the moon and from understanding space weathering on the moon, which we applied to, of course, Hayabusa 1, and we will apply what we've learned to Hayabusa 2 and to Osiris Rex samples. So we said, okay, time to stow a whole week early, put it in a safe place. And this is an actual image in color of the sample collector head being put into the sample return capsule. So you can see little particles actually liberating from here. These are the clamps that hold it in place and everything went fine. We had to cut the tubing that would, would supply the nitrogen gas and get rid of the actual wrist joint bolt, which we did and everything was flawless. So what can we expect from the return sample besides it being one, interesting for sure, and two, going to give us surprises that we probably never thought about, which is always wonderful. Well, what about the physical nature? What did we learn from the collecting process and from a year plus of uh, orbiting the space, uh, spacecraft orbiting the asteroid and looking with our science payload instruments? Well, we know the particle sizes are going to range from very small to centimeter size. Okay, Curation has divided these into three basic units for curation and allocation purposes, allocation to the science team. Um, and no matter what we collect in the actual collection event, it's not guaranteed that that's going to be preserved on the return trip. Because remember, the space the sample return capsule, just like Hayabusa 2, has to come through the Earth's atmosphere and it will shake like crazy. Um, presumably there'll be some abrasion. And many boulders appear brecciated. I don't have time to go into it, but there are breaches the size of houses on this asteroid Bennu. And right down to what we can see in the images from collection, the same diversity is preserved that we see in the large scale images at the actual sample collection site at the small scale. And we even see what appear to be breaches in the smaller samples. Boulders have different texture and morphologies and some uh, kind of layering and foliation in some of the boulders. It's a lack of, of understanding exactly what that is at this point that we have to figure out. Um, some particles appear platy or flat. We've seen this in the eject, ejected particles. Uh, of course, Bennu is an active asteroid, which ejects particles. And some of those particles we catch in our imaging, one minute you see it, next minute you don't, next minute you see it. And it's not a minute, it's seven seconds. Um, and we see that in some of the particles that seem to be coming off after we moved and articulated the sample uh, head when we were taking images of it. So that's quite curious. And then some material appears friable, more akin to like CI, like hundreds perhaps. Uh, that uh, sampling video you saw, the tag Sam head in the space carrier not only went through the regolith considerably, but it appears the material had been broken up as it's going through. So we're still processing all this information naturally. What's the chemical nature? Well, we know from the from the spectroscopy, it's still by and large in a bulk way, CI it's, or CM-like. We know we have hydrated silicates. We know we have carbonates. We know we have organics. We know we have magnetite. Uh, we have limited indigenous anhydrous silicates. It's a little bit uh, not what we expected and same with Hayabusa too. We have, what we call exogenous silicates that have been identified, relatively bright boulders. And of course, bright in this case, remember albedos were going up to something like normally about 4% 4, 4 or something, but the really bright stuff is about 17, if I remember correctly. So that's bright in our case, uh, which seemed to be more HED-like on the surface. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about space weather in red versus blue and what it actually means. So we can expect to have a lot of fun understanding space weathering. It's going to be a heterogeneous sandpiper, a, a sample. Sandpiper was clearly diverse in its lithologies and we're expecting that in the return sample. We're no longer thinking in our minds that it's going to be a homogeneous sample in entirety as far as uh, petrology and petrography is concerned, right? 
So then, of course, as Ryan set up, so, you know, I, the, the sample goes back to uh, Johnson Space Center when it returns to Earth. It lands in the Utah desert for Osiris Rex, as opposed to the outback in the, on the Hayabusa 2. And we process the sample to return capsule in the field quickly, get it uh, shipped to Ellington Air Force Base outside of Johnson Space Center, and then into the, uh, high, uh, the Osiris Rex um, curation facility and open it up and begin our processing. And unlike past previous uh, US missions, OSIRIS-REx is funded for two years worth of analysis of the return samples. Concurrently, at the same time, of course, curation will be working very hard and some curation uh, members uh, will also be working on sample analysis too. Um, producing a catalog for the community so that everyone can uh, look and see what actually came back and begin to request samples after six months from Earth return. So it'll be a lot, a lot of work and we're extraordinarily exciting and we're gearing up in a major way now with our sample analysis plan and working through many details uh, in preparation for the return uh, of the sample. Of course, we had a big oh, relief. Uh, as well after we collected and stowed. So uh, I'm going to thank you all very much. I wish I could be there in person like I was a few years ago um, and happily take any questions that you may have. Brilliant, thank you very much, Harold. That was great. Um, yeah, really great overview of, uh, of what Cyrus Rex has well, thank you. been doing and, and what we're hoping to be able to do in a, in a few years time. Um, so there are some questions that have popped up in the in the Q and A box. So the first one is from Paul W, who asks: So if you're blasting the surface with nitrogen gas, is there a possibility that there's a kind of selection bias in the materials that you're collecting? So um, you're getting maybe less of the kind of more tightly bound kind of sticky materials, uh, or you're getting more of the kind of lighter things that are being thrown up. Uh, well, we come back on the 24th of September in 2023. So ask me about the same question about June of that following year and I'll be able to answer it better. <laughs> we don't expect there would be, but I'll be honest, I don't know. Okay. Um, so ooh, that thing's moving along. A question from Matri. Uh, she says, hi, Harold, congrats to you and the team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when TAGSAM was being tested, did the team ever test the scenario of capturing the maximum amount that could be collected? Yeah, so um, the maximum amount is roughly two kilograms. I say roughly because that's the maximum amount we uh, collected essentially. And I, there's probably obviously a decimal point a after that. I don't remember the details. We always just say two kilograms. Um, so yeah, so uh, we did many different kinds of tests, lots and lots of tests using lots of different kinds of materials, different densities of materials, everything from basalts to a Tagish Lake simulate to uh, popcorn. So um, yeah, we, we tested a lot in, in many different ways. So uh, the idea here is we, we, we probably collected two plus kilograms, just pushing over the, the edge of what we got. We're pretty confident in that. Now exactly how much we bring back, well, you know, probably probably around that, not, I would say, I'm guessing at this point, purely guess on my part, speculation, yeah. uh, not a whole heck of a lot less than that. <laughs> it's good. It's been successful, we think. Um, so a question from Ross Findlay, who says, hi, Harold. Uh, do you think any large, ooh, large chunks will end up surviving um, atmospheric entry? So I guess he's talking about Bennu Mishra. Yeah. That's a great question, and we've had a lot of discussion about that. And, and you know, I'll be honest, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are large particles, and I would like to think that, from our meteoritical point of view, that we bring back these teeny tiny little boulders that are you know a couple centimeters big. Uh, but yeah, knowing the friable nature of it, which is why I put that up there, and that same friable nature also was exhibited by uh, Rugu when Hayabusa two collected. And therein, of course, their thrusters are significantly different than ours as far as their ability to impart force on the surface. Um, but they had, you know, boulders are basically pushed out of the way. You can see in the videos, like cotton balls, just boom, you know, just moved out of the way. So I expect there to be a considerable amount of abrasion, to be frank. Uh, so a question from Larry Nittler. Uh, hi, Harold. Hi, uh, what's the evidence for indigenous anhydrous silicates on Bennu? And he says, great talk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, 
Yeah, so Vicky and I talked about this. We have we have spectral data that basically indicates there's probably uh, olivine there, and it's not quite what we uh, expected in the sense that we expected a much stronger signature. Um, that hydrated signature just dominates everything. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's teasing it out, and and, and you know, the Hayabusa two is is a little bit of the same basically, but their indication of Hydration is much weaker from the spacecraft, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this isn't a question, but this is from Monica, who just says, oh, hello, Monica. Uh, so big, nice hugs, to... big hugs to Harold, love mom. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> I miss you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, cool. uh, this is from uh, Mark Boyd, who says, many thanks for such an interesting talk, Harold. I was wondering how representative the target location is of the entirety of Bennu, uh, having seen the range of textures and possible possible compositions in some of your images? Yeah, great question. So we narrowed down the, the, the various potentials to four, as you might remember, uh, possible collection sites, each of which had their own unique uh, geologic characteristics and geographical location, one in the south, one in the north, northern hemisphere, and two basically on equatorial ridge. And one of the things we focused on was uh, smaller craters, because uh, that was our... Uh, geologic hypothesis, if you will, that we're puncturing through the surface a little bit with some of these smaller craters. And it seemed like those smaller craters also had accumulation of finer materials uh, initially, which we later found out was true. Um, and also that we could hope that especially craters, near craters, and maybe cross, cross migration of material due to impacts. So there's a whole set of uh, geologic uh, investigations that went on with each site, in addition to the engineering requirements that were needed in order to collect the sample. Any sample has scientific value at this point. We had a whole campaign of science value, but we were like, okay, well, let's just get a sample. It's all valuable. <laughs> yeah. uh, so another question has popped up from Daniel Hallett. He says, Ooh. was there any exog exogenic material? Um, so things like the bright boulders, for example, um, known or detectable within the collection site. So you're expecting to pick up any kind of HGD? No, we, we didn't, we, at this point, I, it's, we're still processing everything. So at this point, I, I don't know the actual answer to it, but at least initially anything that was obvious, we haven't uh, uh, discussed, but hang in there because, uh, you know, it's still new and uh, as far as the data goes and people are working very, very hard right now to get the science processed and to get some papers written, so yeah. Brilliant, okay. Uh, so it looks like, unless anyone else is going to put any more questions in directly to Harold. I think oh, yeah, see, to... there is one from Ryan. Oh, Let is there? I can't, okay, you, actually, I can't see it. Uh, he's just asked um, if the nature of the collection, uh, the collector, since it's so full, um, being open, if it's going to add some challenges to opening it when it actually comes back and retrieving the material. Well, why don't you pop in and find out since you're right there? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. So, you know, it's interesting question, though, in the sense that um, I didn't point this out, but, you know, there are also screws that are inside underneath the, the you know, the, the uh, head were collected, and um, we're pretty sure we see some stuff in the screw, you know, bits, you know? So uh, <laughs> it's pretty stuffed. So yeah, it, it, and I'm sure there's just gonna be dust everywhere. So it's like my grandfather, you know, when I was young, I can remember very well him uh, really pissing my mother off because in a cupcake box, you know, he taught me how to pick the sprinkles up, you know? So my mother, of course, didn't like that at all. Like your finger and pick up all the sprinkles. So that's the joke we make that there'll be dust everywhere too. Don't give away like the curation secrets. Yeah, it'd be, be just like a away. yeah, it'd be just like a lem, you know, it'd be dust everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good question. Really nice talk, Ryan. Too. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I think that brings us to the end. Um, so thank you very much, Harold, and uh, I want to say thank you to yeah. everybody who has um, contributed today, either just by being here and joining us. For today um all our speakers all our invited speakers um all the talks have been great and, and really interesting and i think we've managed to successfully cover most of the inner solar system anyway i don't think we've gone much further than, than than the asteroid belt so maybe we can do one about collecting samples from pluto or something one day um so natasha pointed out to me yes yeah, so i wanted to also say thank you to all my co-chairs and and who've helped me put this together 
And uh, yeah, Natasha wanted to point out that we had, I think, a peak of about 106 people attending, including us. So um, that's amazing. I think when we put this together, we had no idea what interest we would generate and how many people would get to come along to this. Um, obviously, it's slightly different doing it virtually. You would normally be down in London, but there are clearly it's, it's a shame not to all, as Howard said, that we're all not kind of together in one place. But obviously, we've um, we can reach a much wider audience. And, and thanks to everybody who's like it's like four in the morning for you over in America. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, I think th the fact that we've had kind of a hundred um, people here today sort of demonstrates, you know, we are a um, uh, quite a successful um, and strong community, the sample science community. I think this is a good thing, um, this, particularly in the US, but in the UK, we, I think we have a quite a strong heritage of, of doing this. We have, you know, labs, um, as Monica told us earlier, labs um, up and down uh, the country studying, um, you know, meteorites and, and samples that are being brought back by all these exciting missions. Um, and so this is fantastic. And, and I think one of the things um, so I want to say, so yeah, we're supposed to have a kind of discussion question um, uh, se session now. So if anybody has any questions for any of the speakers we've had today, um, either put them in the Q&A or um, we can probably, if you put your hand up, we can probably make you a panelist and you can actually ask that question directly. Um, I also wanted to uh, kind of, if people want to discuss a little bit about, you know, we are a successful community in the UK. And I guess some of the questions we have going forward is how do we stay a successful community? Um, yeah, particularly at the moment with the challenges of the funding through, through STFC and things. Um, so if people have ideas or want to discuss things related to that. Um, John Bridges mentioned um, right back at the start of the day that the uh, STFC solar system roadmap will be um, renewed in the next year or so. So if people have ideas or thoughts or things that they think are really important that should be should be going on to that, then then they need to be passed on to to the to the um, to the advisory panel, um, and also I guess the other thing is kind of related to, to Monica's talk is um, how do we want to take Lares forward? Um, how do we want to invest in our community, making sure that we have the the analytical facilities available um, within the UK to actually do the work on all these samples that are coming back? And it's not just the facilities; it's the people. So how do we train up? postdocs and PhD students and provide them with a kind of uh, a career path, I guess, that means that, you know, in 20, 30 years, we've got samples from Mars coming back, but we actually don't have anybody in the UK who can study those samples. So I think this is a big kind of challenge facing us um, at the moment. And then I guess the other thing is this idea of, again, Monica talked about this a little bit, um, of do we want a curation, our own curation facility based here in the UK? Um, is it better for us to invest in an external facility, either through ESA or through NASA? Um, so yeah, so you know, I'm not expecting everyone to have all the answers, but if people have comments or want to say anything about any of those, or if they want to ask any questions um, of any of the uh, other speakers, then then let us know. I think, and if any of the other co-chairs want to comment or say anything, please shout up. <laughs> No, nope, everyone's going to be very quiet. Oh, I can see someone's hand has gone up. Whoever is the host, can they look that up and... I'll make them a panellist so they can... Yes, that would be brilliant. Thank you, Luke. So, John, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk now. Yeah, yeah, I should. Got me? Yeah, coming from the engineer, excellent talk, brilliant, brilliant range, and that's the, the really valuable part was the range of discussions. Um, but in coming from the, the technology side and the robot side, we, we I touched on it in, in the talk that the in the UK has an industrial strategy which is heavily invested in AI and robotics. Um, so in that sense, I'm piggybacking on a lot of UK government investment in these hubs, uh, Fairspace, Rain, and, and Orca. And you saw from Jamie's presentation, which is essentially coming out from the oil industry a technique that could be used, a robotic technique that could be used to, to increase the time or increase the, or shorten the time it takes for you to do standard analyses. And there were a couple of, you know, a couple of, I asked a couple of questions about how long it took to do things. Mm -hmm. And it might be, um, 
and there was fantastic from from uh, Stony Brook about the, the using AI to recognise uh, material. Um, although she, she she was slowed down by the time it took to, to I guess to load and, and to to evacuate the chamber, but it, it might be an area that might be more beneficial to look at um, instead of the, the in, improving the scientific instrumentation maybe increase the throughput by looking at teaming up with AI, uh, teaming up roboticists to see if you can make some of these techniques uh, a workable technique um, or automatic technique. And I, I've been talking uh, with, I talked with, talking with John Bridges, I think Wednesday it was. Uh, and then we, 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 we're trying on the engineering side to say this is available and, and it is available. And it might be, especially University of Manchester, it might be beneficial to talk to some of their robotics colleagues to see if there are there are ways that some of these scientific some some of the things that are quite time consuming to do could be automated and, and that, that's really my point. Muted myself. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, so. I can only speak from my own point of view. Is that you often I spend so long uh, thinking about analysing a particular meteorite or sample. And the challenges of just doing that on a, you know, you, often you would just get one shot on, a, on one of these samples. Something coming back from Bennu, you know, you've got that grain and that's that, that's your grain. So you, well, we spend so much time about how you're actually going to, to analyze that sample that we perhaps don't see the bigger picture and, and, and go looking for those kind of opportunities to do things with, with AI and robotics and stuff. And I think maybe you're right as a community, that might be something um, that we could, we could think about trying to do um, to do more to open up a few more opportunities for us. And there's funding opportunities as well, that, you know, yeah. in terms of how much would you pay yeah. to be able to do that analysis 24 seven, uh, instead, of, instead of taking 180 days, do it in 10 days. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a, that, you know, that's something that's a, you know, fits into a business model for somebody somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, let me yeah. comment if I may, Ashley. Sure, um, go ahead. Also, as part of the sample, uh, sample analysis plan for OSIRIS-REx, we think about the analysis of the, the actual collected sample. But it's more than that. It's also analyzing witness coupons and it's analyzing the SRC that returned and of course the tag XM hit itself mm -hmm. for engineering purposes to inform on engineering, inform on potentially helping future sample return missions. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Hibusa 2 will be doing the same thing. Their capsule is considerably smaller, uh, but still uh, will undergo some of the same analysis process. Um, so that's a good point you raised. So thank you very much, John. Yeah. Because uh, one, one thing is an automatic scan of the surface of the returned hardware. You know, most of it will be not very interesting, but there may be one spec there that, you know, well, that's right. And, you know, one of the things we discovered, well, two things we discovered with Bennu, right, is that one, it's it's a, an active asteroid, so it ejects particles. And number two, it's bombarded with particles. There are micro, you know, not micro, let's call it small impact pits all over the place. You can look at the work that uh, Ron Belez is doing. And having that sample collecting arm out in, in space for a while, we want to make sure and see if anything actually hit that head as well, sort of impacts. And you see impacts of, in space weathering sense in the return samples from Hayabusa, um, and of course the moon, but uh, we're looking at the actual hardware in this case. So yeah, correct. Good point, thank you. And I just want to say thank you. I have to go to another meeting, I'm sorry, but thank you all very much. <laughs> I apologize. No problem at all. Thanks for joining us, Harold. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have Bye. a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Right. All the best, everyone. Um, Monica. And I'm sorry, I promoted her. Yeah, thank you. You're not wearing a Christmas jumper, though. No, I'm not. I'm just wearing a red cardi, and I realize it's Christmas jumper day. Um, we should have been wearing our Christmas jumpers. Great opportunity missed. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, um, I did not say that there were over 100 people here at the, at the peak. 103, yeah. Just, just get 103 people in the Royal Astronomical Society meeting room. Um, and it's very to. uncomfortable when there are 100 people in there. <laughs> no. So this is great. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, yes, we're missing being able to, uh, you know, rush up Piccadilly to Pret-a-Manger to get a sandwich in 10 minutes. 
you know, there you go. But we're learning how to do things remotely, you know, using an SEM remotely. Uh, and I'm not talking here, John, about the uh, robotic stuff. I'm talking about, OK, you've got a specialist preparing a sample, but then you can take part in analysing it. And we're sort of learning a bit on the hoof at the moment. We've got 10 years to really uh, get on top of that, to get grips with how we can do that. And so we should look at COVID-19 as it's given us this fantastic opportunity to push forward our teleworking opportunities. You know, it's like, hey, something has, good has come up from it. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed listening today is listening to people who I don't know who they are because they're, they're students at other institutions that I haven't been able to meet, which shows that there is still, there are still people coming along. There are loads of people who are interested in doing this and it's really good. And I think as long as we make sure that we have a meeting like this every year or a couple of times a year, then we'll keep that, we'll keep that initiative going. And I just wanted to say, thank you very much to to organizing it because it's been really great i've been sitting here i've got two cats that i've uh, that have been keeping me company and it's great you know and i didn't have to get up at some ungodly hour and go down to london to listen but i'm i'm missing i'm missing seeing you all it's nice to see faces but it's even nicer to to be together but thanks very much again no no problem thanks for thanks for your talk as well this, this morning monica um, yeah, sorry yeah, for going over. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a shame not to be running up and down Piccadilly and popping into Fortnum and Masons for some jam. Um, but you're absolutely right, particularly because these meetings, the RAS meetings, are always held in London. And I know, in particular, if you're coming from from Glasgow or from Manchester to be there for first thing in the morning, it's very expensive. And so then it becomes an overnight stay. So my cats have been brilliant all day, and now they're having a big fight. Um, so, <laughs> so, so having these meetings like this is, is, is yeah, you're absolutely right. It's completely opened it up to, to a whole. Um, <laughs> excellent. Oh, that's mine. Yeah, there are no oh, we'll talk about cats all afternoon. Um, yeah, so, it's funny that you mentioned it, Monica. I'm actually running a montage, an EDS montage on the Evo right now, <laughs> remotely from the other computer. It's great. It's probably the best thing to come from all of it is just that we have that capability, but we just didn't need to invest the time and effort to make it work. Yeah. And it's so much more accessible to people, no matter what, you know, where they are or if they have any access issues in getting in and using that equipment. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. good. it's good. I mean, I, I, from, just from a personal point of view, I also wouldn't want to lose going into a lab or yeah. being to have, have it, having meetings in person. You know, I, I don't want it to completely replace it. I, I you know, oh, but, absolutely it was not, because it's the conversation that people always say it, and it's true. It's the conversations that you have in the corridors and in yeah. the kitchen and over yeah. coffee where, where ideas are sparked and you realise that, hey, yeah, actually that sounds really interesting and I, I'd like to do that. And, and then just to be able to wander along the corridor to somebody's um, office or, or or at the OU into somebody's open plan space <laughs> and, and chat to them and uh, yeah yeah I really miss that I've been back a couple of times um, and I'm going back next week but yeah it's a shame. So on that kind of point I should have uh, told everybody who's still here and hasn't isn't completely fatigued um, we were going to have a kind of get together after this meeting so I'll, I, we can put the link in the chat I think um, so if you're not completely exhausted from from uh, staring at a computer screen I think we might try and have a kind of virtual beer or something because we can't go to the pub but you're absolutely right Monica it is, it is the kind of chatting to people over lunch and stuff that makes the, the biggest difference mm -hmm. um, so I think I, two other people I, popped up yeah I go on, Jamie yeah sorry yeah I just I just want to add to uh, to John's point there uh, and I just want to say thank you for uh, for for letting me join uh, certainly from uh, bridging from uh, the Orca uh, hub the offshore robotics um, and just to say, I mean, a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment, uh, I think, has a lot of good crossover, uh, certainly for um, our work in asset integrity, uh, feeding into digital twins and the synthetic environment, in addition to, uh, to highly localized mapping and sensing. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, crossover for the autonomous aspect as well. So, uh, so do please get in touch with us at Orca and, uh, and, and the other fair space and rain hubs as well. Um, we'd be very glad. 
to continue collaboration. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for being interested in the meeting and, and joining oh, us. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> You waving at I saw, me. I saw, I saw Aurora had to his or her hand up um, in the attendee. Uh, yeah. Did you want to say something? Uh, is it better now? Yep. All right, cool. Um, so, hi. Um, I first want to say thank you to all of the organizers and all of the, the speakers. That was a fantastic uh, meeting. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to also follow up on one, what Monica was saying. Um, I really think that, yes, we should get lessons learned from this pandemic and that uh, working remotely, working together remotely is very important. Also working on duplicating capabilities. I think that is going to be interesting because if one lab is down because virus or hurricane or whatnot, it might be interesting to have the, the community still having access to uh, another lab, whether it is um, a analytical lab or a curation lab, for example. Um, maybe one thing that I'm, um, I, I wanted to also mention is that, Ashley, you were asking questions like, what should we do, to which direction should we go in terms of um, sample return mission, curation facilities, and so on. Um, I think we need to really, it, there are discussions already in place. I think we need to keep discussing these and the community needs to kind of agree on something. Um, I believe that ISA has shown more interest or I would be still in a warm climate in Houston and not uh, freezing myself in the <laughs> Netherlands. Um, but the community needs to show a uh, to, to show a will of moving a certain direction that would make our life much easier, I believe. And so I, it's, it's brand new to me, but if any of you wants to discuss uh, forward on this, uh, I'll be happy to discuss forward. Yeah, brilliant. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, ever since I've, I've been kind of uh, in doing meteorite research for over 10 years now and we always seem to be talking about the same things that might be happening in 10 years and there never seems to be any general consensus within the community about how we do that and it's a big disadvantage to us because I you know you see things like the astronomy community who are very good at getting large projects funded for for telescopes or satellites and things uh, and we, we we don't we're not quite as visible and we're definitely not quite as coherent in our kind of you know what do we really want out of out of things like STFC or ESA and um, so this is why I mentioned the, the solar system roadmap coming up, the reviews is, you know, if we want a curation facility, we need to jump up and down and say, that's what we want. And, and, th and, and this is what we want. We don't want something that might be that or might be this, it might be based there. And we might have some labs over there. We need a kind of coherent um, argument. I can see Monica has appeared again. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, it's just to agree. I mean, that's the problem is, yeah. you know, what's the most expensive bit of kit that we could buy? You know, let's say it's an atom probe. How much does an atom probe cost? Say five million with bells and whistles. Is that right? Luke's nodding. Mm -hmm. That's peanuts to STFC. You know, they what they want is they want something that's 15 or 20 or 25 million, which can be, go in its own building. And our problem is that we're too big to be, you know, getting an atom probe just sort of on a regular grant proposal but not big enough to be going in as one of these really big facility things, which is why um, I'm trying to put so much effort into LARI's to show that we are an absolutely integrated, um, uh, in integrated community. The problem is, and you compare us with the astronomers, astronomers, you know, they might be extra galactic, galactic, um, stellar, but you give them a telescope with instruments on, and, you know, whether they're looking at a galaxy or a group of galaxies or a group of stars, they're really happy because they're all using this same telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, and although the astronomical community has its rivalries, they're nowhere near as divided as the solar system is. For us, we've got the sun and the rest. 
and sadly, where the rest. And I have had solar astronomers say, well, because the sun is 98% of the mass of the solar system, it ought to get 98% of the funds. Well, of course, we're 98% more interesting than the sun, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's only full of hydrogen. You know, what more can you say? Oh, some of it's helium, big deal. But, you, you know, we, we suffer in the solar system advisory panel because we also have that little bit of those solar terrestrial physicists as well who are you know the plasma people who are who, who do the interaction so so we are three communities the solar community is a big community we're a big community the solar terrestrial physicists if they have to align with anybody they align with the, the solar people so that's our problem that we can never really get our act together as a single community um yeah and, and there you go that's a challenge for us. Yeah, but we're, there's a lot of us, and, and yeah. we're quite vocal, which is good. Yeah. So what what you're saying is we need to build just one super giant instrument that does everything. Well, I think it's almost a focal point. You need a focal point that everyone can focus yeah. on. Yeah. Well, I mean, we focus on the origin and evolution of the solar system, how that knowledge applies to the origin and evolution of other planetary planetary systems and to the building blocks and thus the origin of life. Now that's, that's a large spread of stuff and it's pretty bloody good. You know. oh, I meant actually a, you know, an object building rather than the science. It's, it's that, that public imagination, that public outreach to yeah. sort of, you know, hang all those ideas on, onto, you know, even Dale's rock collection. Well, that's Brilliant. it. I mean, Harwell is a natural hub for, for that. And with the Natural History Museum having its outpost there, that will be a really, really powerful um, draw. So I'm really hoping that 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 gets, you know, really gets gets going. How's it doing, Natasha? <laughs> I mean, um, Almeida. Uh, well, basically, they have they've set up a, a series of scenarios at the moment. So different parts that could move the feasibility, which labs, which parts of the library, which research groups, et cetera, would have to go in all those different scenarios. And then over the next six months, that's gonna be worked up with a bit more granular data and it will go to uh, the trustees and the executive board who ultimately make the decision uh, middle of next year. Oh, right, so it's going to, so, so quite a long way away then. The problem is that we've got probably over 80 million specimens, right? <laughs> and yeah, so, I know, but, I mean, but some of them are all in one drawer. You know, they're called the bag, drawer, Monica, I know, you know. <laughs> You'll make the money on the gift shop, don't worry, an MHM <laughs> gift shop. You've got 15 million insects, you know. <laughs> yes, but the problem is we've also got a lot of whales and they take up a lot of space. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you whales, couldn't you? Uh, they're all at Wandsworth, unfortunately, and we need space yeah. for that. It's a very delicate operation between spaces, well, collections that need to be rehoused because the spaces that they're in just aren't good enough yeah. based on our collection needs now. But along with, you know, what, what's the future of the museum in terms of how we use our spaces for um, public engagement or, or whatever else. And I think, you know, it's important to have a um, a kind of cohesive science story as to what we're building out in Harwell and not just say we're going to dump X amount of specimens and people there. So it's quite a, a big job for everyone to feed into that and um, mm. and obviously it being COVID now um, mm. it's been really difficult to gather all the data and information and, yeah. and coordinate that against the groups so they've been doing like a sterling job actually um, so far in, in collecting that information so um yeah, it's a little bit up in the air. It's difficult to survive 